I have you somewhere here. Hey, Mom, how are you? I'm good, thank you. So, there's no table this time. No? Uh, 
Okay. They've got it solved. Okay. Yeah. We're going to start. Yeah. Ushankar then. Ushat Sadhin. Good morning and good uh, close to noon, so I was going to say good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I am Sebu David Aslanian, the Richard Albanisian Chair of Modern Armenian History, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome, welcome all of you for the second day of our exciting conference, Armeno Indica, Four Centuries of Familiarity and Friendship, which explores uh, Armenian connections across their diaspora with various locations, but focuses specifically on Mughal India or South Asia. And as I was saying yesterday, of all the uh, places with which the Armenian diaspora has come into contact in the past three, 400 years, arguably none have been as generative and important for Armenians as South Asia. And I say this because many firsts in Armenian history were accomplished in South Asia and not in Armenia itself, including the first newspaper, the first uh, proto-constitution about which we will hear later today. And the first play, the first Eastern Armenian novel, uh, the list could go on. But uh, suffice to say that India is and has been a very important space and country for the Armenians in terms of cross-cultural encounters and friendship. So um, I'd like to uh, get each, I'd like to use this opportunity to uh, say a few words about the conference co-sponsors again and uh, take the, as well as uh, re uh, remember certain names that I um, uh, in, uh, inadvertently forgot yesterday. There's a long list of people to think. So the UCLA Fowler Museum as a co-sponsor has been very, very important in this event. We are meeting in their space, Leonard, Leonard Hall. I'm particularly grateful for, for Amy Landau and I'm gonna introduce her in a second to come up and say a few words followed by a few words by Shushan Karapetian from USC. USC is also a co-sponsor, co USC Dornsaif Armenian Studies Center Institute, and uh, Nasser is also a co-sponsor. So uh, in addition to these uh, co-sponsors, needless to say, uh, my debt of gratitude is the, the organizer of this conference to my three graduate students, Daniel Ohanian, Martin Adamian and Sona Tajerian, who is now a postdoc, is really uh, um, profound. And I can say for sure that without their assistance, none of this would have, would have happened. So thank you again. In addition to them, I'd like to thank Emily Pogosian of the uh, Promise Armenian Institute, the other co-sponsor of this event. Emily is an intern and she has been working tirelessly behind the scenes helping Hasmig and others to make this event come true. So uh, last but certainly not least, I forgot to thank yesterday Sato Mugalian from New York, who also assisted in many important ways from behind the scenes. So I'm grateful to all these people. And uh, I should also, uh, I should have said this earlier, walking here this morning, uh, I walked across the campus and I thought to myself, few things are as beautiful as the smell of freshly cut grass wafting in the spring air. So I'm particularly happy for this, not just for myself, but for our out of town visitors uh, who came, who traveled long distances to get here. And I'm happy at least that California will live up to its reputation as a place where the sun always shines. So, and of course, all the other guests and uh, people who came here are also particularly important for me to thank. And last but not least, our two guests from India who couldn't make it in person, uh, Vach Vachagan Tatevosian, a friend of mine of, of long standing from India, as well as, uh, as, well as Shantanu uh, Shen Sengupta, who gave, both of whom gave very interesting talks yesterday regretfully we're unable to come due to visa complications and we hope that we will make it up to them some other time but i wanted to give them a shout out for 
being such good citizens and joining us by Zoom. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce our two uh, uh, speakers are going to say a few words of welcome. I'll introduce both of them together and then uh, I'll, call, uh, I'll call them up one by one. Amy Landau is the Director of Education and Interpretation at the Fowler Museum at UCLA, where she oversees public programming K-12 and university education project projects and gallery interpretation. Uh, she has many, many things to her credit, including scholarship, brilliant scholarship on Safavid Iran and Armenians in particular, and patronage. Uh, she has a PhD from Oxford. So she will come up in a, in a short while to say a few words of welcome. In addition to her, I'd also like to, uh, to introduce very briefly uh, our partners across campus, on the other side of campus at USC, the USC Dornsaith Armenian Institute and its newly appointed director, my friend Shushan Karapetian, who is a social, who specializes in sociolinguistics and on the use of Armenian as a heritage language and is a brilliant administrator as well as scholar and a very decent person. So uh, they're both here today and I, I welcome uh, Amy Landau to say a few words. Hello all, can you hear me? So thank you, Professor Aslanian, for that kind introduction and your leadership in organizing this conference and convening such an uh, internationally respected group of scholars. We welcome all of you here to the Fowler Museum. And as one of two UCLA's public museums, the Fowler focuses on indigenous and diasporic histories of Africa, Asia, the Pacific, and the Americas. I hope you'll all find time today to visit our most recent exhibition, Amir H. Fala, The Fallacy of Borders, which raises issues about homeland, diaspora, and the global movement of ideas, people, and objects, which clearly resonates with the papers presented yesterday and those which we'll hear today. On UCLA campus, it has been an honor to collaborate with Professor Aslanian his team, the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute to co-host today's events. Here, I wish to say a special note of gratitude to my Fowler colleagues, Libby O'Kane, Events and Visitor Services Manager and Interim Curator of Public Programs, her team, and of course, Fowler Security, who woke up really early this morning to help out with Professor Aslanian's team. I consider myself truly fortunate to work at this university with such exceptional faculty, students, and staff who are devoted to the pursuit of Armenian studies, honoring the legacy of such scholars of Richard Hovani Sian, while carving out the future of this field with the Promise Armenian Institute, celebrated for its interdisciplinary research and teaching. In respect to this bright future, I really look forward to forthcoming collaborations to highlight Armenian histories through programming and exhibitions at the Fowler Museum. Here I should note the museum's upcoming exhibitions, John Yock, Armenian Art of Knots and Loops, which has been curated by my colleague, Gassia Armenian, which is opening in April. And this exhibition um, is followed on the heels by another exhibition, focusing on Armenian LA-based photographers from the diaspora. I do hope you'll return to the Fowler in the future, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. And I'm going to turn the mic over to my colleague, Shushan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Armeno Indica conference. Um, as Sepu uh, introduced, I'm Dr. Shushan Garapetian, director of the USC Institute of Armenian Studies. We are a research institute at the Dornsleif College at USC, and our focus is contemporary Armenian studies, so both post-genocide, Republic of Armenia, Artsakh, and the diaspora. Um, as many of you know, I am a product of UCLA's Armenian Studies Hub, for which I am very grateful and very proud. And this campus and the scholars who occupy the current chairs 
um, in Armenian history and language and uh, literature have been formative in my own development and academic trajectory. The USC Institute of Armenian Studies is very proud to be a co-sponsor of such an important academic enterprise. I want to offer my immense thanks and gratitude to Professor Sebul Aslanian for both conceiving and bringing to fruition this world-class conference um, that probes the connected economic, literary, and political histories of Armenians and Indians, both in and beyond South Asia. I also want to note just how impressive the scope, rigor, and impact of the presentations have been so far. Like those of you who attended yesterday, I spent all evening and night musing over and even dreaming about Armenian merchants in Manila converting to Catholicism to escape expulsion, how to calculate the precise value of chow, and I still don't think I understand or ever will, but now I know something about the pearl trade, mixed race bards in the Bengal Renaissance, the private patriarchy and intertextuality of Tariatians, the phenomenal history and presence of the Armenian Church in Dhaka and the Armenian College and Philanthropic Academy in Calcutta, Armenian historiography and print culture in Madras, the discovery of Sadkis Khachaturian's work that I knew nothing about, um, and so much more. I'm excited for today's equally invigorating talks and the keynote address by Professor Sanjay Subramanyam. Thank you all for being here, for taking part in the business that we are all in, which is the production and curation of knowledge in order to better understand ourselves, the world we live in, and hopefully a contribution to its betterment. Thanks so much. I would also like to invite now uh, our representative, uh, the representative of Nasser National Association for the for Armenian Research and Scholarship, uh, Rupen Berberian, to come up. Rupen is a good friend and he's the local representative here and a totally, really decent uh, community citizen. Rupen, thank you. Thank you, Sebu. Uh, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, or NASSER, is very proud to co-sponsor the Armeno Indica conference organized by Sebu Aslanyan. It is a unique and intriguing conference on a topic never tackled before on such a scale. If you were here yesterday, you know that Armenians have a great story. To paraphrase William Sororian, for when two of them meet anywhere in the world, including Madras, Bombay, Calcutta, and Dhaka, see if they will not create a new Armenia. The new Armenia will prosper and achieve a number of firsts, even before the old Armenia. And although the new Armenia community may disappear, it will leave a rich legacy of buildings, institutions, and stories about which we heard yesterday. And what an amazing start to the conference it was yesterday. Nasser serves two kinds of people. Uh, producers of Armenian studies, mostly academics or other experts, and users of Armenian studies, the Armenian community and the general public. Nasser sponsors more than 50 academic programs related to Armenian studies each year, usually in partnership with one or more of the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA, the Ararat Eskijim Museum, the Armenian Film Foundation, the Kalus Gulbenkian Foundation, the Society for Armenian Studies, Harvard, Columbia, and other universities. Nasser endowed the first chairs of Armenian Studies at Harvard in 1959 and at UCLA in 1965. And Nasser supports the other chairs at other universities. Nasser provides grants and financial aid to scholars in partnership with the Knights of Vartan. Nasser owns the Mardikian Library with over 30,000 books. Nasser is a top distributor of Armenian topic books in the English language via the Nasser online bookstore. Nasser owns the Armenia Heritage Press, which publishes important scholarly works, uh, the Journal of Armenian Studies, and a newsletter. Nasser has a brand new headquarters, which uh, since COVID began, uh, started, but was inactive for a couple of years, but it's back on track. Uh, and it's a global Armenia center connecting scholars from uh, Armenian studies and the public. 
I encourage you to follow Nasser on Facebook and Instagram and uh, sign up uh, for the Nasser email. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, so we have two exciting panels uh, this afternoon, followed by uh, a keynote address by Professor Sanjay Subramaniam. Our first panel will begin now, and I call to the floor my distinguished friend and colleague in the, on, the, on campus, Dr. Peter Kawi, the Naregati Chair of Armenian Studies here at UCLA, to say a few words and to chair and discuss this panel. Ah, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, panel on the second day of this conference uh, devoted to Armino Indica. Its topic is uh, Monuments, Patronage, and Indo-Persianate Identities, uh, and features three speakers. The first is the Congress uh, organizer, Dr. Sabu David Aslanyan, who holds the Richard Hovhannisian Chair in Modern Armenian History at UCLA, where he is also the inaugural director of the Armenian Studies Center uh, at the Promise Institute. He will be followed by Dr. Talin Grigor, Professor of Art and Architectural History in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of California, Davis. And our third panelist is Dr. Veronika Zablonski, a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Philosophy at the Freie Universität Berlin, as a member of the Transforming Solidarities, an interdisciplinary research project funded by Berlin University Alliance. Each of our speakers, as I understand, will have roughly 22 minutes uh, to deliver their papers, uh, after which we'll have a general Q&A. Uh, in view of the large number of audience members following the proceedings worldwide, I would ask the panelists to speak right into the microphone to ensure good sound quality. Uh, and so we'll uh, begin immediately with our first uh, speaker, which is then uh, uh, Professor Aslan Yan. And uh, you can see his uh, title already, Cemeteries as Heterotopias. Armenian sepulchral culture in Agra and Surat, or what the dead can tell us about the living. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter, for that kind introduction. I will begin my talk uh, right away uh, due to um, in the interest of saving time. So my talk today is on cemeteries as heterotopias and is an attempt to make sense of graveyards and cemeteries for what they can tell us about the communities that created them. Ever since the publication of French historian Philippe Arrier's pathbreaking works, such as The Hour of Our Death and Western Attitudes Towards Death in the, in the late 1970s and 1980s, there has been a stream of scholarship in the West on the cemetery as an identifying sign of a culture. More and more, sepulchral culture in general and the cemetery as a kind of heterotopia, to use a term, coined by the French philosopher Michel Foucault in particular, have become framed as central to understanding the societies of the living in Western scholarship. However, with the exception of a handful of works by Etem Eldem on Ottoman cemeteries and Robert Travers and others on the cemeteries in Mughal and British India, 
few scholars have focused on the places of the dead in Islamicate societies. Armenian cemeteries in India have rarely, if at all, attracted serious scholarly scrutiny, though, of course, historians have appreciated the value of the more than 3,000 or 4,000 Armenian tombstones in the subcontinent as a source for demographic and other data. This presentation seeks to redress this gap in the scholarship by focusing on two exemplary collections of cenotaphs from Mughal India, namely the Armenian section of Agra's Roman Catholic uh, cemetery dating back to the time of Emperor Jahangir, Emperor Jahangir 1605 to 1627, his regnal dates, as well as the 17th century Armenian Dutch cemetery in Surat, whose origins go back to Oranzeb's reign from 1657 to 1707. Treating the sepulchral gar gardens of the dead as Durkheimian collective representations of the communities that created them, this study examines the ways in which the strange heterotopia of the cemetery, to quote Foucault, functions as a sacred and symbolic replica of the world of the living. As Michel Foucault once reminded us, cemeteries are exemplary instances of heterotopias or, quote, worlds within worlds that reflect, distort, and mirror what lies outside. This paper revisits cemeteries for what their silent inscriptions on architectural motifs and architectural motifs can tell us uh, about the protean with an E and hybrid identities of the Armenian communities in Mughal India. Drawing on the literature on sepulchral culture produced in the wake of Arie's uh, pathbreaking work, as well as on tombstone inscriptions from two visits to the Armenian cemeteries in Agra and Surat, conducted by me in 2019, the paper will contend that at least three hallmarks of the Indo-Armenian community and its history in the early modern period may be gleaned from a stroll in the gardens of the dead. These are first that cemeteries, that, that the community, that Indo-Armenian communities were numerically extremely tiny and characterized by a few well-placed and talented go-betweens who usually served as the community's representatives in the local courts or centers of power. Two, that the communities in question, far from being internally homogeneous, were distinguished by high degrees of sub-ethnic uh, diversity and variety, thus mirroring the larger diversity of the far-flung Armenian transnation, to use the term Kajik Tololian coined a number of years ago. And third, in relation to the host societies that accommodated community members, the Armenians in Mughal India, were, as you will see today, were also highly transculturated and indeed culturally intersectional in relation to the larger Indo-Islamicate Indo or Islamic milieu provided by Mughal India. So as discussed in my introductory remarks yesterday, the earliest documented record for sustained Armenian interactions with India goes back to the second half of the 16th century. European and Armenian sources are scant, but they indicate that a small community of Armenians had settled in the imperial capital of the most celebrated of Mughal rulers, Abu Fath Jalaladin Muhammad Akbar, known to the world as Akbar the Great, whose regnal years are 1557 to 1605. Given the paucity of documentation on this period, a profusion of confusion surrounds the early decades of Armenian settlement in Agra, with many vexing questions still unanswered. How many Armenians had in fact settled down in Akbar's India or near his court? And from what remote locations did these individuals originally hail? And finally, what brought them to the land of the Mogor, as Mughal India was known in Portuguese? 
The Christian cemetery at the Lashkarpur district of Agra, a few hours by car from New Delhi, and an hour drive from the famed Taj Mahal, is a good place to help us reconstruct this obscure history. Quote, the earliest Christian graveyard in northern India, unquote, this cemetery has an obscure history as early Jesuit writers like Reverend Fathers Felix and H. Hostin and others have noted. Variously known as the Roman Catholic Cemetery or the Padres Santos Cemetery, this bucolic place is hidden in plain sight and mostly unknown or ignored by Agra's visitors in favor of Shah Jahan's resplendent monument, monument of memory and love. And of course, the reference here is to the real Taj Mahal. From Father's Felix down to our own Sanjay Subramaniam, the tombstone inscriptions inside this resting place have struck observers as evocative of how already by the early years, early period of Mughal rule, the Mughal capital functioned as a quote, uh, as a mighty quote, cosmopolitan rendezvous. My first visit there in, the early, in early December uh, uh, of 2019, quickly impressed upon me how much of Agra's Christian cemetery in fact mirrors the larger society that gave birth to it. All manner of men and sometimes women from Europe and across Eurasia somehow found themselves in that graveyard where their earthly remains were interred and their posthumous histories began. Not far from the Armenian plot, in fact, in fact, right into it, one immediately notices the, cemetery, the tombstone of the Catholic Englishman John Mildenhall, who died there in 1614. A surprising number of footloose and adventurous Venetians, Bernardino Maffei, 1628, Girolamo Ver Veroneo, 1640, Hortensio Bronzoni, 1677. Mercenaries such as Walter Reinhardt, also known by his sobriquet, uh, sobriquet of Sombre or Samru, and the Dutchman Jan Willem Hessing, 1740-1803, who's a general in the Maratha army killed by the British while defending the Agra fort. At the entrance of the grounds is a hauntingly beautiful Taj Mahal that you can see down here, uh, the red Taj Mahal as it's known, built in 1803 from red sandstone, and like many of the other monuments on the ground, and a mini, uh, like many of the monuments on the ground, and a miniature version of its namesake. Erected as an ode to memory uh, by Anne Hessing to commemorate her late husband, this grand red mausoleum is surrounded by dozens of other more modest burial chambers, each with its own Indo-Saracenic ch uh, chhatris or domed pavilions that you can see here on the screen. Um, emblematic of the reigning architectural style in Mughal domains. Beguiling to many Europeans and Armenians alike, this style was borrowed or adapted to their own sepulchral cultures, yet again testifying to the transculturation at work in these communities. To the right of Hessing's mausoleum was the first inscribed uh, Armenian grave marker that I encountered in a sea of cenotaphs. And you can see this marker here one I'm referring to right here in the middle. Uh, I'll read very quickly the inscription in Armenian. Ais e Daban Baron Zorab Simeon Yan Kabulzi Karasuniergu Daregan I Agra Vachanvets Janeri Dasniergu Hazar Utairur Karasun Ina. Otherwise, sacred to the memory of Mr. Zorab Simon of Kabul, with a C, spelled with a C, an Armenian merchant who departed this life on the 12th of January in 1849, aged 42 years. We have no idea when Mr. Simon from Kabul arrived in the former Mughal capital, 
but we can be certain that he was part of a tiny community of Armenian merchants from Afghanistan that had followed, fallen on sad times in the middle of the 19th century, thus leading our merchant to migrate to more hospitable abodes that the British Raj ostensibly provided. There were approximately 112 or 15 other Armenians who were, to borrow a phrase from Arié, sleepers of stone in Agra. The fact that a little more, a little over, the fact that a little over a hundred Armenians were buried in the cemetery in the course of 400 years indicates that the community in question at any given time probably did not exceed a few dozen individuals, if that many. Yet, despite their limited numbers, this was clearly a community of some means. It boasted several go-betweens, including Mirza Zulkharnein, about whom we heard yesterday in brief, the son of a Jofan merchant from Aleppo named Iskandar or Sikandar, or otherwise also known as Hagop in some sources, according particularly to the Armenian merchant historian Thomas Khojamalian's account of Indo-Armenian history, uh, who, uh, according to this source, was a favorite of Akbar's and was adopted by the powerful regent as his own. Even Akbar's official, uh, even Akbar's other officials included uh, Armenians, in, uh, particularly a, a person named Abdul Hai, who is said to have been uh, active in Akbar's court, though in what capacity exactly is not really known. For reasons unknown, Mr. Simon's tombstone remains apart from those of his compatriots who had their separate plot about six or 700 yards northeast of Hessing's elaborate tomb. The tombstones, their tombstones appear to be concentrated around one of the most celebrated octagonal uh, monuments on the cemetery grounds, the mausoleum adorned with an onion-shaped dome of an Armenian merchant whose name has undergone all manner of distortions uh, ranging from what Mesrob said, we heard about him yesterday from Martin, rightly characterized as the jaw-breaking Mortenapus, itself a misreading of the Persian rendition of the man's name Martinus, or to use his proper name, Martiros or Martyr Martiros Martiros. Mortenapus was apparently a very wealthy Armenian and is described on his cenotaph as a Jofen, a claim that baffles since at the time of his demise in India in 1611, he has the oldest tombstone on the grounds, New Jufa had scarcely been founded. It was founded in 1605. So that, uh, which of course suggests that he might have traveled to Agra, not from New Jufa as such, but from old Jufa before the town's destruction in 1604. Mortenapus is also unusual because he was in all likelihood an ardent Roman Catholic and a champion of the Jesuits whose, num whose members were officially welcomed by Akbar. As his tombstone inscription on the, in both Armenian and Persian makes clear, he had, he had made two pilgrimages uh, in his life, one to Jerusalem, hence his moniker Mahtesi in Armenian, and another pilgrimage to Rome. He appears to have played some role in obtaining Emperor Jahangir's Farman of 1611, granting the Jesuits their own burial grounds where Mortenapus himself was buried in a nice chapel that you can see at the far right corner of this image. Before I turn to the little studied Armenian cemetery of Surat, let me quickly summarize my main findings regarding the Armenian, regarding Armenian, regarding how Armenian funerary culture in Agra may be said to heterotopically mirror the community that created it. First, the sheer variety of places of origin of those whose lapidary traces remain in the graveyard suggests that Agra's Catholic and Armenian cemetery is reflective 
of a much larger cosmopolitan milieu that was already that was in the imperial capital of the Mughals. Second, this diversity was itself constitutive of the imperial city's Armenian population, whose members were sub-ethnically from a dizzying array of locations across the Armenian homeland and the diaspora. Not surprisingly, the overwhelming majority of the dead, who are also the community's wealthiest, are of Jofan origin. In addition to the Jofans, there were several Armenian families with lineage in Tiflis or Tbilisi today, one merchant each from Arab Gir, Samson in Bitlis or Bagesh, all in the Ottoman Empire, and at least three outliers, including two from Afghanistan and one Manuk from Venice. The composite nature of the identities among the dead and the living is reflected also in the way the dead have managed to leave residue of their existence in language and script. While the vast majority of the grave markers are in classical Armenian, or the occasional Jufa dialect, a good many are bilingual or even trilingual, containing verses in Persian in several, in, in several instances, as well as Georgian script, as was the case for the deceased who traced their lineage to Tiflis or Gori in the Kingdom of Georgia. Consider, for instance, the case of Gabriel of the Agababens family of Tiflis, who passed on in Agra in 1816 and whose tombstone has an ornate inscription in Georgian script, the only one that I've I managed to locate, and you can find it right here. Armenian. Not far from the tomb is the resting place of an Armenian priest, Reverend Petros, son of Sarkis, from, quote, the province of Karabakh in the country of the Armenians, unquote, who died in Agra also in 1816. As a diasporic heterotopia, the Agra burial, burial grounds, like that of Surat or elsewhere, also reflects the sub-ethnic multiplicity as well as the global mobility upon which the larger diaspora examined in, during this conference uh, here has estab uh, was established. The Armenian Cemetery of Surat with its the Indo-Saracenic domes and vaulted burial chambers are also a defining feature of the Armenian cemetery of Surat, the Mughal's auspicious port, or Bandare Mubarak, as it was known, conquered by Akbar in 1572-73. The cemetery is not as old as Agra's, but shares many hallmarks in common with it, including the fact that it was built inside the compound of another European graveyard, in this case, the Dutch cemetery dating from the mid 17th century and housing many illustrious Dutch East India Company officials, such as the earliest tombstone of a Dutch woman buried there in 1642. By contrast, the earliest surviving Armenian tombstone in the Armenian portion of the grounds is dated from 1695, despite Mestrop Seth's uncorroborated and difficult to accept claim that the Armenian that the earliest Armenian tombstone dates back to 1579. So hardly anything reliable is known about the origins of this cemetery. That there was an Armenian church in Surat as early as the 1680s with at least three parish priests serving there is known from letters and a will preserved at the All Saviors Monastery Archive in New Julfa. This church appears to have been torn down in subsequent decades and a new one built in 1788, uh, which was itself, uh, which was itself uh, torn down in the early part of the 20th century when the bulk of the community had already shifted its base from Surat to Mumbai or Bombay in, this, uh, in the south in 1797. And you can see
world market which is the vestibule of the Armenian Church of St. Peter's in Mumbai and it details in a very difficult to read in this type of script the history of the church in the, the second Armenian Church in Surat of 1788. Since no trace is left of the original 17th century church, we can only infer from surviving evidence that by the late 17th century, the community felt the need to have their own cemetery plot like those of the English and the Dutch East India companies in their burial grounds built on the northern edge of Surat and in the case of the British outside the city walls. The Dutch appear to have had their own burial grounds since at least the mid 17th century. So, but, and when the English traveler, John Fryer arrived in Surat in 1672, he noted their handsome tombstones and added the following regarding the Armenians. He said, adjoining of which the Dutch, the Armenians have a garden where on the terrace, 40 yards in length and five in breadth are reared several monuments, coffin fashion, with a place to burn incense at the head like the Moors, only over it a cross. In 1695, a member of Surat's wealthiest Armenian family, known as the Galandarian or Galantarian family, anglicized as Calendar, built a small chapel next to the terrace that Friar identifies in this earlier, in his visit in the 1670s. Not surprisingly, Given how well integrated the Armenians were into the fabric of Indo-Islamic culture, the chapel is in the Indo-Saracenic style, like those of the mausoleums in Agra or outside the Dutch cemetery. With its onion-shaped domes and linked by arches, uh, with its iron-shaped domes and linked by arches, this structure houses the majority of the Armenian graves. I counted 82 Armenian tombstones on my visit. Nearly half were in front of the mortuary, uh, in front of the small chapel, and in white marble with clearly legible inscriptions with ornate engravings. Others were scattered on the grounds and either covered by tall grass and weeds or had their engravings worn out. The, the, the tombstone inside the chapel is dates from 1695 and memorializes Galandar the Galandar, the son of the famous Jofen go-between, Hoja Panos Kalandar, about whom I think Rukuya said a few words yesterday or we talked about it during the discussion period. He was the one who signed the uh, treaty in 1688 with the English East India Company, allowing Armenians to settle in various uh, outposts uh, that were under the company's jurisdiction. Like Agra, the Armenian cemetery in Surat is also heterotopically reflective as a place where the dead mirror the living and their diverse, uh, diverse uh, identities. Among the surviving ornate grave markers, the overwhelming majority belong to wealthy Jofun merchants. At least one is of a man named Sargis, son of Andreas, of Digranagert or Amid Diyarbakir today, in, uh, or Amid and Diyarbakir in the Ottoman Empire, while several several others belong to individuals from Tiflis in Georgia, like Agra and elsewhere. That there are fewer than a hundred graves in a period of several centuries suggests yet again that the community in question was indeed uh, minuscule, probably not exceeding a hundred, maybe a little more than a hundred at any given time. In addition, the signs left behind by the deceased suggest a considerable variety of social hierarchy and occupational uh, difference within the community. The wealthiest, like that of Galandar di Galandar, rest buried inside their own chapel, in, uh, while, the other, while the others have or handsome tombstones on their own in a larger company of other tombstones. To conclude, both the Agra and Surat Armenian cemeteries strike the visitors strolling among the sleepers of stone as extraordinarily evocative and beautiful oases of quietude. From the Indo-Saracenic domes and vaulted arches to the elaborate engravings 
and multi-scriptal inscriptions in classical Armenian, Persian, Hindustani, Georgian, Latin, and English, everything about the sepulchral culture used by these merchants is quite astonishing and deserving of further investigation, even theorizing. Yet, as I have suggested in this schematic overview, beyond the lux luxurious beauty of these spaces of memory, the community and the commu memory and community, the cemeteries in general, and the Armenian burial grounds of Bagra and Surat in particular, are heterotopias that illuminate the histories of the living. Communities of the, uh, the histories of the communities of the living not only gave birth to these graveyards, acquiring a suitable plot, designing funerary monuments, commissioning local stone cutters and engravers, but they also continuously shaped and reshaped these burial grounds as they went about their business, drawing deep meaning from the continuous interaction with these spaces of liminality. And I will leave you with this image uh, uh, for a, a couple of seconds so you can take a look at it and perhaps when you see it, you can come back and address the question of how this image exemplifies some of the major arguments I've tried to make in this presentation about the living, the relationship between the dead and the living and how the living interact with their own cemeteries and so on. Uh, I ask you to pay particular attention to the two figures here are not very well uh, pictured because of the, the watercolor uh, and uh, not very high quality um, state of the, uh, the reproduction here. But this is an, uh, this is a man with wearing a very strange coat combed hat, kind of hat that we saw yesterday during the presentation on Manila by uh, Shadi Ramiti. Uh, this is a uniquely Gulfan headgear, uh, identified Gulfan in a crowd of a thousand anywhere in India. And then there's also a figure down there in the corner right here, hardly visible, but he's wearing a different kind of hat. So I will end here and thank, and thank you again for your patience. <laughs> Thank you so much um, to Seppu for including me. Um, this has uh, opened a whole new channel of uh, inquiry for me, so I'm very grateful. Um, I'm also grateful to Amy for hosting us in yes, thank you. At, the, at the museum. In 1619, Shabas granted the wealthiest of Armenians the suburb of New Julfa, what became, uh, as Aslanian has dubbed, the nodal center of their vast trade network. In 1701, when Dutch painter De Bruyne uh, wrote his travel account, some 30 churches of various sizes, morphologies, and decorative sophistications had Burgeon within a 10 block urban space. Most of these Safavid churches dating between 1606 and 1650 were erected in a hybrid style described by Craswell as a mix of Armenian and Persian elements with an extensive use of brick building techniques. In 1822, six Zoroastrian fire temples adorned the cityscape of Western India. By the end of the century, wealthy Parsi industrialists has augmented that number tenfold. Um, many were erected in the Persian revival style, harking back to Persepolis. Out of a total of nine highest grade temples globally, Six were built in Western India during the 19th century, although the home of Zoroastrianism has always been uh, farce, Iran. 
The formal and stylistic decisions of these ethno-religious philanthropists, each secure with their own long and distinct artistic traditions, can be characterized as timely, hybrid, and trans-imperial, shaping and projecting minoritarian and cosmopolitan selfhood. Based on limited uh, existing evidence and preliminary research, this paper proposes a comparative art historical analysis of the artistic uh, philanthropy of Perso-Armenian merchants and Zoroastrian Parsi industrialists in order to ultimately map a global web of patronage, um, basically following uh, Sapu's uh, map of trade. They both, these two groups, developed the same strategies of soft power with copious commissions of temples, residences, and educational institutions in India, Iran, and Europe. And both lay merchants classes understood the sociopolitical effects of architectural patronage and thus turned their economic success into cultural capital. Significant structural similarities, both socioeconomic and architectural, exist between them and allows this comparison. While the single nodal center of the Armenian monocentric network was New Julfa, that of Parsis was Bombay. Handpicked by Safavid rulers and East India Company as middle men um, minorities, both Armenians and Parsis spread out through their respective trade routes. Armenians came first, and perhaps it can be dem demonstrated by historians and not me, that Parsis stepped into the vacuum created by Nader Shah's ruinous treatment of New Julfan Armenians. Perso-Armenians dominated Safavid Mughal trade and by extension Armenian patronage throughout the 17th century into the first half of the 18th century. Wealthy Parsi uh, families like the Wadyas, Banajis, Ready Money, and Gigi Boys rose to economic power to become unmatched industrialists, reformists, and builders. By 1855, these families literally owned about half of Bombay and 40% dealt in trade. Like Armenians before them, Parsi commerce in East Asia started with textile and was replaced with salt, raw silk, cotton, indigo, sugar, and the very lucrative and hush-hush opium. Both Armenians and Parsis culturally pivoted around post-Mughal Persianate universalism, centered at the heart of ancient Iran, Fars, and Esfahan. Both mercantile uh, classes deployed economic might to raise above traditional social hierarchies through the adoption of the latest technologies whose patronage paved the way for a new formation of Armenian identity in one case and the rationalization of Zoroastrianism in the other. New Julfans were at the vanguard of print culture, as we have seen yesterday, literature and translation, secular education, and later photography. Parsis were aggressive in reforming the Parsi brand of Zoroastrianism by building, collecting, and publishing at the zenith of the scientific century. Minorities in a sea of ethnicities, languages, and religions, they were agents of monumental change for each of their respective communities. Both were benefactors of the fine arts, which traveled globally from bazaars to royal courts, as Amy Landau has demonstrated. Both benefited from royal protection and frequented aristocratic sites and tastes. And both seem to have understood the trans-imperial value of culture, of architectural visibility. In this, Armenian hojas commissioned churches and transplanted priests wherever they traded while Parsis erected fire temples and housed the priests in reformed temples. Excluding the Armenian churches in Agra, Surat, Bombay, and Singapore for various architectural and source reason, basically they don't, they're not there. 
um, or in some cases like this one, they're just um, don't fit uh, they're later and they don't fit uh, my argument uh, because they're later. I uh, state uh, I start here by foregrounding five prominent and extant Armenian churches built in Mughal India from 1697 to 1797 to make an argument that despite their oddly non-Armenian appearance, these edifices are a byproduct of New Jofan's simultaneous commitment to a specifically Perso-Armenian ethno-religious identity and a worldly trans-imperial fluidity. So they, uh, they include um, uh, the Holy Nazareth in um, uh, Calcutta, um, uh, built in two stages, and this is a characteristic of these churches. They're uh, built in multiple stages, first wood, then burns, there, there's something else. So there's a consecration date, and then there's a existing building date. And that's exactly the same with Parsi um, architecture. Uh, the second one is John uh, the Baptist Church um, in uh, Chensura, uh, where we find these, just like the other uh, examples, elongated naves um, and open arches on uh, side aisles with very prominent uh, bell tower. Uh, the fourth one, St. Mary's Church um, in uh, Seydabad, uh, um, and uh, here we have a unique case of uh, a, 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 a triple arched uh, a frontal entrance that is capped with a lantern that becomes the uh, uh, belfry. Uh, the fourth one is the uh, Holy uh, Resurrection Church that we have uh, heard yesterday, about which we have heard yesterday. Uh, again, with uh, this elongated uh, nave, uh, um, a flat wooden uh, beam ceiling, and uh, a Baroque, neo-Baroque uh, colonnaded uh, decorative program, balustrades. Um, and uh, many of these characteristics are uh, applicable to these four, and I will talk, I will come back to the fifth one. Before the architectural analysis, a few dates that impact the history of these buildings. In 1619, Shah Abbas granted Isfahan's southern suburb to Armenia's opening up a site for an architectural renaissance. In 1622, um, the Hormoz uh, port was opened for New Jolfin trade into the Indian Ocean, globalizing their circulation and patronage. In 1648, a massive earthquake devastated the Van, Yerevan, and Urmia regions of the uh, Armenian heartland, opening the way for lay hojas to replace clergies in church patronage. And in 1688, the East India Company's agreement stipulated that Armenians be, quote, allotted a, par a parcel of ground to erect a church with stone or other solid materials to their own good liking, unquote, opening the next 50 years to Rojas monster construction. So these are very important to architectural uh, processes. This architecture, so far neglected in scholarship, can reveal much broader historical patterns of ritual, circulation, and thought. As John Hennels notes, Parsi wealth was both considerable and visible. India's Armenian architecture can be examined through the same premise of visibility in the circulation of economic capital vis-a-vis -vis discursive practices of trans-imperial power. These churches, monumental in scale and occupying prominent urban space in trade districts, just like the Parsi temples, not only required surplus wealth, land and ownership rights, skilled labor and its proper management, acquisition of the latest materials and know-how, but more importantly, the right to political reproducibility and visibility in Mughal and British Raj cityscapes. In the sim symbol-crazed empire where literacy rate for commoners were as low as 10%, how these structure looked uh, and um, what they communicated mattered deeply to the patrons. 
According to canonical Armenian art history, wherein neither New Julfan nor Indian Armenian architecture is examined in any serious manner, much less as a global web of patronage, there was a quote brilliant um, renaissance of the early 17th century owed to enriched trades that came about by the centralized, perfectly structured, and stable Ottoman and Safavid empires. Safe travel routes combined with urbanization of Armenians in such cities as New Julfa, Tiflis, and Van further increased the significance of architectural patronage. The construction of parish churches in urban settings overtook rural monasteries as clergymen gave way to wealthy merchants in architectural patronage. Hojas, in turn, uh, in their stylistic intervention as patrons either in new constructions or in post-1648 earthquake renovations, introduced European and Islamicate uh, taste uh, acquired during their many, many travels. The 17th century Renaissance is characterized by the endurance of classical features with new interventions, two of which stand out for our purposes. So in these four churches that I've shown you, there are three consistent architectural decisions. One is the selection of the Basilica Church, which is actually um, um, uh, rare uh, in, in the um, uh, in later period. Um, um, and we see that consistently the nave uh, is elongated, the Basilica is uh, preferred over the centrally planned uh, uh, churches. And um, uh, in the 17th century, we do see uh, the basilica uh, proliferating, um, including in Murni in the heartland, and then uh, the only floor plan I could find of these churches, the one in Dhaka. Um, uh, uh, and even in uh, New Julfa, when they are building these uh, early 17th century uh, build, uh, churches, they are attempting on a long, longer nave, but they, what they're doing is basically duplicating the central plan. And so every time they want to do a longer, they're not adapting the basilica, they're just duplicating the classical uh, centrally plan of uh, Ahtamar or Ripsime. And on the side of it, they are uh, adding a very atypical, uh, the arcade, the portico on the side aisles, which again is uh, unique to the classical architecture. And the only uh, existing prominent example that we have accessible is Ozun, um, oh, with these same uh, arches. The other uh, intervention was the introduction of the bell tower. Um, and uh, um, this piece of uh, um, the, this altar uh, frontal is very important to me. I still need a lot of work uh, in terms of research. But first of all, it's a new jewel fund patronage. It's a transport transportable object, visual object. It could be put in a little suitcase and transported uh, 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 between uh, India, Iran, and um, Armenia. Here we're seeing um, um, uh, St. Gregory's dream, a vision of the first and therefore the ideal church. And the ideal church has uh, the towers um, and uh, this kind of lan lantern uh, uh, figure. And indeed, when we look at, when we examine it globally, uh, bell bell towers become the main marker of 17th century architecture. Existing major cathedrals like Ejmiadzin and uh, Ahtamar, they acquire new bell towers in the, um, in the uh, 17th uh, century. New constructions like Murni, they acquire the Nartex, the Gavit, uh, and on top of it, this kind of lantern Bell towers uh, in Old Julfa region, uh, Saint Stepanos uh, has a bell tower. In New Julfa, you see the bell tower becomes its own object uh, in front of the church. 
uh, in as far as Venice, they add the um, uh, bell tower in the 18th century, and by the 19th century, the bell tower becomes its own architectural uh, entity. Uh, so, uh, in in this comparative uh, analysis in uh, Sayyidabad, we're seeing uh, the tripartite uh, arch in, uh, um, uh, uh, entrance uh, topped by a belfry, uh, much like. Uh, when uh, Guyane acquired its Nartex. And so a comparative is sort of a collage of elements that was transform transformable um, um, and collageable in a way. Um, the the, the St. Mary's Church in Madras um, uh, is slightly different. Again, we see the, the slightly elongated uh, nave um, um, uh, with, the, the, of course, the uh, uh, lantern at the top and a separate uh, bell tower. Uh, stylistically, is more Baroque, it's different. But what is interesting to me uh, are some of these details uh, that I could not help but notice that, again, we have a new jewel fund patronage, a trans transportable object that might have been uh, an inspiration, um, uh, uh, where we see this kind of dome being repeated elsewhere as far as uh, Baku. Um, uh, but this one detail, uh, we have a Parsi temple and uh, the Armenian church in Madras. And um, uh, basically, I'm guessing that, of course, research is needed, that Parsis and Armenians uh, in the 18th century, they were shopping at the same uh, Home Depot. Um, and for Parsis, this has a specific uh, um, importance. I mean, it's the a fire holder, uh, actually a Parsi invention. Uh, where, because fire being very sacred to Parsis, but Armenians are using as a decorative material, as an ornament, not necessarily. Uh, instead, for Armenians, it's the shape of the cross that is being repeated and is unique to Armenian. And you see the cross and you know you're in Armenian. Uh, this is the um, a reformed Parsi open plan, where at the end, you uh, in the in the uh, their altar you have the fire holder. So wrapping up, um, the diasporic trade nature of this architectural patronage is due to uh, contextual needs and possibilities. So uh, the diasporic flexibility, non-Armenian and non-Parsi labor. Uh, so uh, when you have you have to rely on local label, especially with such a small Armenian community, you just don't have the masons around, um, and a verbal mobile transmission of instructions. Literally, some instructions were given verbally. Go do this conical dome, and then the conical dome becomes not so conical. As in Parsi architecture, there's there's an element of experimentation in these churches, a certain make do what, uh, with whatever you have on hand in terms of architects, craftsmen, construction, and material expertise that is aggravated by the whimsical wishes and fluctuating taste of individual patrons who might have been great at willing and dealing, but with questionable architectural know-how. As in the case of Parsi architecture, this set of buildings lends itself to the modern eye, a sense of kitsch. Um, and they are dismissed for it. Um, they however, uh, uh, if we uh, let our aesthetic judgment aside, they confirm that global circulation and connect uh, connectivity of aesthetic discourses thus complicating the art historical fate in Western origins and native peripheral copies through transportable uh, iconography. Methodologically, these buildings demonstrate that there are no bad copies in art history, only edifices that reveal broader forms of sociopolitical resistance expressed in aesthetic discourses. As in the Parsi case, I parse this set of works not by what it is, 
but by what it has been but by how it has been ignored due to what it lacks not by what it means but by what it how it functions in the discursive field of visual meaning articulating a politics of visuality and visibility not by what it was that is beautiful original armenian persian indian but by what it did that is to endorse or resist coercion legitimize or mocked power uh, make a community visible or hide it for both armenians and later parsis architectural commissions negotiated complex and a continually shifting identity pockets during trans-imperial flux the hybrid architectures that patrons commissioned could be counted as expressions of the adaptability of both armenians and parsis as trade diasporas or are not Toynbee's creative minorities. Architecture quite literally stabilized and grounded in solid foundations the uncertainty of in-between identities, ironing out intra-communal conflicts and masking the inherent ambivalence of each of their civilizational projects. Even if engulfed by urban built up, this architecture remains a witness to the rich history of Indian Armenians. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kawi, for your generous introduction, and also Professor Aslanyan for uh, the invitation. It's been a pleasure to be here and uh, an honor to um, be in the company of such distinguished speakers. Uh, my talk is titled Orientalism and the Making of the Armenian Diasporic Imaginary in Early Colonial India. And um, it will focus on the figure of Yosef Emin, a Persian Armenian reformer who was commissioned by the English East India Company to write The Life and Adventures of Yosef Emin, an Armenian written in English by himself, an English language memoir prepared in Calcutta and published in London in 1792, republished in Calcutta in 1918, and finally translated into Armenian in Beirut in 1958. This small-leafed 640-page uh, memoir contained what its author, author called, quote, uh, the narrative of his transactions in life, end quote. The memorial, as Emin himself referred to it, was commissioned by Earl Cornwallis, then Governor General of Bengal, without whom Emin claimed he, quote, could never have finished, end quote. Sir William Jones, uh, who is acknowledged as a, quote, friend at Calcutta, uh, corrected the, quote, bad English and false spelling uh, of the manuscript. Um, and claimed that he had designedly left the rough style without alteration uh, to preserve its character. Although Jones refused to be named as Emin's editor because he did not wish to be, quote, accessory to anything that appears even in a questionable shape, end quote, he was one of its foremost supporters. Without him, Emin explained he should never had undertaken to do it. Jones and his wife also helped to finance the publication by pre-ordering and prepaying five copies. Here you see the uh, 1958 translation um, into Armenian, and here uh, an image of Emin from the 1918 uh, edition. Through a close reading of this peculiar narrative and its structure, as well as its author's travels, uh, I will retrace how early modern encounters with British colonialism in South Asia shaped Armenian diasporic imaginaries, arguably, of national independence in the borderlands of the Ottoman, Russian, and Persian empires. I call attention to the anonymous editorship and overlooked influence of Sir William Jones, the colonial administrator, and of, and of course, uh, one of the founders of the discipline of Orientalism, uh, on a mean self-image as uh, an Asiatic other who sought to refashion Armenian politics in line with colonial imaginaries and practices 
of extraterritorial and corporate sovereignty. After living through waves of displacement and colonial expansion in West and South Asia, he became convinced of the superiority of European manners, knowledge, and styles of governance. In 1916, Amy Apkar, Yosef Amin's great-great-granddaughter, discovered a dilapidated copy of, him, of his manuscript in her Kolkata attic. Leafing through its tattered pages, she busily went about reconstructing her forgotten ancestor's life, and in 1918 republished the memoir with Baptist Mission Press in Kolkata. Um, interestingly, uh, Mesrop Seth, whom we heard about yesterday, referred to this uh, peculiar document as an autobiography in, uh, by 1937. Apkar consulted church registers and gravestones, archives of local newspapers, and the collected letters of Amin's many European benefactors. Distributed by Luzak & Co. in London, the second edition was annotated with extensive footnotes, maps, facsimiles, and excerpts of handwritten letters as well as the only surviving portrait of Yosef Amin that I just showed. Not only the title, but also the structure of the narrative was substantially altered. Titled Life and Adventures of, Yosef, uh, of Amin Yosef Amin, 1726 to 1809, written by himself, uh, as you can see here on the left. Um, the second edition um, omitted Amin's identification as an Armenian, which had been so prominent in the original, and dropped the qualification in English to emphasize instead Amin's authorship. Apkar broke up Amin's continuous narrative into chapters, included a detailed table of contents, and highlighted specific events through her choice of chapter titles. She added a foreword, pages upon pages of his letters, and asserted her editorial authority by providing carefully cropped scholarly analysis and historical commentary. These decisions responded to a new historical moment, she no longer considered it noteworthy that an Armenian author should have elected to write in English, nor that he had been an Armenian at all. While Emin lived through the ascent of British colonial power in India, Apkar's world was entirely steeped in it. Her epistemic interventions, if you will, reflected the long durée of Armenian presence in British colonial India. Before Emin's original introduction, Apkar inserted a letter by Sir William Jones uh, quote, the famous Orientalist, end quote. Dated in 1788, the letter chided my dear Emin for the, quote, Asiatic style of his narrative, which Jones found, quote, utterly repugnant to English manners, end quote. He congratulated Emin on his, quote, command of words in a language so different from Persian or Armenian, end quote, and implied that it was an accomplishment for Emin to have acquired the English language at all, even if imperfectly, while he himself claimed to have mastered, by virtue of his European uh, superiority, eight Oriental languages, including Arabic, Persian, and Sanskrit, among 20 more he uh, has alleged to have studied. Though Jones found Emin's project to be, quote, extremely laudable, he concluded that its failure, his word, was not at all surprising. If it had been Emin's design to, quote, transplant our constitution to Armenia, namely to establish a Republican government like that of England. So Jones, quote, I heartily lament your disappointment, though I cannot wonder at it, end quote. At the time, Jones was fashioning himself into one of the architects of, quote, anglo mohammedan law in colonial India, so Vail Halak, by seeking to codify Mughal legal practices in accordance with uh, Roman law categories to consolidate British colonial rule in such a way as to govern in accordance with the, quote, cultural habits of natives, end quote. I argue that this mode of colonial governance inspired Emin's Anglophile vision for Armenia, which also influenced the Madras circle of Armenian merchant intellectuals, whom we heard about already, um, with whom he co-authored, arguably, the first constitutional draft for a future Armenian Republic on the Ararat Plateau. Divided in two parts, the draft uh, consisted of a preamble titled Snare of Glory, or Vorogaid Parats, and a second, much longer part that catalogued 251 proposed laws and regulations. The idea was to rest restrain arbitrary power, dynastic and, and ecclesiastical, within the legal framework of a liberal constitution. Syncretized with Armenian customary law, the reformers envisioned a hybrid polity on the Armenian plateau, 
that would incorporate Armenians and govern them through an array of English style institutions. Though I don't have the time uh, today to discuss this document at length, and there are people in the room who are uh, experts, um, unlike myself, on this document, I want to suggest that its vision of the Armenian nation um, as an immortal legal person that could incorporate all Armenians with a representative governmental body centered on the Mount Ararat plain, not only hinged on ecclesiastical ideas about the body of the Armenian church, or ASG, as is the dominant reading, but that it also remarkably, and perhaps controversially, also replicated the extraterritorial sovereignty invented by the European Joint Stock Corporations in this colonial situation that governed the Armenian authors as British, subject, as British subjects in colonial Madras and Calcutta. Dating back to the Roman theory of corporate personality, which distinguished between natural and legal persons, the legal principle of incorporation is part of the European legal tradition, but was not readily imaginable or av available um, in Islamicate contexts. A municipality could turn itself into a corporation through the collective will of its members, meaning it could incorporate and become an aggregate body, acting as a unit, making bylaws, having a common seal, holding property in succession, and appearing in courts of law. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting um, during the last panel yesterday that there was a question about why did the Armenians not gather? And I think this is really where we ought to explore uh, this further. Once Amin adopted the colonial gaze as a framing device through which he came to interpret his own community, he hoped to harness European knowledge about the Orient to the advantage of Armenians. While he was writing his book, he was on the payroll of the Honorable Company, as he called the English East India Company, and received a small pension to finish his narrative as an unseen in the third company of, quote, well, it's called the third company of European invalids. Um, though he was wounded in his pride by this appointment, which was the best he was able to accomplish, because he saw himself as neither, quote, neither a beggar nor a cripple, end quote. He referred to himself as a, quote, white man, end quote, in India, who felt wronged by the hasty opinions and prejudices, his words, of British officers that prevented him from being, quote, treated like one of their own countrymen, end quote. So there's a sense of being aggrieved that perhaps the promise of being treated as kin to uh, English officers uh, that was held out by the 1688 agreement we heard about was not being fulfilled as racial boundaries continuously hardened over his lifetime. Plagued by the sense that his mind was, quote, a blunt, rusty knife cutting a thick bar of iron, end quote, by which he meant the British concept of liberty that really quite moved him throughout his life, Amin wrote that he, quote, puzzles his brains to express his meanings to his poor countrymen, end quote. In the introduction, he claimed, um, he claimed that his attempt, quote, to write his own history, end quote, was, quote, a novelty never before attempted by any of his richest countrymen, whose minds he described as, quote, unquote, gloomy. The accessibility of his plain style, so I mean, was intended to, quote, rouse the Armenian youth from their slumber of ignorance and stupor, his words. Amin asserted that, quote, Orientals know not what freedom is, end quote, and that Armenians had to learn to think like Europeans if they were ever wanted to be free. To, these, to this end, Amin attempted to master the language, manners, and the dispositions of Europeans to grasp the substance of liberty. Although he admitted that he had not primarily, that he was not primarily writing for Armenians, he hoped his Armenian readers would be improved through immersion in the, quote, English style, end quote, bringing the ethical idioms of Safavid Persia to bear on the Indian Ocean world he inhabited. His enthusiasm for British imaginaries of liberty was imbricated with syncretic allegiances to regional concepts of ethical masculinity, proper conduct, and the concept of futua, which I'm probably pronouncing incorrectly, um, but I'm told means the qualities of youth. Um, by prioritizing the style figures of speech setting and narrative devices of European literature at the time or Orientalism more specifically, he became a willing conscript to the new ordering structure of power and reason that constitutes, according to postcolonial scholar David Scott, colonial modernity. Bequeathed as an obscure inheritance, we could say, 
a means scheme for Armenia's liberation under the aegis, aegis of a Christian power cannot be understood outside of this colonial context, which hasn't really substantially be attempted. Um, as much as he desired to gain recognition for Armenians as, quote, free and true Christians, end quote, he also hoped above all to ingratiate himself with his colonial benefactors. Emin was born into an Armenian merchant family in Hamadan in the northwest of present-day Iran, but moved around as a refugee, was displaced between the ages of five and 16 years before he was reunited with his by then estranged father in Calcutta. Amin was then sent to Dhaka to learn trade, which he, quote, did not like at all, end quote, and then elected to study English instead of Portuguese or French at St. Anne's Christian uh, Charity School in Calcutta. This was an unlikely or uncommon choice at the time. Uh, eventually, he departed for England at the age of 25 uh, years, defying his father's wishes to, quote, learn art, military and other sciences to assist that art, end quote. It means core conviction that, quote, a nation is not a nation without wisdom, end quote, rested on his desire to, quote, go into Armenia like a European officer, end quote, and form a, quote, respectable alliance with Georgia, and then becoming tributary to a Christian power by advising him who has the rule over his nation, end quote. He internalized the idea that Europe represented reason while the East embodied its subordinate other, the core tenet of Orientalism as critiqued by post-colonial scholar Edward Said. This political imaginary emerged from a newly solidifying distinction between Asia and Europe, which privileged the epistemic position of Europe in ways that cannot be rebalanced because Orientalism produces the East and its image, arguably against Said. Mm -hmm. I'll leave you with this image. Uh, upon his arrival in Woolwich in 1751, Amin realized that he had not gone towards what he imagined would be, quote, a paradise upon earth. Without means and alone, he was cast into abject poverty. Wandering the streets of London, he almost signed an indenture contract at London's Royal Exchange and only narrowly escaped involuntary servitude in the West Indies. For two years, Amin got by as a porter and spent his free Sundays at St. James's Park where he observed, quote, the drilling of the recruits as well as the exercise of the king's guards, end quote. Previously, he had watched the, quote, fort of the Europeans and the soldiers' exercise and the shipping of the company in Calcutta. It appeared to him that they, quote, were dexterous and perfect in all things. Thoroughly mesmerized by, by this appearance of, quote, regularity or order, end quote, he came to believe that what he called European management was superior to, quote, Asiatic camps pitched in the nighttime in their irregular ways, end quote. He became convinced that, quote, all Asia was, quote, blindly ignorant to this true meaning of liberty. And he desired English education to, quote, improve himself, cast off his, quote, wild Asiatic temper and learn how to fight like Europeans, quote, who with a few overcome many, end quote. How was it that, quote, thousands of men by one word of command from their officers instantly all together could move and act as if they were but one single man end quote i think that this imaginary uh, calls up thomas hobbes's thinking on leviathan the sovereign as an assembly of men that would be appointed to quote it's a quote from hobbes to bear their person end quote as also envisioned in the Madras constitutional draft uh, snare of glory. Amin came to regard himself as a colonial other that could no longer, quote, bear to live like a beast, eating and drinking without liberty or knowledge, end quote. To him, as it stood, Armenians seemed, quote, disorderly and ignorant, end quote. His lifelong mission became to reinstate Armenian sovereignty in accordance with, quote, the European system of wise laws and useful regulations, end quote which he compared to the sun, uh, quote, which spreads its magnific magnificent light over all the universe. So this is clearly an imperial imaginary. With, quote, a little European management, he counseled, Armenians could, quote, flourish and be happy without being obliged to depend upon any other nation, end quote. Yet Amin felt a sense of missing unity or corporateness among Armenians, 
This new problem space made itself felt as an empty center at the heart of a new governmental project. How, to quote Etienne Balibar, uh, to produce the effect of unity by virtue of which the people will appear in everyone's eyes as a people, that is, as the basis and origin of political power. The empty center, so unbearable to Emin, remained unfilled by the covenant of the Armenian faith, the Armenian Apostolic Church, which was, as Professor Aslanian's work has demonstrated very impressively, itself fragmented between multiple centers at the time. If King Heraclius II of Georgia, whom, can, whom Emin considered the legitimate heir of the Bagratid line, failed to gather Armenians into a population and take charge of their life, his scattered people were reduced to a beastly existence. This outside of Christianity was demarcated as a wild space in which Armenians could not be, quote, sure of their own lives for half an hour, end quote. As Amin exhorted, true Christians understood that, quote, God has created them all free alike as rational beings that become cattle and perish no better than a beast, if they fail to realize the kingdom of God. In a letter to Heraclius II, Emin suggested that he should, quote, gather together the Armenians, a rich and trading people under the protection of your majesty's arms in your own country, and that in doing so, no kingdom in the East would be like your kingdom for riches and glory, end quote. He proposed to, quote, acquaint your majesty how it is or by what means that the European nations are such conquerors and so brave warriors, end quote. In Europe, he observed, quote, learned men are able to do things of great wonder and usefulness by studying the ways in which God has made all things according to nature, end quote. By uncovering the laws of nature, a ruler may govern in a rational way, reasoned way. Um, so Michel Foucault on liberal power and biopolitics in accordance with the course of things themselves. Though knowledge of the regularities that God embedded in nature, um, through knowledge of the regularities that God embedded in nature, he may anticipate adverse events and plan to avert them. The reason of state no longer resided in the laws that sovereignty sets for itself, but in the things it manages. Government, rather than rule that new problem space, um, was legitimated by the pursuit of the perfection and intensification of the processes which it directs, being a quote from Michel Foucault. However, when Emin realized that the Georgian sovereign was utterly uninterested in his learned counsel, he resigned, quote, what is not built on knowledge, though it is very strong and lofty, is as if it were built upon sand, end quote. He concluded that the, quote, Asiatic prince, so Emin, um, was tainted by his, quote, avaricious Asiatic disposition, end quote, as evidenced by what he called, uh, quote, greenish brown complexion, end quote. Uh, tortured by his own membership in the group of what he called us Asiatics, end quote, which he so desperately wished to overcome, Emin claimed that he was, quote, the only Armenian out of several thousands and thousands of years who has, ha who has had an inexpressible thirst for improvement and liberty, end quote drawing on what he called an English phrase, uh, namely that there are, quote, many born handsome, meaning wealthy, um, but they are not like that, like that man who acts handsomely. Emin suggested that he, the son of an Armenian, should be able to be a prince if he acts as a prince. Various father figures appear throughout the narrative to symbolically legitimize Emin, quote, as a king among the Armenians and as a prince sans royaume, a prince without a royal realm. realm. Through his appeal to patrilineal descent as a principle that constitutes the nation, he effectively imputed sovereignty to the nation as a whole, rather than to a royal lineage, uh, rather than a royal li lineage ruling over its subjects. On this basis, an Armenian that acts handsomely, in a means words, by exercising his capacity to reason, with wisdom and honor, may legitimately govern as a prince. In principle, any Armenian could then, under certain conditions, stand in for another. This modern metonymic logic was distinctly uh, modern. This metonymic logic was distinctly modern. It was liberal insofar as it mobilized a new mode of representation, the sense that any individual may virtually act on behalf of the Armenian nation, understood as a rich and trading people, who are scattered to the east and the west, to the north and to the south. That 
being a quote from Amin again. Insofar, neither subjection to an Armenian sovereign nor the Armenian church defined Armenian nationhood. Amin argued that the king and the church should be subordinated to a third instance, to national sovereignty, and derive their legitimacy from serving a people at the time to come. When Amin asked Armenian villagers in, villagers in Anatolia why they were, why they were, quote, not free and had no sovereign of their own, they replied, and that being um, a chapter in the book, quote, sir, our liberty is in the next world. Our king is Jesus Christ, end quote. Since, quote, the Armenian nation has been subject, subject to the Mohammedans uh, from the creation of the world, they argued, Armenians must, quote, remain so till the day of resurrection, end quote. According to the Holy Fathers of the Church, Armenian subjection was divinely ordained. So, Amin, uh, for Armenians to become warriors, like Amin wished they would, was therefore contrary to divine providence, as understood within the framework of the Armenian liberation legend that, again, Professor Asanyan has written about very eloquently. As described by Amin, the village priest explained, quote, the holy prophecy, prophecy is for 666 years to be fulfilled. During that period, we must continue in subjection. 638 years are expired. There remain 28 years more to complete our persecution. Then we shall become free. Then no power in the world can oppress us." End quote. Only after the expiration of this period, the Lord would return to, quote unquote, deliver Armenians from the hands of their oppressors, the enemies of their faith. Amin, however, desired liberty in this world. He rejected the messianic idea that Armenian sovereignty was bound up with the second coming of Christ. Instead of divinely ordained subordination, he propagated, quote, principles of zeal and honor to awaken the Armenian youth and harangue them into armed rebellion. Armin's, Armin's staged encounter with the Armenian villagers represented a confrontation of the illiberal past with its enlightened mirror image, facing off across the threshold of modernity. Despite his secular convictions, Amin still shared a certain millenarian sensibility, namely that there could be worldly intervention, um, shared a certain millenarian sensibility. After all, the holy prophecy uh, was structured around the idea of liberation by external European powers. Um, similarly, Amin believed that uh, Armenian liberation could be accomplished through intervention into the reality of Armenian history from outside of Armenia. Mm. From a modern standpoint, um, the old language of legend may appear as a fable convenu, a made-up tale that is believed to be true. However, Emin recounted grieving for his religion after first witnessing the exercises of English soldiers at Fort William in Calcutta. He suddenly felt his country was, quote, in slavery and ignorance, end quote. But his secular message of salvation offered liberty instead of liberation. The Armenian discourse of liberation remained structured around the desire for the attainment of political freedom with the help of an external power. Over time, it had coalesced around various figures, from the crusading armies of the, quote, Franks, to the Catholic papacy, a German prince, and even Peter the Great, the emperor of the Russian Empire. However, neither the German nor the Russian program of Armenian liberation came to fruition. It means English program, as I would propose to, propose to call it, retained the messianic temporality of the Armenian liberation legend, but centered on reason as that external force that would deliver Armenians. He set out to attain, quote unquote, European knowledge as a pharmacon that could transform Armenian sovereignty itself. However, his secular scheme for liberation through rational self-government continued to be heteronymous, that is other determined, because it hinged on colonial ideas about the national self as other. And this is why I so extensively quoted from his narrative previously. Because Emin's liberation campaigns were propelled by a powerful desire to become like Europeans. He yearned for Armenian emancipation from Asia. As modern discourses of race uh, were beginning to consolidate, the differential incorporation of Armenians in the colonial enterprise um, functioned as a constant reminder of the ways in which Armenians were assimilable, but not akin to Englishmen born, as they had been uh, referred to in the 1688 agreement. Um, Sebu Aslanyan describes the life and adventures of Yosef Emin, an Armenian written in English by himself, 
as a quote, Indo-Armenian memoir written in English, end quote. I propose to categorize it as an Anglo-Armenian memoir to emphasize that it was written in the service uh, and under the jurisdiction of the English East India Company in colonial India. Its primary readership was British. After the hardship of Emin's first years in England, he found himself steeped in London's early modern high society, including such figures as Lady Yarmouth, um, a lover of King George II, uh, which secured him access to the highest echelons of the British monarchy and its most ardent supporters. When Great Britain formed an alliance with Prussia during the Seven Year War, Emin volunteered on the battlefield as an apprentice, um, where he alleged to have made the acquaintance of Friedrich the Great, the reform minded Prussian monarch whom Emin greatly admired. Eventually, his extensive network of English patrons, including Edmund Burke, the author of A Vindication of Natural Society, and other important works of uh, English philosophy, the Earl, later Duke of Northumberland, who briefly helped Emin en enroll at the Royal Military Academy uh, at Woolwich, and Lazy Lady Elizabeth Montagu, his longtime epistolary friend and patroness of the famous Blue Stocking Literary Circle in London, supplied him with letters of recommendation that secured him passage to Upper Armenia by way of St. Petersburg, the seat of the Russian Empire, its provinces in the North, Northern Caucasus, Ottoman Anatolia, Ottoman Anatolia, and Safavid Persia. It means extraordinary social mobility and geographical mobility was facilitated by his outsider status as a curiosity, perhaps, which he knew to exploit. For example, by comparing himself to, quote, a dromedary brought over by a Greek and exhibited in London, end quote. At a time of greater racial fluidity, he was addressed variously as a slave, a devil, and an animal called, quote, very ugly, end quote, and treated as a bad omen, but also mistaken for German or Frenchman due to his name, um, which was then similarly injurious considering ongoing wars and hostilities at the time. Prior to the consolidation of the expanding British Empire, it means growing familiarity with English cultural norms, literacy, and dedication to the cause of Armenian independence as he understood it under the aegis of Christian sovereignty, eventually earned him the esteem of many um, benefactors. After several failed attempts, Emin's liberation campaign was finally thwarted by conspiring secular and ecclesiastical powers. At last, he escaped the political intrigue by marrying into a local family in Nojalfa, quote, principally for the safety of his life, end quote. Although Emin was himself traversed, um, although Emin himself traversed the solidifying binary between East and West, he believed that, quote, the, he believed that the words of Euro European travelers sufficiently prove that, quote, um, the Asiatic dispositions of uh, Armenians have been, sorry, I'll repeat that. Although Emin himself tra traversed the solidifying binary between East and West, he believed that, quote, the words of European travelers sufficiently prove their Asiatic dispositions have been always contrary to those of Europeans. So that's, again, the operations of Orientalist tropes. Shuttling between East and West, West and East, Emin's texts perpetually traverse the apparatic constitution of diasporic identity on and through what Edward Said called the line separating Occident from Orient. Its startling fidelity to the terms of European mastery counters contemporary sensibilities. It may be hard to even hear about it. Um, sensibilities about independence and autonomy, but also productively defamiliarizes how we might envision liberation. Far from a neutral description, Armenia's position in this imaginative geography of Asia and Europe rests on dominating coercive systems of knowledge that remain its condition of possibility. Reading a means writing now, and I conclude with this, across the threshold of modernity, creates a distancing effect that um, may help to move us towards another emancipatory politics. What lies beyond Armenian incorporation within the edifice of colonial modernity? By shedding light on the logic of empire operating in his text and uh, memoir, I propose that a post-colonial reading might allow us to reinvent the present moment beyond the terms of self-possession and property and actualize freedom in relation to this outside, this alterity that Emin found unbearable. Thank you very much.
it in there. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, so I think that uh, what we're going to do is to uh, call the uh, presenters to take their place on stage. Uh, I'd just like to offer a certain amount of uh, feedback on the uh, presentations so far. Um, I think that all of you will agree that the presenters have uh, provided us with an excellent panel discussing different aspects of the multicultural uh, uh, environment of India, the various transnations and their ongoing task of construction identity, uh, negotiating relations between the majority and minority communions in the already enormously varied space that is India. Like many of the conference papers that we've heard so far, they highlight the awareness that scholarship in many areas under examination is still at a very basic stage, and there's a need for fundamental research to be conducted to advance our knowledge and understanding of this important sphere and the rich interchange between the different stakeholders. And this will entail, in some cases, important reconfigurations in both theory and methodology. Uh, for example, uh, Tallinn's uh, paper, uh, which raises the general approach of canonical art history. Uh, this, she informs us, uh, results in New Jolfa being regarded as a discrete phenomenon and India fundamentally as lying beyond the sphere of investigation. Clearly, uh, this indicates the need for a reconceptualization of the discipline in order to meet those needs. It seems to me that this raises two particular uh, issues. One is the treatment of diaspora in general. Um, and uh, here, fundamentally, we see that the methodology is faulty. Uh, frequently, in uh, studies of diaspora, we find that uh, it is siphoned off into a distinct unit. Uh, as if geography determined the approach of coverage, um, uh, while the, uh, the major focus, the primacy of attention, is devoted continually to the homeland. Clearly, there is a need for much more integrated treatment, uh, because fundamentally, this process of interchange is at the very heart of the diasporic uh, experience. Uh, the second issue that it raises, it seems to me, relates to the disciplinarity in a field like art history. It began by focusing on Greece, Rome and the Renaissance, and now finds itself dealing with a global expanse that uh, it is ill-equipped to cope with from that perspective, especially with regard to the mentality uh, that uh, Tallinn cited um, of um, projecting or origins as beginning in the West and uh, gradually creating peripheral copies as this style proliferates in different parts of the world. Um, this sounds, of course, very much like the uh, hegemonic Orientalism of uh, Sir William Jones that uh, Veronica presented for us. Uh, indeed, in that connection, one wonders how the uh, Orientalist related to the major contribution of Sanskrit uh, to his reconstruction of the Indo-European proto-language uh, that uh, he was helping to construct at that stage. Um, so raising the question of indeed the existence of such a civilizational chasm between Europeans and quote unquote Asiatics. Um, artistic and cultural hybridity and interchange in diaspora settings. This is one of the major foci of this panel. Um, at the same time, I would like to argue that, uh, particularly with regard to the situation in Armenia, uh, that one should consider that uh, this is not ultimately so very foreign to the characteristics which we find it being adopted in Armenia per se. Uh, fundamentally, I would argue that this has been, over many, many centuries, a polity which is very open to cultural experiment in uh, diverse aspects uh, of its um, reality. Uh, and uh, for example, then, if we uh, focus purely on the realm of architecture, um, the um, early association with uh, forms from Syriac and Greek, and more significantly in terms of uh, today's discussion, uh, also with regard to the Islamic. 
uh, I'm thinking particularly of the incorporation of mukarnas into some of the churches, for example, in Ani from the uh, 11th, 12th century. This is very much at the heart of the homeland, uh, the uh, major capital of uh, Bagratid, Armenia, and yet we see uh, these, uh, uh, the, 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 these uh, phenomena of uh, outreaching, embracing, incorporating uh, uh, elements originally then foreign and external uh, as a means of enriching and enhancing their own evolving tradition. So I think that this is a particularly important phenomenon one should bear in mind. Um, and uh, I think as um, facilitatory uh, phenomena connected with that, uh, we might consider first and foremost then uh, the fact that overall, apart from uh, one or two exceptions, um, Armenia did not really represent a very strong centralized monarchy. It was in many um, uh, periods of its history, extremely devolved. Um, and I think that uh, this also is uh, very significant with regard to its ecclesiastical polity. Um, one of the key issues here, it seems to me, that uh, we need to bear in mind is that uh, the Armenian church fundamentally is uh, sui generis. It is very, very distinct. Uh, there really is, uh, for most of its uh, existence, no particular ecclesiastical structure with which it is directly uh, uh, associated. Uh, so, and, and uh, in this process, uh, it is distinguished very, very significantly, for example, from the churches of the uh, Eastern Orthodox Communion, uh, also including its northern neighbor, Georgia. Um, obviously, uh, this, this applies all the more so to uh, these uh, larger conglomerates like uh, the uh, Catholic experiments or uh, Protestantism. So I think it's worthwhile bearing in mind that many of these features we see are represented to a greater or lesser degree already in the, uh, in the homeland in this particular case. Uh, the panel also introduces us to the vital dialogue, and it seems that uh, this is very, very uh, uh, contemporary uh, in its uh, significance, uh, between different data that are presented to us from documents and uh, the important representation of material culture. And fundamentally, what we see uh, in this um, panel is the discussion, the dialogue between these two very, very different sources relating to uh, Armenian history. Architecture and epigraphy on the one hand, uh, in debate with the written tradition on the other. Um, the latter, uh, so uh, i.e. then uh, material culture, very much of uh, fixed provenance, not subject to the same degree of vagaries of uh, transmission. And then in contrast, this excellent uh, example then that uh, Veronica presented of the autobiography of uh, Joseph Amin. It is, of course, a relatively modern document, and yet from the original of 1792 until the uh, reprint, the second edition, uh, uh, as we might call it, of uh, 1918, uh, we note the major changes that uh, occurred, the, the, the significant differences in contents, focus, uh, etc. At the same time, so these uh, papers uh, focusing on material culture pose a whole series of uh, other issues for our consideration, um, particularly uh, delineating insofar as this is possible at some historical distance, what exactly the role was of the patron and the executor uh, involving uh, these preliminary phases of an architect, designer, mason, engraver, etc. And what were the relations and presumably of many, many different kinds between these different uh, stakeholders in the process. Um, yeah, so uh, Tallinn uh, it parallels, of course, the situation of uh, Armenian and uh, Parsi patrons and intriguingly suggests uh, Armenian's economic role uh, in uh, a certain respect as being adopted by the Parsis in Bombay as agents, as she says, of global change for their communities. Uh, one of the points which I think is uh, extremely important that we bear in mind uh, with regard to a number of these presentations um, is uh, one of the core characteristics of what it means to be in diaspora. And I would argue that uh, fundamentally, uh, one of the core aspects here is continual transformation. 
uh, this is worthwhile uh, highlighting. The norm in a diaspora setting is to expect change, not continuity. Um, so uh, there are all sorts of problems that uh, face uh, diaspora communities. Uh, it could be an economic crash, plague, war, persecution of one kind or another, altering the contours of the trade routes on which your node is found. Um, and as a result, it's very important to apply a dynamic model uh, in order to interpret the development of those uh, communities. Uh, and I think this is well illustrated by Tawin's point on the change which is uh, represented in the commodities in which the trade was uh, exercised, beginning in textiles and then moving to raw silk, etc. So this, I think, is uh, significant. Here again, in terms of the, um, the history of a number of those uh, architectural monuments, uh, the case then of the church in Saidabad. It closes in 1860. Presumably, this relates to the community moving on. Uh, and so uh, this is another very, very important aspect uh, of uh, uh, material culture. Um, here again, the church in Madras is demolished in 1746. Presumably, this is because of the uh, Anglo-French uh, uh, disputes that caught Armenians in the middle. Um, and then, of course, the, the question of the end of this period of church building, again, enormously important, uh, positioned in the early 19th century. So I think very significant in terms then of this uh, division of aspects of that community over the later period. What are the factors explaining these sorts of changes in some of those communities? Another point with regard to the position of the churches that was uh, highlighted today with uh, a number of uh, maps, uh, the exclusivity of the parts of town for domicile. We talked yesterday about uh, white and black quarters of these uh, uh, various uh, uh, urban uh, uh, settlements. Um, and uh, so even this applies, of course, to the hereafter. So not only did each of these communities have their own quarter of town, but this applies also uh, to the dead. The dead also then occupied their discrete uh, spaces. And uh, the rivalry, for example, then between the English and the Dutch merchant communities continues in Cebu's uh, evocative meditation on memorials to the dead in Agra and Surat. We see, of course, the dialogue of the patron and the masons on the style of the commemorations. Uh, one wonders, of course, uh, within the sort of setting that was presented today, who was responsible for setting up those gravestones? Who taught the local artisans to carve the Armenian script? Um, also, I think very significant, the use of uh, Persian, clearly, of course, implying that uh, in the Mughal Empire, this is the dominant language of that place and time, and we see Armenians aligning with that and identifying with it. Uh, another point that I thought was very important with regard to Sebu's uh, presentation um, is the uh, term that uh, he used, sub-ethnically diverse world of the living. Uh, in terms of the demography of those Armenian communities, and once again, I would imagine that this too is something which is always changing. Um, significantly, we find the majority are from New Julfa, but again, uh, also interesting, uh, we have others from Tiflis, so in another part of the broader Persian Empire, from Bitlis and the Arbakir in the Ottoman Empire. And clearly, I think that uh, the time has come uh, that we need much more, again, integrally to include those into the picture. Uh, it, it's not a new Jofen monopoly in terms of uh, these communities and their activities. What was the particular role, the niche, if you like, that was carved out by those other communities? Um, here again, so we have this uh, image of uh, these uh, settlements uh, involving about 100 souls or less in Agra and Surat. Um, and uh, our immediate impression is that most of them are adult men. Uh, presumably then, uh, they don't on the whole have families with them, although there are one or two exceptions. So we can uh, assume perhaps that their family home was elsewhere. Uh, as merchants, they were continually on the move. Uh, their paws here opened up uh, into their eternal resting place. 
um, there seems uh, no indication so far of generational succession. There's no succession of father, son in one community. So everyone is passing through en route to somewhere else. And so again, the impression is of this very unstable population. Um, I referred uh, earlier on to the end. So uh, obviously, of course, the bookends here are very significant. The beginning and ends of these various communities. And of course, uh, the process by which they arrived and of course also by which they left. Um, they moved to uh, other locations, which of course is typical of uh, diasporic situations in many different parts of the world. Uh, I was uh, recently in uh, some of the uh, communities in Transylvania and Bukovina, and many of the points that were raised here uh, find their parallels in that part of the world as well, including also with regard to uh, some of the features of uh, ecclesiastical architecture, beginning in wood and then on into stone, etc. These are very, very similar. Uh, I was very struck by the use of uh, Georgian. Um, one of the points immediately that uh, I had in mind was um, obviously relating to the dafters of Sayat Nova. As probably some of you know, uh, one of those has Armenian compositions in the Georgian script. And I wondered to what degree perhaps that also applied here. However, in the one that you showed, uh, it clearly is in Georgian. Uh, but the other point is that, um, uh, which, I, which I think is interesting, is that the script is Mehedruri. Um, um, it's Mehedruri. It's the secular script, the familiar script. Uh, so it, it, you, you notice even uh, on how it appears on the stone, it's very different from the carved, measured structure of the classical Armenian. And then we get to the squiggles uh, below, uh, which again, of course, would be very different from a regular Georgian tombstone, where we would see a totally different script of uh, Nuskuri. Um, and yeah, I was thinking again, probably uh, the uh, the origin of this person from near Tiflis, uh, you, uh, you mentioned Gora, presumably this is Gori. Um, so uh, it's referred to as Gore, and the E, of course, is the uh, nominative uh, singular termination in Georgian, like Tbilisi as opposed to Tiflis. So it may well be from uh, Gori. And um, in the 18th century, Gori, like Telavi, Tel Sirnari, and so on, these were typical centers of uh, Armenian merchant activity. More recently, of course, we know it is Stalin's birthplace. <laughs> Very different connotation. Anyway, um, so um, yes, uh, one of the things that I thought would be uh, interesting here is uh, in terms of uh, uh, trans-imperial strategies in art. Um, so we highlighted the significance of these churches in Ujulfa and then others in uh, India. Uh, but then again, of course, I think there are significant contrasts between uh, the situation in Julfa and those uh, Indian examples too. So externally, of course, these churches in Julfa are very much like mosques, uh, acclimatizing much more to Islamic culture, built in uh, brick. Um, uh, whereas uh, here we see that uh, they have a rather different uh, form. One of the other points that I think would uh, highlight uh, your uh, uh, your emphasis a little more is the question of uh, the, the comparison between uh, those urban churches in Ujulfa and then some of the village churches, as uh, for example, then in Peria, Charmahal, and so on. Presumably, we'll note a significant uh, difference there. Um, the other question that was very, very striking uh, was this issue of the elongated basilica. And I was very curious. So we looked at the interior of the church in Dhaka yesterday. Uh, what is the seating capacity? This, of course, would be very uh, interesting. Uh, we get the impression that uh, the size is not commensurate with the regular congregation um, for these uh, communities. So it, it's not necessitated by function, but uh, much more, as you were saying, uh, the, the question then of visibility of culture and also, of course, uh, politically. And I was wondering to what degree uh, you might uh, uh, share or disagree with the, the sense of uh, parallels also, of course, with, uh, we're now, of course, moving into the later 18th, 19th century, into the Raj, to what degree uh, this also was for the visibility of the, uh, the, the English, the, the, the British too, and uh, parallels perhaps with Anglican cathedrals, etc. Et uh, so in, in addition to the, uh, the local or the, the origin. 
Bell Towers, again, I thought was uh, extremely uh, interesting. They really begin in the 13th century. And usually, of course, uh, in, the, um, in the homeland, they are separate. Here, of course, we see that they are, uh, they're connected in most cases. And of course, this raises the issue also of the bell. Um, so you were, you were talking about uh, the uh, visual uh, impact of, of the churches, but also, of course, we can talk about the sonic impact also, presumably. And um, in the origin, presumably, this says something about the significance of the uh, religious uh, uh, liberality uh, in the uh, Mughal Empire, uh, tolerating that, because in so many other places, this, of course, uh, was uh, prohibited. So you have the, uh, the Simandron. Um, you also mentioned this uh, uh, transition um, from ecclesiastical uh, um, uh, origin or uh, patronage uh, to that of the, um, the merchants. But, and here again, uh, this is of course a feature, but I think that what's important is that uh, this too, of course, uh, is a development of much longer traditions uh, in, in Armenia. Fundamentally, we have um, uh, merchant uh, patronage going back, I think, to like the 10th, 11th century. And then, of course, clearly in Ani, the 13th, Tigrand Hornets and uh, things like that. So, and of course, uh, many of the um, ecclesiastics in the later period also were very proud of their aristocratic lineage. So to some degree, like Akhtamar, etc., there's a con continu continuity there uh, also. Now, moving on to um, Victoria's... Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, of course, of course, naturally, naturally. Um, one of the uh, one of the points that I wanted to raise with regard to uh, uh, Victoria's point uh, that uh, Veronica. Veronica, I'm sorry, uh, clearly is of course uh, that uh, this core uh, issue that you uh, relate to is uh, much much more um, widespread. I would argue in in Armenian culture, the, the whole issue then of the vision of uh, Saint Nurses. So be beginning obviously with this. Um, a representation in our historian Pafstos of the uh, fifth century, fundamentally indicating that uh, these major churchmen of the fourth were really like Old Testament prophets, uh, and the kings, the Armenian kings, like the kings of uh, Israel. Um, and then uh, the significant development we see in the 12th century with regard to the uh, uh, renewal of apocalyptic in different texts, including, of course, that of uh, Neshishn Ali. Uh, the lament on uh, Edessa, and uh, this continues right through the uh, Middle Ages. You can see it almost in every generation. Uh, this issue uh, raised of there now there is no divinely appointed champion like Moses or uh, Joshua, um, and uh, I, I think that uh, you you see it even in this period with regard to the perspective of Simeon Yerevanzi. Um, who is uh, arguing for quiescence on the part of the uh, both the Armenian nobles and the uh, community as a whole. Uh, he doesn't want them to oppose uh, a, a Muslim rule, the danger, obviously, of uh, severe, severe uh, reprisals. Um, and I, I think that, uh, so that the case that you uh, mentioned uh, here with regard to uh, Hofsepe Min, this is like the 1750s, uh, you have it reprised over a century later uh, with regard to uh, Rafi. Uh, so Rafi's uh, novel, The Fool, uh, incorporates a similar sort of uh, interchange uh, with very, very similar consequences. So fundamentally, we see that this uh, uh, quietism uh, that is uh, advanced by the Armenian church uh, is one that uh, continues right up basically until the time of the, uh, of the genocide. Um, oh, uh, yeah, so one one other point. Yes, I only have uh, one one further point to make, if I may. Um, so uh, in addition uh, to this much broader impact of this that I was uh, suggesting earlier on, uh, we even have its instantiation in Madras. So uh, in the uh, Madras group of which then Hofsepemi was one, uh, they, one of the texts that they republished was exactly this one relating to the um, the vision of uh, St. Nurses. This is the one, the Menatsork Asgats Hayotsya Vrat, this one from, I guess, the early uh, 1780s or so. That's exactly, yeah, right, that's exactly that text. 
Uh, okay, so uh, I'm done. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you would like to uh, respond to any of the points that I made with regard to the papers initially, and then we'll throw it open to the uh, to the public. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Peter. That was really wonderful. Um, I really appreciated your diving deep into some of these papers and obviously excellent presentations. I'm honored to be in this group. Um, let's have very quick uh, responses if we have any, and then we're going to be going over by uh, 15, 20 minutes because we're kind of running late, uh, which seems to be, uh, be in line with the uh, some of the themes of the conference involving um, Asiatic or Oriental versus Occidental. So, at the risk of reinforcing some of those essentialisms, um, would you like to respond to the view? Do you remember the questions? Or the... Okay. <laughs> this is on. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Professor Kawi, for your careful reading of the pre-circulated papers. Uh, and in the version that I pre-circulated, right. I went into right. some more depth mm -hmm. than I decided to cut some parts for this for the sake of time. Um, I think the themes that you have picked mm. up and elevated are precisely crucial to um, the argument that I made. Um, and I think there will be more questions, mm -hmm. perhaps. Yeah. Um, I don't have any immediate response. Okay. Yeah, go. thank you. Uh, likewise, uh, thank you. Um, um, I, I agree with all your methodological points. Art history has particularly uh, failed to uh yes. problematize the or the origin and the copy issue and i think these buildings are really um uh, the problem of the copy uh, one thing that i wanted to just respond to was that um there is a general uh consensus among our architectural historians that uh, Armenians of New Julfa, they were building in these onion domes, um, Safavid domes, because they wanted to hide or be, not be unique to, uh, not stand out. Right. Uh, I, I have to do more research, but I don't agree with that. Uh, oh, interesting. Because every other way they stood out. Mm. Um, I think that they, uh, I mean, we know that uh, Shah Abbas gave them architects when they arrived, and the rapid construction of these um, churches meant that Armenians did not know how to work the brick. Right. And, um, and uh, it really becomes tricky when you're trying to build a conic dome mm. on brick, with right. brick. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that's why they built uh, in the way that they built, which was Safavid architects and craftsmen who are who know how to and, yes. and right yeah makes perfect sense right and by the time they but there is a lapse so there's stone brick and by the time they get to India it's back to brick right. I mean back to stone. stone yes and that's why they managed to do some quasi conical domes on these Indian buildings. And I'll respond very quickly uh, to one comment you made. I really appreciated your uh, observations regarding the Georgian script, which I do not read, of course. Uh, that uh, so your uh, comment you you made a comment about the um, who the people were who are actually inscribing or, yes. or yes. chiseling these right. these uh, letters, beautiful letters, and very difficult to copy letters. Uh, we don't know for sure, although in the 19th century there are quite a few Armenian names mentioned as on the gravestones as the the person who actually inscribed the letters uh, has his name signed like on a painting almost and on a few tombstones I've come across in the 19th century and my friend uh, Liz Chater has been very generous in uh, pointing me in that direction. Uh, the, as far as Agra and the later per the earlier period is concerned or Surat, one thing that is really interesting is among all the stones that I read, one stone immediately uh, jumped to my attention, and uh, and that was because I was able to read it from the top. It's obviously not like reading the New York Times because three, four letters are condensed into one letter. Sometimes, sometimes right. four letters. Mm. Well, I can do three without a, without a, uh, breaking a sweat, but four letters sometimes <laughs> in one is a little. Right. Mm. But in one case, 
I was reading the doc, the tombstone. It's like a, a colophon almost. Uh, and the first half was very understandable, as even though the letters were right. on top of each other. And then the second half, I thought I was looking at a, a bunch of hieroglyphics. <laughs> and then I realized what happened. And that is because I, I noticed that uh, they were, the letters were in obverse, the reverse side. And so actually I had Talim here be kind enough to use Adobe some kind of program and she flipped it over because I suspect that right. if you flipped it over, you wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to read it. Mm. And so after she, after the, the image was flipped over perfectly, it, it made perfect sense. And so the, conclu the conclusion I reached from this right. was that more than like the local masons and all the stone cutters are local, there are lots of workshops in the near the cemeteries, uh, were probably given the uh, these were commissioned to inscribe these almost as if someone would commission a cloth paintings and so on with the drawing and then the person would reproduce it except in this case the drawing was on some kind of transparency and so i assumed that as the guy was chiseling maybe there was a breeze that came in and the transparency fell he picked it up and put it and carved it in reverse <laughs> and i can prove this by the by flipping yeah. it over mm -hmm. that's all i'm going to say the, the, the one uh, follow-up on that i had was uh, so with regard to uh, those particular uh, engravers who actually have their name inscribed and so on, uh, were they peripatetic? They, they went around different places doing that or? Uh... Hard to tell because uh, the evidence is very, very spotty. Right. The only thing I can say in addition to this is that the uh, bell tower of the Calcutta church, the Holy Nazareth right. Calcutta church, mm. which was built, the bell tower was a later addition. Mm. The architect for that was a man named, uh, his name, I knew I was going to have this problem with my memory, but Revont, I think, who came from Jufa, who was commissioned to, to do it. So there were probably mobile uh, stone cutters or architects or masons sometimes who, mm. who made a trip from Jufa to, to Iran uh -huh. or to right. India, or mm. it's hard to tell really. It's, right. There's a lot more research that needs yeah. to be done yeah. there. Excellent. Any questions? The audience. Uh, yes. Uh, just one moment until we get the uh, microphone. Hi. Thank you for these interesting presentations. Um, uh, my first question will be to Seppu about those beautiful gravestones. Um, my understanding is that Armenians, especially in Julfa, like old Julfa, they had those cross stones, right? As decorative grave markers. So I was wondering if among those um, gravestones that you had, were, were they all flat or there were any of those Hachkar style uh, gravestone markers? Thank you for that question. I'm able to answer it, but I'll be brief uh, because I recently wrote a lengthy paper on tombstone uh, inscriptions and on um, the transformation in tombstone technology in the middle in the early modern period, late medieval period, where Khachkars entirely give way to the flat surface tombstone. Uh, uh, so uh, in that, I, I believe that's because of the writing. The writing was really important because people were concerned about their souls, and that's why there are angelic forms in the images that Talin showed. There's always the angel Gabriel and, uh, and the other angel, Michael, I think, the archangel Gabriel and Michael, and they have trumpets. That's because at the end of time, when God, when the second coming occurs and the judgment is set, people are supposed to uh, be swept up into, the, into heaven from a waiting place somewhere between heaven and earth. And the idea is that they're all, their bodies are in full form. That's why they need to be preserved. And they're just sleeping there for, the, for that duration. So Khachkar technology doesn't really enable that kind of memory, uh, um, that kind of, um, I guess, economy of memory when it comes to mem um, remembering people for the time of the second coming, uh, whereas flat stone tombstones do, and most of, almost all the tombstones in, in India are flat stone. I'd like to read a question we received online. This is a question from Kurosh Meshkat at the British Library. It's directed toward any participant who'd like to respond, but particularly perhaps to Dr. Zablotsky. How significant was the background of Anglo-French revolutionary wars 
and the role of prominent Armenians such as Murat Chadonson on the French revolutionary side to the publication of Joseph Emin's memoirs and to his specifically English, English here is in scare quotes, and his specifically English notion of freedom. Should I read it again or is that okay? All right. Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, I think um, it was in the background, um, assuming that uh, Yosef Emin had been in um, conversation with the merchants that formed the Madras Circle and was most likely present throughout the um, the writing and uh, conception of the um, proto-constitutional draft that uh, was mentioned, the Borogait Parats, the snare of glory, um, in which certain events are explicitly mentioned and um, specifically there is a reference to uprisings and turmoil in, um, in America. There is awareness of political events in Europe but um, not necessarily a clear sense that revolutionary change had occurred in France. And I think, I think in, in dating that document and in um, considering how news about certain events traveled at the time, um, I think in Amin's case, we have to think of this document and his liberation thought as shaped by a kind of in-between moment. So his reading more of someone like Edmund Burke, whose scribe he was, and there's ways to um, really um, make the case that this is accurate, the a claim that he made of having been uh, Burke's scribe because of the way that he re refers to Burke's works, and he's aware that they're um, satirical, whereas contemporaries were not necessarily always as aware of that fact. Um, so it's more that um, British Republican thought shaped his thinking about what Armenians ought to do to become free than uh, French revolutionary thought. And I know that others may disagree because there's different readings of that document, but that would be my response. Anyone else? We have time for one more question, maybe two, I can ask because we're running late. Okay, thank you for fascinating uh, papers. I was amazed. It was very interesting. Thank you, Tallinn. Um, my question is for Professor Aslanian. Um, of course, you mentioned that they were um, the tombs were flat, and the same story we are seeing in New Julfa. But at the same time, in New Julfa, we have uh, depictions of, let's say, um, um, carpet makers or people who are showing. Like we have depictions of those who are have uh, are lying down let's say do have you have you noticed anything like that in uh, in india like depictions of uh, makers I, I don't know any artists or whatever i thank you. don't recall noticing any but that's a great question thank you but the one thing i can say is uh several tombstones in the agra cemetery uh belong to people who were involved in a cannon making and were uh, generals or uh, involved in fighting in the 19th century for various regional rulers. So um, beyond that, the, the, the occupational background is conveyed through writing as opposed to imagery from what I can see. One more question maybe, but uh, preferably to someone who, is, uh, who hasn't asked the question. Thank you very much to the presenters for the wonderful presentations. My question is for Veronica. Um, so when we look at uh, Joseph Emin's travelogue like through Greater Armenia uh, as a reflection of his uh, political agenda, it's one thing that we can see the reflection of uh, this um, um, of his intent to describe Armenians in a certain way, uh, which poses a, well, at least to me uh, a certain issue. Can we? describe or can we regard his account of the Armenian communities there as um, an ethnographic account or it's very biased and uh, because he had certain agenda can we use any information uh, from his descriptions of the Armenian communities throughout uh, that area as reflecting anything that was truly on the ground or he was describing them in order to underline certain things that were pre-existing 
uh, to his visit of those areas. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I will be very brief. Um, for the most part, I think the answer is clearly no. The documentary value of that document would be very limited. We have to understand it as um, a literary engagement with, with very disparate kind of traditions and sources that is deeply syncretic and responding to a particular historical moment to advance uh, a specific agenda or um, an answer to a perceived problem. And I think in order to really distill uh, the accuracy of certain accounts that would require, I think, careful also archival work to corroborate certain kind of scenes and, and episodes in, in that account. Um, there are some aspects that have been corroborated, others that are perhaps a little bit um, more murky, um, but nonetheless, it has uh, a very um, deep historical value in just um, marking a specific very hybrid moment of transition between certain kind of political discourses um, that were grounded in, in providence and um, the messianic or apocalyptic, um, the tradition of apocalyptic thought and a more modern uh, orientation and um, thinking around liberation through different kinds of lenses in that colonial situation that became available. Um, that's what I will say. Thank you. We can continue later too. I think I, I'm going to exercise my executive power as the organizer of the conference to call this excellent, I think I'm not for me, but the other two presenters, uh, panel. And uh, we have, for those who have questions, we can talk about that during the one hour and 10 minute intermission that, that is supposed to take place at 3.30. And I think we might be able to make it if we end now. So thank you so much, Peter, and thank you all. We will be moving on to the next panel, the last panel of the conference. Uh, and I'd like you, please, uh, if you can take back your seats and be a little less noisy, that would be very much appreciated. 
We're about to begin our, our second and last panel of the day. So our next panel is a panel titled the, Historic, the Historical Imagination and the Circulation of Revolutionary Ideas in Late 18th Century South Asia. We have a very interesting and original set of reflections on topics that haven't really been touched upon that much in historiography. So I, I'm going to introduce the speakers very briefly. I, I can't read their, uh, their full biographical blurbs due to the interests of saving time. But our first speaker is a former graduate of UCLA, a really, really formidable young thinker and excellent scholar uh, who will be talking to us uh, whose name is Michael O'Sullivan. I had the honor of having him in a few seminars in the past. And mm -hmm. um, he will be talking about portfolio capitalism and history writing and Hagop Simeonian's, uh, Simeonian Ayubians' Life of Haider Ali Khan from 1782 to 1795. And he will be, I think his message has been recorded. Unfortunately, Michael could not join us due to logistical and other issues. He's in Florence where he is doing a postdoctoral work, uh, having uh, done earlier postdoctoral work at Harvard as well. So he will be followed by another UCLA, semi-UCLA graduate student. Again, someone I had the honor of having in my early modern Armenian history seminar, graduate seminar, that's Ayal Amr. Ayal Amr is at the UCI Irvine, our competition down the street. And he's a brilliant young scholar. He's uh, fluent in Sanskrit. He works in South Asia. And he wrote a, a really, really interesting, innovative dissertation on South Asia, so Southern India, and the Nawab of Arkot and revolutionary ideas that circulated in that region, where he also has passing remarks on the Armenians. So Eyal will be followed by Satenik Badwagan Tufanyan, who's traveled here from Paris. Satenig, all you need to know, the most important thing you need to know about Satenig is Satenig is a philosophical person. She's trained in philosophy and she re recently um, defended a very important dissertation which was published as a book. It's a translation of Shahamir Shamirian's proto-constitutional treatise called Vorogait Parats uh, into French with detailed and very impressive uh, gloss, uh, footnotes, and information, and sharp thoughts. So uh, I will call to the floor, I guess, via Zoom, Michael, My Michael O'Sullivan to deliver his talk, and then we'll have the other talks as well. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry that you have to hear me drone on in a pre-recorded talk today, but my home internet here in Tuscany is notoriously unreliable, so better a pre-recorded talk than no talk at all. At any rate, you'll see me in the q and I'm disappointed I can't be there in person, especially because UCLA was where I did my PhD and so many of the faculty present at the conference were my mentors. Among those, of course, is Professor Sebu Aslanian, who I'd like to thank for inspiring this talk and for supplying some of the sources that went into it. My gratitude also extends to Martin Adamian and Daniel Ohanian for their administrative assistance. As you'll see from the title of the talk, it concerns a curious biography of Haider Ali, the ruler of Mysore in the late 18th century, written by Hagop Simonian Ayubians, an Armenian who seems to have spent time between Madras, which was his main residence, and the kingdom of Mysore, in the same period, and I'll be referring to him as Hi everyone. I'm sorry that you have to hear me drone on in a pre-recorded talk today, but my home internet here in Tuscany is notoriously unreliable, so better a pre-recorded talk than no talk at all. At any rate, you'll see me in the Q&A. I'm disappointed I can't be there in person, especially because UCLA was where I did my PhD and so many of the faculty present at the conference were my mentors. 
Among those, of course, is Professor Sebu Aslanian, who I'd like to thank for inspiring this talk and for supplying some of the sources that went into it. My gratitude also extends to Martin Adamian and Daniel Ohanian for their administrative assistance. As you'll see from the title of the talk, it concerns a curious biography of Haider Ali, the ruler of Mysore in the late 18th century, written by Hagop Simonian Ayubians, an Armenian who seems to have spent time between Madras, which was his main residence, and the kingdom of Mysore in the same period. And I'll be referring to him as Simonian throughout today's talk because that's how he identified himself in his biography. Before delving into the text, though, we need to look at the circumstances of its production. It appeared first in the newspaper Azdarar, where it was serialized in several issues in 1794 and 1795. Azdarar was the newspaper, as many other papers at this conference will no doubt show, uh, the newspaper of the Armenian community of Madras in this period. Here's a ferman that appeared in the pages of the newspaper at one point. Uh, it's a ferman promulgated by the Nawab of the Carnatic, Muhammad Ali Khan Walaja, giving permission to the newspaper's editor, Aratun Shumarun, to publish books in Arabic and Persian. At the top of the ferman, you'll see the Nawab's title, but then in red, I've highlighted uh, Shumarun's name to draw attention to it. Now, in the case of Simonian's biography of Haider Ali, uh, Shumaron did not draw from his Arabic or Persian fonts, but from his Western Armenian ones. And it's actually a, a curious decision to publish this biography because the, the protagonist of Simonian's biography is a figure that was an inveterate enemy of the Nawab of the Carnatic, and, of course, an inveterate enemy of the... EIC in Madras. So this is something that we'll come back to at the towards the end of the talk. Now here's the figure, the our protagonist in, in today's talk. Um, you'll see there's a question mark surrounding Haider Ali's birth date. Some sources say 1717, some say 1720, others say 1722. Uh, Simonian gives it as 1717. Now, from the first, it's important to say that Simonian's biography is not a puff piece, but it's also not a hatchet job either. He doesn't portray Haider Ali as an enlightened prince, but he also doesn't show him as a ruler who's particularly cruel. Instead, I think it's useful to see the text as an anthropology of political power in southern India, in which really few of the actors in the story come out unscathed, including probably Simonian himself. And now in rich detail, Simonian charts the circumstances of Haider Ali's birth, his rise to power under Krishna Raja Wadiar II, his usurpation of that same ruler's throne, Haider Ali's long wars with the Marathas, local dynasties, and the English, and of course his interactions with the French in Pondicherry. Here's the geography of action. You'll see initially Mysore in the 1740s, 50s, early 60s is a small regional kingdom, but then towards the end of Haider Ali's life in 1780, it's grown quite substantially. Uh, just to note the location of Madras here on the uh, eastern coast of India, and because that will be, of course, an important uh, geographic focal point of the rest of our narrative here. Now, for better or worse, the version of Simonian's text that I'm drawing from is a 1968 Russian translation. Unfortunately, I cannot read Western Armenian, but it was printed in a useful work, a quite a good piece of work, actually, by the Soviet Armenian Orientalist R. A. Abramian, and that work is called Armenianske Stochniki Vosem Natsata Vavieka Ob Indi, Armenian Sources of the 18th Century Concerning India. So Simonian's text is only one of many that are translated and included in the volume. 
Now, of course, because this is a translation, there are all sorts of issues in terms of comparing Abramian's uh, translation with Simonian's original rendering. So, for example, when Abramian says that Haider Ali engaged in a Partizanskaya Vaina, a partisan war against the EIC in Madras, we, you know, should read this with a little bit of hesitation and cynicism. But nonetheless, it's, you know, still useful uh, to have this translation, and it's what I uh, base my analysis on. Now, I argue here that we need to situate Simonian in processes of portfolio capitalism in contemporary South Asia on the one hand, and within the broader textual ecology of royal power in Madras. Let's take the subject of portfolio capitalism first. Of course, the phrase owes its origin to this classic piece by Sanjay Subramanyam and Chris Bailey from the late 80s. And there are two big takeaways that are relevant to our story here. The first thing was that Subramaniam and Bailey identified a whole host of actors in late 18th century India who combined interests in revenue administration, long-distance trade, and kingmaking. The second was to argue that the divide between the mercantile and the political domains was permeable. So in other words, this was not a context, as many other historians had long argued, in which merchant actors were apathetic to political shifts and political actors had no interest in commercial activity. But in fact, the two were, in many senses, synergistic. Now, portfolio capitalists are, of course, legion in southern India in this period. Perhaps the best parallel with Simonian is Isaac Sorgun, a Sephardic Jew and resident of Calicut, though someone born in Ottoman Istanbul who was the subject of this classic 1967 article by Walter Joseph Fischel. Now, what, what distinguishes someone like Surgun from Simonian is that the former has left an extensive paper trail in the archives of the VOC. Whereas, according to my early forays at least, Simonian is not somebody who has appeared in any sources from the Dutch or the English East India companies. Now, it's, it's important to stress that Armenian, port, Armenian portfolio capitalism assumes a number of different forms in contemporary India. Simonian's form is a much more, shall we say, defanged form than that covered in the, the larger history of India written by another Armenian around the same period, Tomas Kojamalian in which he chronicles the activities of a number of Armenian portfolio capitalists in Bengal in the mid-18th century. And this subtitle, which is again uh, translated in uh, R.A. Abramian's 1968 work, this subtitle gives you a very good indication of how Kojamalian's text differs from Simonian, and it reads... How the English obtained supremacy in India, how the Armenians reached power and lost it. Now, the, the Bengali variety of Armenian portfolio capitalism is, as I just mentioned, far more militaristic, where you have Armenians actually entering into mili the military service of the Nawab of Bengal. And of course, the most famous figure that many of you will probably be familiar with is the figure depicted here, Gorgin Khan, who is, you know, right up at the forefront of the wars between the Nawab of Bengal and the EIC in the same period. But by the 1760s, 1770s, a lot of these Armenian portfolio capitalists in Bengal have been brought to heel by the EIC, whether through military defeat or through prejudicial legislation. Madras is a very different situation for the Armenians. Of course, Madras is a company town. So the company's authority is much more unambiguous. And you, the Armenians, there are, you know, a small community of really only around 200 people. And it's 
this community out of which Simonian originates. Now, we should say that, that Simonian only really stresses his Armenian identity, if we want to call it that, on, on two occasions in the text. The first is his initial audience with Haider Ali, in which he goes to Haider Ali and asks for trading privileges, not just for him personally, but for the Armenians generally. But you'll see here that in the, the second part of the quote, he refers in rather indirect terms, almost as a sort of innuendo, that he was not successful in his task of acquiring these privileges. Why this is seems to owe more to Simonian's doings than to those of Haider Ali. But we'll see that in despite this rebuff, Simonian becomes something of a diplomatic runner for Haider Ali. The only other instance in which Simonian really references or foregrounds an Armenian identity is in this quote where he's accompanying Haider Ali's army to the siege of Sirah, which is a town in that's a neighboring territory to that of Mysore. There's also a larger territory that shares the same name. And there, Simonian says, I wonder how the rulers of this city could be so blind. Within the short time that I lived there, I saw with my own eyes how inaccessible the city is, not only because it is well fortified, but also because it is conveniently located by mountains and impenetrable forests. I pray to the Lord God that my forgotten Armenian people have the same inaccessible, rich, built-up city and with an Armenian ruler. Now we should say that Simonian, in discussing his Armenian identity, doesn't really root it in a particular place within India. He doesn't describe himself, for example, as a Madrasi Armenian. And for this reason, it's useful to contrast his account with those written by other Armenian historians in the 18th century about Muslim courts, not only because they're revealing of different profiles of power, but also because they actually give us a very good indication about how Armenians are constructing their identity vis-a-vis -vis different royal potentates and in different geographical settings. Now, one text that I've looked at in detail is this text written by Tamburi Arutin, who is an Ottoman uh, Armenian musician who left Istanbul with an Ottoman embassy to Nadir Shah in Iran in the 1730s. Then he went into Nadir Shah's service, accompanied him during his campaigns in Afghanistan and in India, and then went back to Ottoman Istanbul and then wrote this history and an accompanying musical treatise. Now, throughout uh, Tamburi Arutin's text, Istanbul is always and everywhere the narrative center. And he goes to great lengths to translate Iranian and Indian geographies and concepts in a way that an Ottoman Armenian audience would understand. And he does this while also stressing his Ottoman Armenian identity, an Ottoman Armenian identity that is, for example, contrasted with uh, Iranian Armenians. So it's, it's a curious contrast, I think, with Simonian's text in which you have no clearly geographically anchored audience. You have someone, as I said earlier, doesn't really identify himself as a Madrasi Armenian. And also, importantly, doesn't really feel the need to translate concepts, geographies from South India to his audience. So perhaps that he's presuming that to a certain degree that there's a literacy among his audience about Haider Ali, about Mysore, about the English and the French and their interventions in southern India. Now, I also think it's important to situate Simonian in the more proximate textual ecology surrounding the rulers of Mysore in this period. Now, you'll see in the background to the slide two of these texts that are circulating in this period. One is the Karnamai Haidari, another is a history of Haider Shah that was published in English in 1784. And it's clear when we read these texts in conjunction with Simonian's that Simonian's text is in many ways drawing from a common 
informational font, you know, a, a larger public sphere in which stories about Haider Ali, about his adventures, about his activities are circulating. And, and Simonian is pulling from these tropes and constructing his narrative on the basis of them, just as he is constructing his narrative on the basis of personal interactions, if we can believe that they actually took place, personal interactions with Haider Ali. But in order to sort of appreciate the exact character of Simonian's text vis-a-vis -vis these other sources, we need to look briefly at the cult of kingship espoused by Mysore's rulers in this period and how historians have understood it to date. Now, there are these two you know, very useful works, I think, that give us two competing understandings about how Haider Ali and his successor, Tipu Sultan, constructed their royal power. There's, of course, on the left, this classic work by Kate Brittlebank, which, in a sense, as you can see from the title, looks at Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan as, quote-unquote, Muslim rulers living in a Hindu domain in which they have to sort of construct from scratch this identity of themselves as Muslim rulers inhabiting this space that is in many ways anathema to their identity as Muslims. So you can you can sense that this is in more or less a sort of Hindu-Muslim binary. And she's been criticized for this on precisely these terms. Now, on the other hand, there's a more recent work by someone named Caleb Simmons, where he looks at Tipu Sultan and his successor, Krishna Raja Wadiar III, and he argues that they both mobilized a larger past to construct a royal identity around their position as sovereign. And Simmons usefully says that the, the whole binary of Hindu versus Muslim does not in any sense actually hold up to empirical scrutiny. That in fact, there are a whole host of different tropes that are being instrumentalized by these rulers. There are texts in Persian and in Kannada that are being composed about Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan by Muslims, by Hindus, that actually give us a much more varied picture. Uh, now, it's again, it's, it's interesting because some of these texts, such as the Nishana Haideri, written by Hussein Ali Khan Kermani, give Haider Ali this very illustrious lineage, tracing him back, of course, to the Prophet Muhammad and giving him thereby a Sayyid lineage. Simonian does not do anything similar in his text. He's not constructing a, an illustrious gene genealogy, but of course, in, but in fact says Haider Ali is, you know, the son of a nondescript soldier. And, you know, it's, in other words, he's no royal propagandist by any sense by any stretch of the imagination. But nonetheless, Simonian is very good in giving us a larger genealogy of the titles that Haider Ali acquires over time. So there's been some debate about whether Haider Ali ever christened himself Sultan, but Simonian clearly shows that he only ever referred to himself as Nawab Bahadur, the perhaps the most eminent title he has is uh, Chakmak Jang, which is a, a title given to him by the Mughal emperor, according to Simonian. There's also this very interesting bit that relates to the whole issue of Haider's uh, sovereignty, where Simonian se uh, discusses the coins that Haider Ali has struck, in which you can see here, this is from a work by J.R. Henderson, uh, published in the 1920s, and I thank Sanjay Subramanyam for drawing my attention to this work, where you can see, on the one hand, on the left, the depiction of what Simonian calls two idols, that is, of course, Shiva and Parvati. And then on the flip side, you can see what Simonian describes as a crescent, that is the letter the Arabic letter H, which of course is the first letter of Haider Ali's name. So again, a, a very useful image to share because it again gives us a sense of how Simonian is 
visualizing Hyder Ali's sovereignty and again allows us to look at that sovereignty in a way that doesn't fall into the trap of a Hindu Muslim binary, but in fact something that is much more, for lack of a better term, syncretic. Now, the, just to in, in get to get towards the end of the talk, there are two larger sub themes of the text, especially after the initial biography of Haider Ali is given. And that is, of course, the the theme of a perfidious Albion, in other words, a tyrannical English power that is rising in South India, and a parallel story in which Tipu Sultan is proving himself as the heir apparent. <laughs> so just to kind of give you a sense of, of the, you know, very sort of detailed account that Simonian gives about Hyder Ali's wars with the EIC and, of course, with the Marathas and other local dynasties, I wanted to share this particular passage because it gives you a flavor of not only Simonian's writing, but also gives you a flavor of how he's constructing Hyder Ali as a ruler. So he says, ever resourceful, Hyder Ali ordered a group of dancers, who in India are called Ranjani and Kolaratni Kalwant, to be summoned, selected 700 of them infected with the venereal diseases, gave them gifts and ordered them to go to the camp of the English army as dancers and stay there to debauch. The English soldiers, unaware of anything, slept with them. Soon many Englishmen contracted a terrible disease, and since they were not treated, the disease developed rapidly, and soon the soldiers could neither sit nor walk. So th th here you have, again, this image of Haider Ali, which is in many ways similar to that of Nader Shah, the image of Nader Shah in Tamburi Arutin's text, where you have a ruler who is cruel but also resourceful. But there's also this interesting undertone in which these actions are in a sense justified because the victims had them coming. Now, there are brief references, again, like very short snippets in the text in which Simonian gives us an idea of how he is living between Madras and Mysore in this period. So he is very upfront about the fact that he's supplying Hyder Ali on occasion with commodities that Hyder Ali needs, but he's also acting as a, as a diplomatic go-between between the EIC council in Madras and the royal court in Mysore. I mean, uh, yeah, in the royal court in Mysore. But if Haider Ali had expected uh, Simonian to, in a sense, protect state secrets, then he would have been perhaps surprised to find out that Simonian was sharing the correspondence that he was receiving from Haider Ali, some of the secret correspondence, uh, with the local EIC council in Madras. And the, the justification he gives is, as he says in the text to one of his English interlocutors is, quote, I live under the protection of Great Britain and do not want to have any trouble in the future. Now there's this, this interesting contrast in other parts of, of the narrative where Simonian condemns this German doctor who is resident at Haider Ali's court, who is engaging treacherously with the English on similar terms, but Evidently, the irony was lost on Simonian that he was, in fact, doing the same thing. Now, again, as I as I briefly said earlier, one of the other sub themes of the text is this portrayal of Tipu as this heir apparent, as this great martial figure. Now, this is important because when Simonian's text appears in the pages of Asdarar. The EIC is, of course, at loggerheads with Tipu Sultan and locked in a very vicious struggle that doesn't end until four years after Simonian's text has been fully serialized in the pages of the of the newspaper. So Tipu's this sort of really interesting depiction of Tipu as this virtuous fighter and the perfidy of the English is compelling because it, it suggests that right under the nose of the EIC in Madras, 
you have this rather unflattering picture of them that is being portrayed in this Armenian publication, which suggests to us that actually the EIC's surveillance mechanisms that it would establish over quote-unquote native publications in a later period is not in any way uh, in place in the late 18th century. Now, by way of conclusion, I just want to say two brief things. One is that by situating Simonian in processes of portfolio capitalism, we're able to appreciate how Armenians in contemporary India were able to exercise an influence that was well out of proportion to their small numbers. Now, secondly, by situating his biography within a larger textual ecology of royal power in Mysore, we can appreciate that although Armenian authors had a particular interpretive community in mind when they were penning their texts, those texts were themselves products not just of a sort of internal Armenian dialogue, but actually products of information that was circulating throughout the larger public sphere about these rulers, and that were then translated into terms that an Armenian audience, in this case in Madras, could understand. And all of this is, again, a reminder that there is no distinct history of the Armenian presence in India that is separate from the larger processes in which Armenians were embedded. And I'll leave it at that. So thank you so much. If I can just press you and yeah, as I talk, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor uh, Sibov Slanian, for uh, the invitation to present here today at this conference and many thanks to the presenters uh, for the thought-provoking presentation. I feel I'm a trespasser here, given the, the focus of my, my paper. Um, but um, the ideas presented here in this paper were first uh, conceived in 2017 when I um, attended Professor Sibas uh, uh seminar uh, on the Indian Ocean here at UCLA. This was the first time that um, I came to learn about uh, the Armenian trade community of Madras and the various intellectual political works its members uh, produced there in late 18th century. 
In particular, I became intrigued by the remarkable publications of Shahami, Shahami Riyan, such as the Snare of Glory, produced during the 1780s, and in which he formulated his ambitious project of uh, relocating the diasporic community into a new homeland in the historical region of Armenia. Of course, as a member of a diaspora a community, the Armenians in Madras had their own reasons for undertaking such an impressive uh, project, which also included uh, first, uh, the first constitution for a future Armenia. But if the 1780s is remembered as a turning point in Armenian history, a moment when a small group of Armenian traders in Madras began to imagine a new homeland for the larger diaspora community of Armenians, it was exactly at that same moment that elite Muslims in Madras, who formed close ties with uh, Armenians, began to realize they were about to lose their own. Indeed, during the 1780s, Madras and the ruler of the Karnatak, the Wuljai family, uh, were placed at a crossroad in their history. Ever since the Nawab Muhammad Ali Walaja, who died in 1795, ascended the throne of Arkut in 1749. He depended heavily on the British East India Company, both fiscally and military, to consolidate his power over the Karnatak. On account of his growing financial debt to the company and, and the Nawab, basically, uh, the Armenians were creditors of the Nawab. He borrowed money from them to pay back to the company. So on account of his growing financial debt to the company, and following the outbreak of the Second anglo mysore War uh, between 1780 and 1784, during which the British East India Company suffered a serious financial setback, British officials in Madras forced the Nawab to transfer the lucrative uh, parts of the Karnatak to the company to finance their war efforts. So the war ended in early 1784 when the two parties, the British and Mysore, signed the Treaty of Mangalore in March 1784 and agreed to mutually restore all conquered territories. However, the East India Company officials in Madras decided to exclude the Nawab from the terms of this treaty and to return his territories for return his territories for themselves until late 1785. This move, which in fact marked the beginning of a piecemeal process of annexation of the Karnatak, even drew the attention of Warren Hastings, the governor general in Calcutta, who considered it as an avowed usurpation of the Nawab's right of sovereignty and subversive of the principle of justice and good faith. So um, the formation of the Armenian political imaginaries during a time of crisis uh, and transition in Madras prompted me to reflect how exactly elite Muslims responded to their own political crisis when their established Islamic legitimacy to rule over the region of the Karnatak was now in serious threat, being continually challenged and undermined by a foreign trade company that began to intervene in the affairs of the government and vie for supremacy in South India. Furthermore, I wanted to investigate whether these Muslims began to develop, just like the Armenians, their own sense of political homeland, uh, patria, patri, uh, or watan, a place of one allegiance, um, affection, loyalty, and identity. Now, the main difficulty that we historians of South India encounter when uh, considering how the Nawab Muhammad Walaja responded to his own political crisis, besides his di diplomatic um, negotiation and political uh, maneuvering, is that the relevant Persian sources written at his court during this time are completely silent about such matters. For the most part, available sources paint the Nawaz's political relationship with the British in a laudatory terms. Um, for example, one of the standard and unfinished Persian sources on the history of the Karnatak, the Tuzukhi Walajai, written sometimes between the 1781 and 1785 by the Nawab's own court chronicler, Burhan ibn Hassan, described the East India Company as uh, being bound to and at one with the people of Islam, Marbutu Muttahadi Ahli Islam. Speaking of Muhammad Walajah's military support to the British against the war with the French in the Karnatic during the 1950s and 1960s, Burhan even says, 
From that time, the English were always grateful and united with Muhammad Walajja, so much so that until today, that is the 1780s, this union between the white English and the black Indians is considered like the union of the white and the black of the ice. This union is maintained until today and is famous all around the world, just as the union of the soul with the body. And the two kings of England, George II and George III, sent letters of friendship addressing Muhammad Walajah as brother. However, such characterization of the warm and fraternal relationship that allegedly existed between the Nawab and the British and portrayed here by Burhan ibn Hassan as perfect union stands at odds, as I argue, with the way Muhammad Walajah himself characterized this relationship in some of his international correspondence written in Arabic in the 1780s, just around the same time of the composition of the Tuzuk Walajah. Now, the Arabic, the Arabic letters in question have never been examined by historians. Um, they appear in a manuscript volume entitled Shama'im uh, al-Shama'il bi nashir lataim al-Rasail, loosely translated as the scent of virtues in spreading the aroma of epistles. Um, the letters were written by uh, Baqir Aga, um, was a Sufi scholar from Villor who was given charge of the Nawab's international correspondence with various notable Muslims, including ulama and Ottoman officials in the Islamic heartlands of the Middle East. The content of these letters varies, but by and large, they are concerned with the family's charitable works in places like Mecca and Medina, detailing their generous donations and revealing much about the Nawab's extensive uh, network of appointed uh, agents who were responsible for distributing their benefactions to the Muslim needy there. After a, curse, a careful examination of some of the letters sent in the mid-1780s to Muslims in Mecca and Medina, we begin to notice that the Nawab repeatedly uses the Arabic word fitna to describe the existential crisis and profound suffering of Muslims in the Karnatic during the period of war between the British and the state of Mysore. For example, in a letter sent, um, written around 1784-1785 uh, to Ahmad Agha, one of the Imams of the Grand Masjid, Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, uh, the Nawab says that he was unable to dispatch his presence and benefactions to Arabia because the region of the Karnatic has been enduring fitna shadida, a vigorous ordeal or a severe crisis that for several years had wreaked a total havoc on the inhabited region of Argot. This fitna, he adds in a rather poetic way, had almost raised the mountains and shaking the, shaking the earth. Without delving into the extensive and complex connotation of this term, uh, fitna in Islamic tradition can have a variety of meaning within different contexts, including test, temptation, affliction, persecution, crisis, or distress of the Muslim believers. In classical sources, it was often used in reference to the first schism appearing within a uh, Muslim community between the Sunni and the Shia, uh, dubbed as the Great Fitna. In later literature and throughout Muslim history, fitna was used as a term of condemnation for rebellion, revolt, sedition, or any act that challenged the legitimacy of an existing Muslim government. By the turn of the 19th century, the word fitna came to uh, denote secular and political revolution. Uh, this is in particular in India. Um, in the work of um, Mirza Abu Talib Khan, who traveled to France and he wrote about the French Revolution, and so he called it Fitna France or Al Fitna Al Francia. Here I have translated Fitna as ordeal, crisis, since in this context the Nawab sought to communicate to Ahmad Agha the deep suffering and pain that Muslims were enduring in South India during a time of total war. However, fitna in the Nawab's letters is equally used in reference to the East India Company's resolve to take over the direct management of the Nawab's territories. So, for instance, in a letter sent to the same Ahmad Agha, 
around, in around 1786, 1787, just three years after the previous letter, and a few years after the end of the war, the Anglo-Mysore War, and just after the British agreed to return some of the Nawab's territory, territories, the Nawab tells him that God saved the Muslims from the fitna and gave us back our inherited territories, al-mulk al mawruth This connection that the Nawab's makes between fitna and the British unlawful appropriation of his territories, al-mulk, renders fitna in this context into an illegitimate and rebellious act that sought to undermine and deny his Islamic legitimacy to rule over his dominion. And yet, there is, there is more to this usage of fitna, which uh, is linked to direct British intervention in the Carnatic affair, and the way the Nawab actually sought to communicate within this international context its adverse consequences to his own regime. Let me read a part of a long letter that Muhammad Walajah sent to Sheikh Muhammad Salman, one of the leading religious men in Medina. Okay. It is not a secret that we have borrowed money from the infidels, the people of war, Ahl al-Harb, and corruption, Fasad. We, have, we, have, we, however, distributed some of this borrowed money among the Muslims' believers. Meanwhile, the previous government of Madras was replaced by another one who is rude and vulgar. He's referring here to George McCartney, who was the governor of Madras from 1781 to 1785. However, this hideous polytheist, Mushrik Maqbuh, still refuses to retain our territories in Mulk, and he is determined not to do so. We have written to the notables of England in this regard, hoping that God will dispel such difficulties. But know that their king is an extreme infidel and a stubborn polytheist, kafir and shadidan wa mushrikan anidan. His infidel and cruel subjects are the arch enemies of the religion of Islam. Islam. He was always uncompromising with us, and time after time he would incite facade and support our enemies. If we lose our sovereignty, I'm translating mulk here as sovereignty because it has also this meaning here. If we lose our sovereignty, this will not only bring us shame, khajal, among the notables and the common people, al khawas wal ayan, wal awam, but it would also break the hearts of all Muslims, ahl al Islam. Thus, we hope that you pray for us to prevent this facade and please ask all Muslims to perform daily daily prayers so we can oust this group of infidels and bring them under Islamic rule. Uh, rule. Surprisingly and contrary to the way Burhan ibn Hassan characterized the Nawab's political alliance with the British, here the Nawab expresses an open and candid antagonism toward those foreigners who are responsible for the state of fitna in the Karnatak. First, he defines them not as friends, but as enemies of Islam, Ahl al-Harb, people of war, and associate them with the notion of facade. Facade means corruption, moral depravity, or social order. There's another um, charge theme that he uses interchangeably in his letters with the word fitna to emphasize the threat posed by the British both to his regime and to Islam in general. The Nawab then launches into a diatribe against their king, describes his subjects as the arch enemies of Islam, and explicitly speaks of the urgent need to bring them under Islamic rule. By doing so, the Nawab was in effect locating the British within a new conceptual framework that defined them not only as his own enemy, but more broadly as the new enemy of Islam and the Muslim Ummah as a whole. So without a doubt, this letter reflects a shift in historical awareness um, emerging in a particular and crucial historical moment, which the Nawab began to conceive of as fitna. In striking contrast to Burhan ibn Hassan's flattering description of a close and amicable political relationship existed between Muslims and the British, the letter here paints an entirely different picture of this relationship, thereby it reveals the genesis of a new political vision which began to ramify within a pan-Islamic space 
Indeed, the letters focused on the emergent fitna in the Karnataka do suggest that during the 1780s, Muhammad Walajah began to utilize his well-established networks of interlocutors and clients in the Islamic heartland to arouse similar antagonistic sentiments in the hearts of Muslims toward the British in an attempt to construct a broader Islamic coalition against what he now conceived as the new enemy of Islam. But there is something even more striking about the collection of letters um, found in this manuscript volume compiled by Bakr Aga. In addition to the Nawab's letter, the volume also contains the letters of, that Bakr Aga himself wrote to various Muslim ulama in the Islamic heartland. An examination of some of his letters immediately reveals that time and again, Aga reminds the recipient of his letters to read and comment in two Arabic works he himself had composed and sent along with the Nawab's present and benefaction. These are two collections of um, his Arabic poetry, written at the court of Muhammad Walajah between 1783 and 1784 during the time of war. One is entitled An-Nafha al salwa ala khayr al barriya while the other Tilka Ashratun Kamilatun Hindiya. Um, many of the poems contained in this work were written in praise of the Prophet Muhammad and the Sufi saint, uh, Shaykh uh, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, the founder of the Qadiriya Sufi order. And they were modeled after the famous pre-Islamic Arabic poems or Mu'allaqat, the hanging oaths or poems. Much to our surprise, the works also include several poems dedicated to the region of the Karnatuk, the domain of Muhammad Walaja. In the introduction to An-Nafha al-Ambariya, Baqir Aga notes that he composed his, this poetry in response to the great fitna and mihna that brought much devastation and sorrow to the people of the Karnatic. He then adds that his poems were sent to Muslims in the Holy Lands so that they convey the suffering and anguish ghamma, of the people of Karnatic to all concerned Muslims. Aga even declares to his readers that this style of Arabic poetry was rather new, taraz jadid, and never before seen in India. In this poetry, Bakr Aga expresses deep attachment to and exhibits sincere patriotic sentiments toward his devastated homeland, defined geographically and now aesthetically as the Karnatak. He compares the region of the Karnatak to his own soul, Muhjat, and referred to it as Watan, homeland, calling it Rubbat al-Hasan, the bountiful land, his permanent home, Thawa, the only place where he longs to live and where he will, will happily die, saying, He, however, laments the state of the war striking Karnatic, which was turned into a theater of blood and massacre, قتل, forcing people to flee this watan and seek refuge elsewhere. Let me just read one poem in which uh, Bakr Aga vividly articulates his strong bond to, this, to his homeland, you know, personifying it as a female beloved and expressing his highest devotion to her. What happened? All right, thanks. So he says, she is my only wish and the ultimate aspiration of my life. She is my greatest hope and the only thing I ever crave for. When can I sweep her quarters with my eyelids? When can I drench her dust with my tears? How can I forget her when her dreamlike image lives forever in my eyes? How can I forget her when her beautiful form flows in my innermost being? What is forgetfulness when her life force animates the limbs of my body? Hearing her stories, I become drunk. What is it to behold her in reality? Clearly, Aga feels that he owes his own identity and happiness to this homeland, and thus he is prepared to sacrifice himself for the greater good of this place. Through his poetry, Aga explores this emotional bond between one's homeland and one's self or identity implying that one's homeland should be served and protected and never be given up. 
Indeed, it is this idea of his deep attachment to his Carnatic homeland that keeps cropping up and dominates almost each one of his poems. Aga conceived Watan as a site wherein his deep affection, his love, identity, and even loyalty are invested. In order to articulate such deep connection with and strong loyalty to his Carnatic Watan, it was important for him to make conscious choice of the genre, that is poetry through which he could deliver his poignant and powerful message to his Muslim readers and inculcate in them the patriotic sentiments he himself articulated towards a homeland that was being torn apart, torn apart during the Second Anglo-Mysore War. The war and its attendant fitna transformed the region of the Karnatak into an imagined and ideologized homeland. Therefore, the very idea of a Karnatic Watan had become imbued with a political resonance. Uh, to conclude, if the Nawab correspondence with Muslim notables in Arabia during the 1780s disclose, discloses his in, innovative attempts to awaken the wider Muslim community, although as a distant ally against the growing threat of the British, conceived now as the new enemy of Islam, Aga's poetry composed at his court around the same time registered this, the appearance of a new discourse on regional patriotism and a strong sense of attachment towards a regional homeland, a Karnatic Watan. Therefore, the untapped Arabic sources and the works produced by members of the Armenian community in Madras suggest that as a cosmopolitan city, port city, Madras during the 1780s was emerging as a crucible for political experimentation and speculation. At a crucial moment, when the East India Company began to reveal its thirst for territorial control in India. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor for me to be part of this conference, and I would like to warmly thank the organizers, and especially Professor Aslanian, for inviting me. I apologize in advance for my mistakes in English. Since Armenia became independent in 1991, the snare of glory, authored by two merchants, Hagop and Shahamir Shahamirian, has been the subject of renewed interest and integrated into the national narrative as the first Armenian constitution. Thus, could the Julfan merchants, already known for their trading skills, also proved to be pioneers in Republican legislation. However, the constitutional as well as the Republican nature of this composite text must be questioned. In this short presentation, I will try to define to what extent the snare can be considered as a constitution and a project for a, Republicans, a Republican state. I will also try to determine how could the Madras context have fostered the development of Shahamirian's ideas. Before considering the first issue, let's recall some background information. Although the title page mentions Hagop as the sole author and the publication date of 73, some anachronisms in the text and Shahamir's correspondence show that the first manuscript of the 70s 
was not completed until the 80s with the first printing that could not be prior to 89. Thus, as Hagop died in 74, a large part of this book, if not all of it, was authored by Shah Amir, and the retrospective attribution to Hagop can be, according to Tadeo Saftalbegian, a father's tribute to his son who died prematurely at the age of 29. In any case, this possible dual authorship over an extensive period of time with many revisions, some of them probably linked to new political developments in the Caucasus, led to some inconsistencies within the book, making it difficult to define its true nature. Is the snare a constitution in the modern sense of the word? There are some difficulties in calling the snare a constitution first. At the time, Armenia did not exist as a politically independent entity, so the snare is not an actual legislation, but a project for a future state. The last article of the book clearly states that the whole text is only an example to inspire future lawmakers, knowing that only people's representatives can make laws. Second, as the risk of arbitrariness is not limited to political power, the snare contains all sorts of rules, not only those that are generally considered to be constitutional or fundamental laws. However, as a higher priority is given in the book to the laws limiting the exercise of political power, let's consider this aspect. If we consider the specific meaning that emerges with the American, then French revolutions, according to Edouard Tillet and Olivier Beau, a constitution is a founding act of the political order, born of the will of the body politic. Curiously, the constitutional part of the snare falls under this definition, as if without an existing state and hoping for a future, even upcoming sovereignty, the authors had wanted to seize a chance for the people to create a radically new political order for the good of society. I will now recall some aspects of this constitutional example. The first part of the book is a lengthy introduction presenting the legitimacy of the republican ideal that all men are born free, equal and endowed with reason, and thus are all able to exercise political, political decision making. But as reason can often be dominated by passionate and unstable temperaments, a trap is needed to prevent anyone from rising above the law, especially the arrogant and powerful elite. The 521 articles of the second part outline the ideal Armenian state of the future as a representative regime reflecting the will of the people and in order to prevent any abuse by representatives once selected, the constitution must act as a snare by instituting the separation and limitation of powers and by providing for heavy sanctions in the case of violation of the law. 
The appointment of representatives is done by both elections and the drawing of lots. First, to make up the seats of parliament, and second, to assign official positions. Even the Naharar, that is the head of state, should be chosen by lot from among the elected citizens every three years, which is a clear difference from being a ruler by accident of birth, as in a dynastic family. Incidentally, the text show also shows the distance between the author's new concepts and the Armenian political vocabulary of that time, at that, ta at that time, as they were still using on old terminology. In any case, all these legal provisions are designed to prevent any abuse of power. However, we cannot fail to mention some discrepancies in the snare, especially related to the pure Republican principles. Some of these discrepancies can be explained by the possible dual authorship and the length of time over which the text was authored. But more deeply, different logics can also be observed. One of which is the dichotomy between the idea of a republic based on elected mandates and that of a hereditary political power. The latter is clearly defined in the first part of uh, the text as a probable source of abuse. Thus, in the second part, it is made impossible since the Naharar must be first elected and later selected for a three-year term. However, in five articles in the second part, it is said that this position could become hereditary under certain condi conditions. So, to the Republican model is added another possibility, which is a version of constitutional monarchy. A plausible explanation is the attempt to adapt to the new situation created in the Caucasus by the Treaty of Georgievsk of 83 between the Russian Empress Catherine the Great and King Irakli of Eastern Georgia. By this treaty, Georgia became a Russian protectorate with a local ruler and governance. During that period, Armenians tried to obtain a parallel Russia-Armenian treaty, or at least to form an Armenian-Georgian alliance this would, in, would have inspired Shahamir to make some amendments. Another issue is related to the equality of rights. Article 2 states that a condition for being an Armenian is to be born in the territory of Armenia regardless of national and religious affiliations. Yet, from Article 8 onwards, eligibility and property rights are reserved for apostolic Armenians. Even Catholic Armenians are excluded. This paradox was not so unusual. Even Locke, in his first letter concerning toleration, said that Catholicism and Islam have no right to be tolerated because they require their followers to give allegiance to a foreign authority. One must not forget that conversions mainly to Catholicism due to Roman missionaries 
but also to Islam, were common at the time. Thus, although all confessions are tolerated in the snare which proclaims freedom of faith and worship, there is one major prohibition for apostolic Armenians to convert to any other confes confession, given that only they can enjoy full citizenship. So, despite the attempt to conceive a citizenship as being independent of ethnicity and religion, the authors were perhaps right, given the political realities, to fear the risk of interference by foreign authorities, but they also seem partly imbued with the traditional Armenian framework of the nation church as a substitute for the state, as explained by Jean-Pierre Maé. Faced with these difficulties, one must remember that <clears throat> the authors were not philosophers, nor even clerics or lawmakers. They even acknowledged that they did not have a perfect command of the Armenian written language. Moreover, their call for an extension of rights should, of course, not be, uh, not be seen by today's standard. Despite some discrepancies, the snare appears to be a first attempt, as far as I know, to elaborate a secular and political thought and system unprecedented in the local, even regional, history. Finally, one has to question why this first Armenian constitutional draft was conceived so far from Armenia itself, itself and by merchants instead of political leaders. In Madras, maybe more than elsewhere within the Armenian world and its offshoots, the conditions were met to open up for the author's new horizons and liberties by escaping the powers of Persia and other despotic empires, which enabled them to enjoy freedom of information and expression and by coming into contact with information linked to the, to the constitutional and republican ideas of the time. At the moment, all the sources of the Shahamirian's writings are not completely known, but the snare attests that the authors were familiar, for example, with the history of the Roman Republic and with the debates of some Western philosophers of the time, such as the issue of the legitimacy of political power, the reflections on natural law, and the refutation of monarchy by divine right. Shahamir was even aware of the first decolonization movement since he warmly welcomed Washington's struggle for independence. Thus, without pretensions to being theorists, the Shahamirians appear to have been very responsive to all arguments in favor of freedom that they could implement for their people's liberation, in addition to the more usual Armenian references as the Bible or Khorenatsi's history, taking from them only that which could serve their purpose. Moreover, their attachment to the future of a homeland they had never seen and to which they would never return may have been reinforced by distance and nostalgia. Yet, despite the distance, Shahamir was constantly connected to the Armenian world through the merchant's network, but also through his correspondence, 
with personalities such as Archbishop Arhutian in Russia. Arhutian and Lazarian, together with Shahamir, tried from 83 to obtain the above mentioned Russia Armenian Treaty. So the snare confirms a major change in the scale and nature of the merchant's role going beyond the economic field to get involved into the political and diplomatic ones. One can assess that it, it could also be the case elsewhere, as shown by the example of Lazarian. However, the snare has a wide-ranging reflection on political matters, has no equivalent, and is probably in debt to the intellectual richness of the pluricultural city of Madras due to the circulation of information related to the contemporary currents of thought. As closing remark, I would underline that by stating that the Armenian people was not doomed to submission and that like all happy nations deserve to exercise their sovereignty under the rule of law, the snare can, can be considered as the first attempt in the Armenian world to develop a secular and political thinking in order to encourage national liberation and to assert the right of people to govern themselves. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much for those really, really excellent presentations. A lot of food for thought for us to reflect, uh, to reflect upon. So it is now officially 3.35. This panel was supposed to be over five minutes ago. So since we are running late, which seems to be a theme with the, uh, the conference as a whole, um, we're lucky at this point since we're running late since, uh, because we do have a, uh, uh, we've program programmed in one hour and 10 minutes, 10 minutes for a coffee break. So what we will do is take our coffee break at four o'clock instead of uh, right now. And I'll just say a couple of quick comments. Uh, I don't have many questions or anything like that. I'll, I'll make two comments, one each, one for uh, the, uh, for Satinik's uh, fascinating paper, and another one for the fascinating paper um, by by Michael, who's not here with us, at least in body, but he is here. Oh, yes. Hello, Michael. Hey, thank you. Thank you for making all this effort. Really enjoyed your paper. So, so my question, my comment uh, concerns, the first comment concerns Michael's paper, which I think is quite original and brilliant in some ways. Of course, obviously, it needs more work. But uh, I thought it was quite original because, for one simple reason, that Simeon Ayubians, um, Simeonian Ayubians, uh, has never been written upon, as far as I know, other than maybe the the Russian translation. And since I don't read Russian, I'm not sure to what extent. I'm not. I'm not sure to what extent. It's more than just a translation, uh, as opposed to commentary. So there's been no literature, as far as I know, on on the history of Haider Ali Khan. So that's really, an, uh, it's a in that sense, it's path 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 breaking what what you're doing, and I hope that you will continue it. Uh, one comment I have for you is, in addition to a number of registers in which you you were trying to uh, contextualize this work. There is one perhaps additional register which deserves more uh, investigation, and that is uh, something that connects also with Satini's talk. Um, this emergence in the 18th century 
of what is known uh, uh, by uh, what is known by some Middle Eastern historians, at least, as the rise of what uh, nouveau literacy in the 18th century, and by that. I'm referring to a concept that uh, Dana Sajdi came, uh, uh, elaborated upon in her book, The Barber of Damascus. And here she points out that in the Islamic world, beginning in the 1720s, there is a, a rise of this new class of writers that become an alternative to the ulama of Islam. Obviously, the ulama, the religious clerical class, had a monopoly of writing and literacy and, and writing in general. But she points out that beginning in the 1720s, 1740s, and so on, in various places in the Middle East, you had the rise of this new kind of literacy, uh, which uh, was conducted for the most part by merchants and so forth, uh, who, uh, by men who were not men of the pen, so to speak. And that this remarkably parallel development also applies to the Armenian world and is brought to the fore in your presentation as well as in Satanigs. And that is that in the Armenian context, you have what's called Vajaraganeru uh, Kraganutyun, which is a new kind of literacy, a literature that's produced by merchants who are semi-literate, including, of course, our very beloved Shahamir Shamirian, perhaps also his son, who constantly apologizes for misspelling things because Armenian is notoriously difficult to write. It has two Gs, two Ds, two Rs, so on. So merchants didn't have a command over that. And, and of course, even full sentences in classical Armenian or broken classical or a mixture of classical vernacular. So that's one area. And there's a whole set of books that were, tr that were translated in, at this time or before uh, Ayubians. But that also applies, Ayubians as a person who's interested in history can also be compared to uh, Shamir Shamirian more than in just a political way, but in terms of also style of writing and the fact that they're both merchants writing works of history. So that's something, that's all I'm going to say about that. As far as Satanig is concerned, I would say uh, I really enjoyed your presentation as well. I enjoyed all the presentations, really brilliant. Uh, but, uh, Satanig, I really enjoyed yours. And one of the things uh, I think that came to mind while reading your paper earlier was this kind of absent uh, trace of Rome and Roman virtue and Roman republicanism in this text. As you obviously know, in the introductory section, Shamirian says that Roman histories are available in every other European language, the history of Rome, especially the Republican era, except for Armenian. And he extols his countrymen to donate money so that a translation of it is conducted. Strangely uh, enough, exactly around that time, 1785, Edward Raphael Garamians of Pondicherry and Madras, fr French educated uh, merchant, commissioned the translation of a 12 volume or 17 volume famous work in French called Histoire Romaine by, um, what's his name? Roland, Charles Roland. And that book itself became literally uh, the means and the key to opening the door of the Armenian Enlightenment because as a result of that book, Murad Raphael College in Venice was opened. And so there is this Roman virtue connection there. I, um, as far as Ayal is concerned, uh, yes, the homeland uh, uh, concern, the, the interest in homeland, Watan in, South, in South, South India, it's obviously something that deserves to be more elaborated in the context of the Armenian connection and to see whether, I don't know what was in the water, but it's probably something not in the water, but circulating in terms of ideas. And I'm not sure if the circulation was west to east alone, because it could have been these our, uh, our merchants could have been also influenced by developments in the, the Nawab of Arkot's court, as well as in Haider Ali Khan, Haider Ali Khan's region. So it could be that there is more than just a European element. There could have been an Islamic element as well. With that, I'm going to field some questions myself from the audience. I wanted to thank everyone especially Mike for making this valiant effort. I don't know what time it is over there, but thank you for joining. Any questions? And again, questions relating to the talks, if possible. Oh, yes, and I invite the speakers to come up and assume that they're directors in a movie.
questions? Yes, Hasmik has a question. All right, first, well, let's go to Hasmik and then Sanjay will, will take a question. Thank you, thank you for your presentations. My uh, question for Ayal Amer. Uh, what is um, uh, I, my question concerning the political vision of uh, Muhammad Ali? What do you think? It is uh, directed only to the saving his Al Mulk, as you said, or he uh, the direct uh, the directed to the Islamization also. Also, for example, to the conversion uh, religion conversion and um, in the conversion of infidels. Yes, and what about the Shia and Sunni issue for him? <clears throat> well, clearly, in many of his writing, Muhammad Walaja is very much concerned about Islam. He is he's looking at Delhi, he's looking at the Mughal Empire, and the Mughal Empire at this stage is dysfunctional, so he cannot provide Islamic legitimacy anymore and hence hence he is looking now at Arabia you know to to, to strengthen Islam in the region um, and this is something that he discussed in more details in a couple of years after he wrote these letters with his arch enemy Tipu Sultan um, starting in 1790, these letters actually, there's a letter in 1790 which indicate that um, Muhammad Ali Walaja contacted Tipu Sultan kind of about a possible, creating a possible alliance for protecting Islam, um, given now that they're looking at the East India Company and it's um, basically becoming a danger for Islam in the region and in India in general. Um, the same with Bakr Aga, he always talk about the state of Islam in, in India. Now, with the second question about the Shia Sunni issue, this is, um, this is something that I'm also interested in. Now, Muhammad Ali Walaja was a devout Sunni. You, yesterday you mentioned he is married to a Shia woman from North India. And by the 1780s, now from the 1740s, 1750s, there was a kind of an influx of Shia down to the south. And Muhammad Walaja, because he was married to um, uh, to a Shia woman, and he wanted to consolidate his power, so it was important for him to kind of bring Muslims from uh, all over India, and particularly also Shia. So he supported the Shia. But the thing about Muhammad Ali Waja that he also supported uh, the Naqshbandi Mujaddidi order, uh, which uh, this is a Sufi order that was known for its attacks on Shia. So in 1790, basically, Muhammad Ali Walaja decided to kind of, given the fact that he is now looking at his rule and looking at what is happening in Madras, and so he decided to further strengthen his relationship with the, with the Naqshbandi Mujadid order, and so he invited one of the, the scholars um, the well-known scholars of North India from, Nakla, from Lucknow, his name is um, um, uh, Bahr al-Uloom, and he came down to Madras with his 600 disciples, and all of them actually in Madras, they, they basically were initiated to the Naqshbandi Mujaddid order. So around this time, Muhammad Ali Walaja was realizing that he needs to kind of more and more establish a stronger relationship with, with this Naqshbandi Mujaddidi order. And this was a kind of very global, uh, they have global network extending all the way to the Ottoman Empire and also to Mysore. And through the Naqshbandi Mujaddidi, actually, he was able to make these links with Mysore. Now, in 1791, exactly at the same time that these 
Um, this scholar came from North India, Bahr al Uloom, with his disciples. This is when the conflict between the Sunni and Shia started. This was a 10 years conflict that ended only when the East India Company took over, basically annexed uh, the region of the Karnataka and deposed basically the Nawabi family, making them basically just nominal rulers of the Karnataka. Um, so, so yeah, so clearly this is, this is, this is an important um, issue that scholars normally ignored in terms of because there's a tendency to kind of look at this dynasty as kind of have this having this Shia kind of inclination, but this was not the case. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sanjay? Uh, I'll keep it brief. Uh, a short remark to Mike and uh, a short remark to Ayal. Uh, uh, Mike, I was wondering whether you had thought about the fact that um, in um, Heather's domains, uh, this um, reasonably sizable Portuguese presence of mercenaries and others, uh, which you can actually find reflected in there are two figures. There is uh, Peixoto, who's an important mercenary captain. There's Antonio José de Noronha, who writes an account of, uh, of uh, Heather. And now these are, you know, very often uh, in such situations, uh, common cause would be made across Christian denominations. I don't know whether your author was a Catholic Armenian or a uh, or not, but even if he was not, there would very often be such aspects of communication. So I was wondering whether the Portuguese angle is one that you had thought about. Uh, for Ayal, I was actually wondering about the particular problem that you raised, because you see the term Vatan, as you well know, uh, has been discussed quite extensively by, say, Chris Bailey and Muzaffar Alam for the 18th century in India. When people talk about Vatan, typically, in the 18th century, it's interesting that they usually talk about it in a vernacular context. And typically, they deploy vernacular language, and typically, they locate it in terms of uh, local sites, like local pilgrimage sites, and so on. So it's a, it's don't you find it rather strange that your author is writing about Vatan in Arabic, sitting in Arcot? It's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? Maybe Michael can answer, uh, can respond first, and then I'll come to the chat. Michael? Perfect. Can you hear me well? Yeah, yes, we can, yeah. Perfect. Sorry, I'm looming over you like the Wizard of Oz head, so... I will uh, keep my remarks brief as well. No, I mean, I the what's interesting is that the Portuguese connection is not mentioned by Simonian. And of course, I was completely ignorant of, of it myself. Uh, the other bizarre thing about Simonian is that he doesn't reveal what his particular religious denomination is either. So we don't know if he's a Armenian Catholic, for example. Um, but there is, in a sense, a sort of uh, hesitation to engage with, with Europeans in the text that is quite interesting. But I'll, I'll certainly you know, track down the, the Portuguese angle and look into it in greater depth. Thanks for the, the comment. Yeah, so um, if this is one of, one of that those questions that I was asking myself as I was reading, you know, when I first read this, um, when I first read these poetry back in 2014, I think in Madras, when I discovered this manuscript in a, in a private library. So I took these notes, I didn't even make any kind of, um, you know, I just I wrote them down, I copied this, uh, this poetry. And I it was there lying in my in my in my computer until actually I met a professor Aslanian and he began like this is when I kind of realized that there was this kind of notion about homeland emerging in Madras. Now what on as you mentioned was discussed by um, C. A. Bailey in the context of I think was the Marathi, they talk about Vatan. Um, Marathis use Watan, they borrow it from the Mughals, 
as a, it was a kind of uh, the landed uh, territories, right? Or the, in, in the case of uh, the Mughals was the, the Jagir of the of Jag, Jagiri Mahalli Watan. So this, um, the Watan where someone has the kind of, you know, where they can extract revenue. Right. Um, but as argued by Muzaffar Alam, um, is that by the 18th century, the idea of Watan was kind of growing. So now these, as they were, these, these, especially in Punjab, um, as they were kind of breaking away from the Mughal, um, they were kind of now they're referring to the whole region as Watan. So kind of it's for Bakr Aga to use Watan as such, I was kind of, I wouldn't be, you know, it wasn't really surprising at this stage, especially because of the situation. And Watan across, like even in 19, early 19th century, you start to see the idea of Watan in the Middle East as kind of being politicized uh, in the Ottoman Empire. But here I'm basically, we can think about the work of um, Bernard Lewis. He wrote about Watan and how this term basically evolved uh, from just a mere description of one's um, basic place of residence into, um, into a political kind of uh, a homeland uh, for a group. But Louis, in the case of Bernard Louis, is, and his thesis about the French Revolution and its impact on the Muslim world, he says that Watan becomes politi politicized only after the French Revolution. And even the idea of patriotism for Louis, the idea of patriotism, it was a new discovery only in the 1830. Um, and this is what I'm the think about. That's what we find interesting about Madras. Now, there were other locals talking about Watan, not in Madras, but in Pondicherry. And I'm, can, I have, I know this person, his name is Maridasa Pillai. I don't know if you know him. He was a French interpreter in the in the in the French uh, East India Company. So he was an interpreter in 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 Pondicherry, and he wrote actually in around seventeen early seventeen eighties. He wrote an essay in which he talks about his love toward. It was in French towards his homeland, and he called it patrie. And, and there he also refers to India as a homeland of all Indians. He, he, he used the word Indian nation to describe India. So again, these are, these are interesting questions. And I only found in Aga's case, like where Watan is used um, in, in this kind of to, 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 to convey this sense, this sense of, you know, this meaning as a kind of a place, you know, uh, of one's loyalty, um, not just a place of residence. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, this is, this is, it still need more exploration. Um, I'm just kind of looking forward to kind of find more poetry if there are any in, you know, in South India where, you know, the, this concept of Watan is, you know, is, is, is used. Fantastic. Thank you very much Thanks, for that. Uh, any other questions? We have maybe one question. Yes, Veronica. Thank you very much to all of the speakers for three fascinating talks. I have two perhaps brief questions for Satanik. Um, the first one is um, with regards to your decision to omit the frontispiece in the Voro Guide Parats from your kind of discussion. And I was curious if you could say more about perhaps why you decided to leave it out, the illustration on the, on the page facing the title, the cover. And if you could say more about the provenance of, of that particular illustration, if you know anything else about um, about that, and for those who don't know it, it's an illustration of a shepherd guiding sheep into an enclosure. Um, so that's question number one. And the second question is um, uh, whether you have any inclination about potential other unnamed authors, or 
influences on that particular document. Because we know, for example, that Yosef Emin passed through Madras in the 1770s, um, that Hagop uh, Shamirian had a tutor who had been excommunicated, whom Professor Asanyan has, exactly, who Professor Asanyan has written about. Um, so in your research, could you say more about those other presences in the text? Thank you. Oui. No, vous êtes très bien en anglais. Okay. It, it's on. It's on. Uh, uh, Est-ce que c'est vous peut traduire si je réponds en, en français? Vous pouvez répondre en anglais. Non. <laughs> okay. Essaye. On essaye. <laughs> Donc la première question était sur la provenance de la gravure. Mais ça c'est, enfin, franchement, j'ai passé des, des jours et des jours et des mois à chercher. À ma connaissance, personne ne connaît cette l'origine de cette gravure. Euh, j'ai lu énormément de, de de journaux et de de brochures publiées en Angleterre, en France, euh, aux Pays-Bas. Euh, pour essayer de tomber sur cette gravure, j'ai aussi beaucoup regardé les, les almanachs, euh, euh, j'ai aussi regardé les sources italiennes, et à vrai dire, euh, dans le seul dessin qui pourrait ressembler, il est dans un almanach des moritaristes. Mais il est sous une forme extrêmement grossière, qui n'a rien à voir avec la, 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 la gravure qui, qui est assez belle. Je me suis même renseignée auprès des spécialistes de la laine et des moutons pour savoir euh, <rire> de quel pays peuvent être ces, ces moutons. Est-ce qu'ils sont suisses Est-ce qu'ils sont euh, irlandais <rire> Donc, moi, je n'ai pas trouvé... À ma connaissance, personne ne sait, je, je n'ai jamais trouvé d'informations. Si quelqu'un le sait, okay. nous n'avons pas beaucoup, beaucoup de temps. So. D'accord. Uh, le... Et la deuxième question, ah oui, alors sur les sources, alors ça, ça me, ça me passionne. Donc, euh, étant donné que les, les auteurs ne citent pas leurs sources, euh, on en est réduit à faire des conjectures et moi, ça me gêne beaucoup de... Euh, de d'établir des liens un petit peu comme ça par association d'idées. Euh, malgré tout, il y a quand même des, des indices sérieux dans, dans, les, dans le texte, en fait. Il faut partir du texte. Je donne juste deux exemples. À un moment, l'auteur parle euh, du droit naturel qu'il réfère à Saint Paul. Parce que bon, pour des raisons rhétoriques, il aime bien montrer qu'il a des références bibliques et que c'est euh, ça lui donne de la crédibilité. Or, lorsque saint Paul parle de l'existence d'une loi avant la loi, c'est pas du tout pour dire qu'il y, qu y a un droit naturel, euh, puisque un peu plus loin dans la même lettre, euh, il dit que la volonté du prince est la volonté de Dieu. Donc, il n'est pas du tout question pour saint Paul d'utiliser le droit naturel pour lutter, disons, pour contester la légitimité du droit existant. Donc, euh, l'auteur attribue faussement, par erreur ou par convenance, je ne sais pas, à saint Paul l'origine du droit naturel. Et en réalité, ce qu'on voit, c'est qu'il fait l'usage, il fait usage, euh, cet auteur, du concept de droit naturel, exactement comme le font les auteurs des Lumières, c'est-à-dire pour dire que euh, les lois établies par les gouvernements, par les princes, par les assemblées, ne sont pas nécessairement légitimes parce que il y a des droits humains qui, euh, sur lesquels les, les gouvernements n'ont pas prise. Juste le deuxième exemple, qui est presque amusant, euh, à un moment, l'auteur dit « je ne nie pas que… » etc. Donc il est bien en train, dans son esprit, de répondre à quelque chose. Et euh, cette partie de l'argumentation, c'est en fait la réflexion sur euh, le, euh, la monarchie de droit divin. Donc, euh, j'ai fait quelques recherches par rapport à ça. Donc, le grand théoricien du droit div, du, du, de la monarchie par de droit divin en Angleterre, c'était Sir Robert Filmer, qui donc s'appuyait sur un passage de la Genèse pour dire que Dieu avait fait l'homme, enfin avait fait Adam, roi de la création et que tous les rois suivants étaient les descendants d'Adam. 
contre quoi Locke a écrit une première série d'objections dans le deuxième euh, traité du gouvernement civil. Ensuite, il y a eu encore une autre, et alors là, enfin, une autre série d'objections. Et l'argument qu'utilise euh, Saramirian pour dire qu'il n'y a pas de droit divin, qu'il n'y a pas de monarchie légitime, c'est celui qu'on trouve chez Locke, à savoir Dieu a fait Adam roi des autres espèces vivantes, mais pas des membres de son espèce. Il n'a aucun droit sur les autres hommes, qui sont donc libres par nature. Donc, ce serait passionnant d'essayer de, re, de retrouver tous ces liens, mais ce n'est pas facile non plus. Il y a pas difficile de trouver des preuves. Ok, merci bien. Je ne sais pas si je peux recorder ou... Internalize the whole thing. I'm not a United Nations translator by any stretch of the imagination, although I did work at the UN for two years. So, uh, so the, answer, the answer to the first question is actually easy to, to pose. She's looked extensively in multiple places to see the origins of the engravings, but has essentially not concluded anything. Um, but that is an excellent question because I think I, I may actually add to what she said by saying that Uh, Hagop Shamirian, the son of Shamir Shamirian, who was buried on his father's tobacco plantation in Singapore or Malacca, Malacca, not far from Singapore, on his tombstone engraving, talks about a figure that is long awaited, who will uh, uh, turn out, turn up one day and guide the Armenians like a shepherd. So maybe there is, maybe this, the engraving is not really anywhere uh, there, perhaps. Mm -hmm. She's non, mais de, de toute façon, c'est une allégorie du, du bon berger. OK, yes. Could be, <laughs> but anyway, that, that would be the extent. So the answer is, I don't know. Um, as far as the second question is concerned, I'm going to defer to somebody else who has a better recalling, um, better memory to recall, unless you want to respond in English to the second question. But we do have to keep it brief, one way or the other. Um, Sanjay, you wanna, you wanna, do you recall what she said? Yes. It's a natural law. Hello. Yeah, I think she basically tried to develop the idea through a couple of different examples. One where he's, uh, he's actually mis, uh, misquoting St. Paul and attributing things to St. Paul about natural law, which in fact cannot be found in St. Paul. And then uh, on a, another occasion, she actually looks to something where uh, it eventually turns out that there is some kind of an echo of a debate between Locke and another thinker uh, of the 17th century. But the great difficulty is actually in the, in the absence of explicit citations. Um, if one doesn't just want to go by free association to try to actually track down, you know, uh, in a very pointillistic way, uh, where each of these ideas could come from, if there is an echo from another author and so on. And uh, that is obviously a lot of work. Thank you so much. Uh, we, okay, we're five minutes over. So once again, thank you so much. Let me just uh, say a couple of things before we take a break for coffee and lemonade. Uh, We have a dist we have we're going to take about 40 minutes or less than that 35 minutes for a break and then we will reconvene right here to be feasted by the uh, keynote address by Professor Subramaniam and then after the keynote address is done, we have dinner on the terrace. Anyone here, everyone here is welcome to join us, we have plenty of. Um, nourishment to go around as well as music, there is a musical performance, so thank you once again. We will continue this outside.
speakers. If any of our speakers have forgotten their glasses at the podium, you can come get them from here.
Thank you.
please find your way to your seats. We're going to be beginning very soon for the keynote. Please find your way to your seats and let's keep the noise level a little down. We're going to be beginning any second now. Welcome everyone to the concluding talk of this conference. And as the old saying goes, we leave the, the best for last. So we're very honored to have as a speaker today, a historian who normally does not need any introduction. However, some of you here may not be aware of his work and his importance. So let me very quickly um, say a few things about Professor Sanjay Subramaniam. Professor Subramaniam is a distinguished professor of history and, Irving, and the Irving and Jean Stone Chair of the Social Sciences here at UCLA, a specialist of the early modern era, that is 15th to the 18th centuries. He is the author of numerous books, essays, and edited volumes ranging between studies of India and the Indian Ocean, the early modern European empires, and reflections on global history as a field of research. For many of us here who are scholars, his works have been the high watermark of emulation in terms of the kind of research that Professor Subramaniam has been doing over the past many, many years. Uh, among his recent publications, Subramaniam's book, books include Europe's India, which appeared in 2017 from Harvard University Press and in French translation in 2018. His empires, uh, empires between Islam and Christianity, 1500 to 1800, has appeared in a 2018 and 2019 uh, in two versions, in 2018 and 2019, in, in, an, in an Indian and US editions, and in French and Turkish translations in 2021 and 2022. His newest book is Faut-il universaliser l'histoire? Uh, which was published uh, 2020. He has also edited a 16th century codex with paintings of Portuguese Asia from Edition Chandagne, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, in Paris. Subramaniam also comments on public issues in the media in the form of interviews and op-ed articles. On this note, since we mentioned some of the translations of his works, I should say that 
uh, with in collaboration with the Kalust Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisbon in the Armenian Studies Department there. My chair is now uh, con um, overseeing a translation of Professor Subramaniam's microhistory of individuals who circulated in early modern Eurasia. It's called Three Ways to Be Alien, and the translation will be appearing in Western Armenian, hopefully within the next year, in conjunction with another very important work of microhistory, that, of course, produced by uh, Carlo Ginzburg in 1979, entitled The Cheese and the Worms. So both works are going to be published in translation and released in Armenia probably at the same time, sometime in the fall of next year. It's a, it's a great honor to, to be a person associated with such a, such a translation work. Um, Professor Subramaniam works in multiple registers of languages, I think to the tune of 10 or 12 languages. Uh, and I assure you, it's not just superficial um, awareness of these languages, but a deep fluency and incredibly a bewildering ability to conduct primary source research in multiple areas in multiple languages, the kind of skill set that any world historian would need to be of the caliber of Professor Subramaniam. So without further ado, I welcome him to the floor to deliver his keynote address, which is titled Armenians and Others in Surat, uh, Reflections or Thoughts on Rethinking Communities, Collaboration and Conflict. Sanjay, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for that, um, Sabu, and uh, thank you for the invitation to address this conference. Um, thank you to all of the organizers. Thank you to uh, the student volunteers who have been so uh, present and uh, um, efficient in doing everything from uh, uh, getting us uh, uh, to this place away from it and, and feeding us with food from uh, Badmash and uh, other such places. So uh, this is a conference called Armeno Indica. And um, it goes without saying that uh, one could approach it from the two ends. So many of you are actually specialists of Armenian language and Armenian literature, Armenian documents. Um, and I will confess to you that I'm coming at it from the Indica end of it. But uh, I will eventually get to the junction. So uh, I will not uh, leave you completely, uh, shall we say, hungry on the Armenian end of the of the uh, repast. And my purpose uh, is to actually follow a strategy which uh, quite a few people who have already spoken in this conference have done, which is to focus on a single space, a single urban space. Uh, we've had uh, talks about Madras, we've had talks about Calcutta, and um, this is a city, of course, which we've also had some reference to, notably in uh, Sibu Aslanian's uh, uh, paper uh, earlier today, which is uh, the uh, great Western Indian port city of Surat, uh, which uh, was uh, in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, um, one of the greatest um, and most important uh, maritime centers uh, in India, uh, perhaps uh, even um, by some measures in the 17th century, the most important port city in, in India uh, at that time. Uh, eventually overtaken by uh, colonial port cities uh, such as uh, Madras, uh, Calcutta, and Bombay, uh, but that would be a later story. And my focus is essentially on the city at the time of the Mughals. Now, the city was not founded by the Mughals. Let's be clear about that. This city existed already in the early 16th century. Uh, there was also a counterpart to the city on the other side of the river, uh, a place called Randed. And uh, this city in the 1520s had a certain significance, but it was consolidated actually curiously in the 1540s when this site that you see over here, the fort of Surat was actually built. And it was interestingly built not by uh, a, uh, an, an Indian uh, entrepreneur, but rather by 
uh, someone who was a, an Ottoman subject who uh, was uh, able to install himself in Western India for a certain time. I'll come back to him in a minute. So what I'm thinking about here, as I think about uh, the question of uh, Surat and how it was constituted as an urban space, as an urban fabric, is to think of it, amongst other things, as essentially a place where a large number of mercantile groups cohabited. Now, how does one approach these mercantile groups? What are the essential tools and methods that we have before us? Um, in the last, I would say, uh, two generations, um, most of us who have actually worked on mercantile communities have had certain common points of departure. Whether we agree with those common points of departure today or not is a different matter, but we do have a certain, shall we say, required bibliography that all of us go through and which we put our students through. Some of the students in the room will testify to that. So, um, most of us, when we talk about mercantile communities in the medieval period and thereafter, uh, will uh, certainly uh, go through, in some form or the other, the book that you see on the left over here, the book of Shlomodov Goiten uh, on uh, a Mediterranean society. It's a work by uh, a historian who um, essentially uh, fell uh, upon the use of a particular archive. This is the archive of the so-called Geniza of Cairo. And uh, through this archive was able to approach uh, the uh, spread of a Jewish mercantile community in the Mediterranean, in many ports of the Mediterranean, but also then eventually reaching out uh, across the Western Indian Ocean, uh, through the Red Sea, uh, into Western India, into Gujarat, uh, into uh, the uh, Konkan, and uh, also into, into Kerala. So this is uh, an affair of, uh, shall we say, um, um, a medieval uh, period, uh, notably that uh, which corresponds to the Fatimid Caliphate and slightly thereafter. But in spite of whatever period Goitain deals with, the methods that he used became very common methods for people even dealing with what I would think of as an early modern period from the 15th to the 18th century. So um, the generalization which came out of Goitain, Goitain was a, was a splendid philologist, but he was not, shall we say, um, a much of a theoretical kind of uh, person. Hmm? But the, the conceptual apparatus was given to us by the person that you see on the right over here, who was mostly actually an Atlantic historian to start with, Philip Curtin. And he, in fact, took and made use of a concept which had been put forward by an anthropologist, uh, Abner Cohen, uh, and generalized it, which was the idea of the merchant diaspora. So let's just take a minute to just recall what a merchant diaspora is, according to uh, curtain building on the work of people like like Goitain before him. The idea of a merchant diaspora is you're talking about a community which has some kind of a specific ethnic character. Point one. Point two. It is a community which is spatially dis uh, di dis uh, displaced or dispersed mm, at any rate. So it means that you cannot take a community which resides in a single place and treat it as a diaspora. So it's dispersed. But the third and most important claim which Curtin made, which today many of us would disagree with, is the idea that this community has a great deal more internal coherence than it has any relationship with its neighbors. So the idea is that if you are a uh, Jew of the Geniza uh, living in Aden or uh, someone of the same community living in, let's say, um, Mangalore or living in, in Quilon, in uh, Kollam, in, in, in Kerala, you have a lot more to do with your fellow members of your community in these distant places than, let's say, you would with your neighbors in Aden who don't belong to your ethnicity or your community. That's the claim that Curtin is making. He's not, let me make it clear, uh, bringing a value judgment to this. He's not saying it's a good thing that these people keep themselves separate from their neighbors. He's merely saying that it's a matter of observation that this is how these merchant diasporas work. And I think that this is actually, in a way, uh, at the heart of some of the questions that we've already dealt with in this conference and which I want to come back to, which is the question of, for example, uh, if you are in a place like Surat and you have the Armenians there, how much do the Armenians have to do with the other communities? And what are the nature of the relations that they have with them? Are they relations of collaboration? Are there relations of conflict? Are there a combination of the two? And how exactly does this, this work out? Oh, 
Curtin also had one more thing to say, which is that he also seemed to have a view that these merchant communities typically um, do not engage in politics, hmm? which is, of course, something which I think time and again in the last day and a half, we have had reason to question. We can see that merchant communities very often did have a lot to do with politics. Hmm? So <clears throat> let's uh, now come back to uh, the specificities of the, of the Armenians. I just want to flag two books for you. One of them will be uh, perfectly familiar, uh, which is uh, Sabu's uh, revised dissertation uh, published from the University of California Press, From the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean. I also wanted to mention this other book, an edited uh, volume, um, or Les Armeniens dans le commerce asiatique, au début de l'ère moderne, amongst other things, because one of the two editors of that book was actually uh, the person who, in a way, uh, introduced me to uh, Armenian merchant history, uh, Keram Kevonian, who was, uh, for a number of years, my, my uh, colleague in the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme and the École des Études in Paris, and who remains a, a reference for extremely careful philological work uh, with regard to Armenian merchants and their documents. So uh, we have, of course, this historiography, which is out there and which exists. Um, and we also have, of course, a vast number of uh, descriptions from the early modern period, uh, which uh, uh, present the Armenians to us uh, here, for example, uh, in, in uh, Italian, um, which are very often written by non-Armenians, um, which are very often not very complementary to them. And we'll come back to this. This is also a theme having to do with these collaboration and conflict type of problems. Mm -hmm. um, you can find this, as I said, this is an, an Italian text. This is a fairly celebrated uh, French text from the 16th century, uh, the account of Nicolas de Nicolet, uh, where, again, he goes through the various kinds of mercantile communities you can see uh, typically in the Ottoman Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is the, the Armenians who are, who are uh, being described, but uh, the Armenians of Constantinople and the Armenians of the Eastern Mediterranean, not those of the, of the uh, Indian Ocean. So you can start accumulating a number of these, shall we say, external perspectives on the Armenians without a great deal of difficulty. Now, for someone um, starting to look at this uh, whole problem of the Armenians and their presence in the in early modern Indian Ocean, uh, the, uh, the straightforward uh, standard narrative is out there. And the standard narrative, which uh, has been rehearsed a couple of times during this conference, is essentially one of uh, the kind of uh, partly political and, shall we say, partly ecological origins of a diaspora, uh, which, uh, which is created uh, on the, as a result of a crisis of the late 16th and early 17th century. Um, um, Aslanian uh, has uh, suggested that it's a double crisis, one Anatolian crisis having to do with the Jalali rebellions, which might also have some, some climate uh, or climate related origins, and a second set of origins, which of course have to do with the uh, political uh, set of moves, which um, uh, a number of um, authors from the 17th century were very clear about. Right? So let's take this uh, um, well-known, uh, uh, well, actually not that well-known 17th century text by a French traveler, Le Gousse de la Boulay, uh, who uh, went through Armenia on his way from the Eastern Mediterranean to India. And while he was there, you can, you can see he says that on the uh, 25e, nous passons la fleuve Ara, appelé Araxis par les Grecs, and so on. And then he actually tells you about uh, there were uh, there was the old Julfa, Usulfa, he calls it, and from there, the Armenians of Isfahan were expelled and transported by Shah Abbas, the conqueror, who took this country and uh, made these <clears throat> people slaves uh, and, and brought them to Isfahan. So this, this is your sort of standard narrative, which takes us to this, to this uh, celebrated figure who um, somewhat ruthlessly transported this, com uh, this community and managed thereby to uh, create his uh, his uh, own uh, version of the silk trade, which, as we know, <clears throat> uh, also involved uh, expelling the Portuguese from Hormuz and uh, creating his own uh, favored port of uh, of uh, Bandar Abbas, through which the Iranian trade then <clears throat> began to transit from the middle of the 1620s forward. Now, uh, the question, of course, arises of um, whether uh, the Armenian uh, presence in uh, a India, uh, in fact, effectively dates to this. It's a question which has been mentioned a few times uh, over the course of this 
this conference. Certainly, I would uh, agree that uh, so far as I can see in numbers, if you're looking for some serious numbers, yes, we have to go to the 17th century. But I want to mention to you that even before in the 16th century, you can find the odd trace of an Armenian mercantile presence in, uh, in Western India. For example, uh, one of the few uh, rare uh, census we have of the bourgeois, the Casado residents of Goa um, in, the, uh, uh, in around 1520 actually uh, mentions uh, Armenians amongst them in Goa already at this time. Hmm? Uh, and similarly, you can find odds and ends of mentions in the second half of the 16th century, um, which, uh, which uh, are worth, uh, worth uh, thinking about, right? But uh, as, I, as you can see, the standard reference, the standard texts of the 17th century, I move here from Le Gousse de la Boule to Teveno, he says more or less the same thing. He's here he's describing a new Julfa. He talks about how it's constituted. He talks about where the the uh, Armenians come from. And again, it's the same standard narrative which traces it back, as you can see, somewhere in the middle over there to uh, Shabbas Premier and how he uh, ruined old Julfa, transported them to new Julfa, etc. So we know, we know this narrative. However, as I said to you, um, if one looks widely enough, you can find traces of Armenians who seem to predate this actual uh, expulsion and move to, to New Julfa in India. Now, one of the places to look where uh, people have not perhaps spent as much time as they should have, and I think now uh, people are starting to do so and we start to see them is, um, for example, the uh, Inquisition, the Portuguese Inquisition records. So if you look at this Inquisition record, for example, uh, it tells you that uh, this is a, a document from February of Milisej Centos hmm, um, of uh, 1600. Right, so somewhat earlier than the actual transportation and move. And the person who is being examined over here by the inquisitor is a uh, person, a man who uh, said that his name was Bastion Diaz, but in his Armenian name, he was called Yusuf and he was from the town of Mardin, right? So uh, you can see this, this is from the, uh, this is an, an Armenian from the Ottoman Empire, who, if you go through the whole of the inquisition dossier, you find that he had come to India, that he had eventually converted to uh, Islam. He had then subsequently uh, converted to uh, Catholicism. He had taken a Portuguese name, Sebastian or Bastian Diaz, and um, he had been then denounced. And the inquisitors then proceeded to extract his, his life story from him. So this is 1600, and I think that you can probably find a few more of these late 16th century stories. So there is, a, there is an Armenian presence which, shall we say, precedes the whole uh, move to, to New Julfa, but as I said, the numbers begin to grow uh, thereafter. Now, um, if we want to look for the uh, materials from the early 17th century around the time of the expulsion and slightly thereafter, again, we have to cast our net wide. If you look, for example, at the account, the autobiography and travel account of the jeweler from, from Bruges, uh, Jacques de Coutre, um, he actually, uh, La Vida de Jacques de Coutre, uh, he talks about his dealings with various Armenians in Western India, uh, uh, dealing with them in uh, the jewel trade, and in fact, perhaps even the pearl trade. I, I must go back and, and look at this question to see uh, what he says. So this is 1610s or so, 1620s. And then I will turn to the fact that the Dutch, when they arrive in the Western Indian Ocean in the early 17th century, have a fair amount to say to us about this, this, uh, Armenian, this Armenian presence. Now, this Armenian presence with the Dutch is much more clearly now linked to Surat. Right? So the previous presences seem to be more dispersed along the, along the uh, west coast of, of India. Um, oh yes, I have even found uh, traces of an Armenian who was the interpreter of one of the Deccan Sultanates in the 1580s and 1590s. Uh, so you can find these earlier things, but as I said, you cross into the 17th century, you see more Armenians and they are more clearly linked to uh, Surat and to the trade of the of the port. So um, let's consider uh, the account of uh, Francisco Pelsart, the Dutch factor who had uh, was in, in um, Surat and then he was also in Agra. 
Mm? Uh, and uh, here he has a sort of somewhat uh, snide, uh, nasty remark about the Armenians. Uh, he's talking about the indigo trade and how the Dutch are trying to buy up indigo in some of the interior villages. And you see what he says over here. He says that uh, we shouldn't go running around from one village to another to buy up the indigo. Goodness knows the Armenians do quite enough of that, running and racing about like hungry folk whose greedy eyes show that they are dissatisfied with the meal provided, who take a taste of every dish and make the other guests hurry to secure their own portions and so on. So you, you get a sense here of a little bit of hostility, but, but in fact, uh, this hostility is a little bit misleading, right? Because if one actually goes back and looks at a slightly larger context of Pelsart, and um, if you take Pelsart together with a, another very important Dutch account from this period, 1610s, 1620s, which is the account of Peter van den Broeke, uh, you actually find something which uh, to me, when I started adding it up, was a little bit of a surprise, which is this. So these are some of the early uh, Dutch-Armenian relations in Surat that you find accounts of. These are, for example, uh, of um, a Dutch factor, uh, Antone Klassen Fischer, who is married to an Armenian woman who has a Portuguese name, Maria Gomes, hmm? but she's also called Mariam Baghdadi. Uh, so presumably at some point she had an origin in Baghdad. Her brother, uh, Domingo Gomes, was a merchant and he was also dealing periodically with the East India Company. A uh, third Armenian actor that you see over there is Iskandar Beg, who was uh, the interpreter in the English factory in Surat at this point in time, but he was also quite well known to Van den uh, Very often these people and Van den Broeke or the Dutch would act um, as um, uh, either uh, godfathers and godmothers jointly in the baptism of certain Christian children, which could be uh, mixed blood children, which could be Armenian children, or which could be children of slaves. So you can often find, find them in that context. Uh, the fourth person you see on that list is Mariam, the daughter of an Armenian merchant from Ahmedabad, married to the Dutch factor William, William Jakobson. You have somebody who's called Mariken, which means little Maria. Uh, and this rather enigmatic figure whom I'm curious to find out more about, who's an Armenian who goes by the name of Yadgar. And uh, he's repeatedly mentioned in the Dutch materials of this time, late 16, roughly, shall we say, 16, 18 to 16, 23, 24, married to another Dutch factor, Isaac Scolliers. Um, then there's his wife, uh, Yadgar's wife, Angela, who is the comadre, so uh, who has participated in one of these baptism ceremonies uh, with, with uh, Van den Broek. And finally, you have the daughter of, who doesn't, is not given a specific name, of an Armenian called Hoja Raphael, who is married to actually not a Dutch, but a German who's working for the Dutch called Paulus Stiegel from Nuremberg. Uh, and so you can see that there are all these relations. These are not so much commercial relations, but they're actually uh, marital relations. You can find a few more hints of this if one looks, for example, in the travel account of Pietro della Valle, the Italian who was in, who was in uh, Western India and in Iran at this time. So clearly, uh, despite the snarky undertone, or maybe not even undertone, of those remarks by Pelsart, you can see that there's also another set of relations which are going on um, over here. And um, which means that, in fact, uh, there is a, a lot more uh, going back and forth, and which possibly means also that in a second generation, we have children who are part Armenian and part Dutch. Uh, except that we don't necessarily realize that from their names because they may just retain a Dutch name, but we in fact don't necessarily know what the ancestry uh, really is. Now, um, this is of course taking part of uh, taking place in the context of this of the city, right? So this is a famous uh, uh, Indian map of this uh, city, uh, a cloth map, which is uh, remarkable for the fact that it has extremely detailed, as you can see, bilingual. Uh, annotation in Persian and in Western in uh, Western Hindi. Hmm? So uh, here you can see the focus is uh, is on the fort, hmm? uh, the fort which was built by that Ottoman, um, um, who actually was an Italian from Otranto, but that's a different matter. So this Ottoman called Haja Safar Safar Salmani, who built this in the 1540s, which the Mughals took over in the 1570s, and the Mughals then. Uh, built up things around this fort, but they kept this fort. The fort controlled the river. But Surat was not a, a, a port on the open sea, it was on the river uh, Tapi or Tapti, 
And so um, very often smaller vessels uh, would come up the river, the larger vessels would be left to be anchored out in a place which was called Swali or Swali Hole. And uh, that would be the way in which in which it, it would work. And we can see actually a number of details. And in fact, one of the very interesting things that you can see in this map, uh, which is a very persistent uh, feature of Surat, and I want to um, make a point about this in relation to, for instance, the work of, uh, um, of uh, uh, Curtin, is that it is very clear that there are no ethnic quarters in Surat. So it's, it's very clear that there is no notion that um, uh, people concentrate on the basis of ethnicity in this town. You can actually see uh, people, mansions, um, which are uh, fairly clearly dispersed. Right. Even on the riverfront, you can see side by side mansions which belong to quite distinct ethnic groups. So, for example, a mansion which belongs to, um, let's say, um, a great uh, Siddhi merchant, which is to say someone of, of uh, East African origin, next to uh, the mansion of a Bahura merchant, uh, an Ismaili um, a merchant from, from Western India. Um, and so, in fact, um, the, the, the logic of this uh, city, if you want to think about it, it's quite distinct from the logic of cities like Calcutta or of Madras, which we saw, which where there is not merely ethnic division, but ethnic ethno racial division. Whereas the city is not organized on these on these on these principles, it seems to be organized on the principles of, let's say, uh, um, sometimes great magnate figures, and then you can have a, the organization of a mahalla around the great magnate figure and his and his household, but it doesn't really work on this on this logic, right? So um, what are the sources by which we have typically written the history of the city to arrive at some of these conclusions? So there are, of course, the European sources, the Dutch, to which I'll come back repeatedly, the English, also important, both of whom installed themselves in the city in the beginning of the, of the uh, 17th century. But this is also a, 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 a text which has grown in importance as people have come to use it more and more, which is a Persian um, compendium of uh, documents which was produced in the middle of the uh, 17th century and then was acquired in the middle of the 18th century by the French uh, Orientalist uh, Anquetil du Perron when he was visiting India and which is therefore today in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris and um, it's actually a collection of documents which begins in the late 16th century. Uh, it has all kinds of diverse documents in it uh, and many of them have to do with uh, with mercantile disputes, there are some mercantile contracts, and uh, there are all kinds of different people who are involved in it, uh, which also suggests that the Qazi courts of Surat at this time were not just actually uh, legislating or performing uh, regulatory functions over Muslims, but over other communities as, as well, which is an, an interesting fact and, 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 and feature. So um, scholars such as uh, Indian historian Farhat Hassan, for instance, or Shirin Muswi have partly annotated some of these, these documents, and we can now get a sense of them. So the sense that you get from reading these kinds of documents together with the European documents is that you're dealing with a city which has a, a multiplicity of merchant groups in it. Right? So you can see that we begin with this moment of fortification, you have the Mughal conquest, and then we are, I'm talking about the second phase between the 1570s and the 1630s. In this, uh, the second phase, uh, you have this, uh, these documents combined with the European documents which are emerging. They give us a picture of, as I said, a multiplicity of, of communities, but living in a, in, if you want to call it a certain confusion, you can call it that, but at any rate, it's not a fundamentally ethnic organization of space. Hmm? And in this, um, in this um, situation, uh, you will, of course, have a certain number of crises that will arise. Hmm? And I'm going to mention two of those crises. Uh, in the 1630s, in the early 1630s, there is a huge famine in this area. And it has a major, major effect. There's a kind of collapse of trade for about a period of three or four year, years, which takes place. I'm going to come back to a second moment in the 1660s, which is a different kind of crisis, when the city is attacked by uh, the uh, Marathas, by the uh, uh, emergent Maratha warlord Shivaji. I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, and these are moments of crisis which have two effects. Those moments of crisis will sometimes, um, shall we say, shift the rankings and redistribute the cards amongst the merchant communities. Some of them will go down and some of them will come up. And the same is true of individual figures. 
And similarly, a political crisis can do that. But uh, the political crisis also has another advantage to which I will turn, which is the political crisis is often the moment when you get an explosion of documentation. And suddenly you see all kinds of things that you couldn't see. So this is your kind of uh, uh, exceptional, normal kind of moment which microhistorians talk about, right? So um, basically the structure of the city in the 17th century, if you're thinking about it, very schematically looks something like this, right? So there is the Mughal state. The Mughal state has a double presence. There is someone who uh, is the fortress commander, the Kaladar, right? But there is somebody else who's the governor of the city, who's a distinct person who lives in the city in, in normal circumstances, and who has a little court where people can go and appeal to him and so on, the Mutasaddi. So you have these two figures. There is a garrison who, which goes along with the fortress, of course. But then in the city itself, you have um, a whole um, set of people whom I would call the magnates, who are the great merchants. And they are a diverse group of people. These great merchants, again, the cards will frequently be redistributed and reshuffled amongst, amongst them. The same people don't remain great merchants necessarily. Right? But below them, you will find people of more modest means, regular merchants, brokers, who are typically people who are the go-betweens between the Europeans and the Mughals or between the Europeans and various Asian groups. And then going down, you have, of course, artisans. So Surat is a great uh, weaving city, which produces a lot of textiles inside the city and around the city. You have petty traders or what are called peddlers. So it's also uh, hierarchized in that sense. And then, of course, you have the East India companies, which are with one foot in the city and one foot outside the city, um, who represent maritime power, but who also have a certain kind of physical presence that you can see in the, in the city itself. Now, at this point in time, we have begun to accumulate a whole lot of specific studies of specific aspects of this, of this city. So, for example, my friend, the Portuguese historian George Flores, has examined the careers of some of these Mughal administrators of the, early, of the early 17th century, looking to see who they were. They were also often ethnically variable. Some of them were Iranian migrants, uh, some of them were not, some of them were uh, long-term, uh, you know, from Indian Muslim families, and so on and so forth. So you have a, a variable uh, such profile. So we have these kinds of, of studies. But let's just uh, start with a Dutch document, which will give us a, a feeling for what the city looked like in about, let's say, 1615, when the Dutch are getting into the business, right? So this is the so-called remonstrancy of an early Dutch factor whose uh, name is uh, uh, Peter Hillis van der Revestein. Uh, and he is listing the great merchants and the great entrepreneurs of the city. So he says, there you are, the principal merchants among the Moors are these, and so he gives you the names, okay? I will give it to you in a more uh, legible version. Hoja Nizam, Hoja Hassan Ali, Mir Ishaq Beg, Mir Jafar, Hoja Arab, somebody whom he mysteriously calls Hapavara, uh, is not an identifiable name, and Tapidas. Now, most of these are Muslim names, except the last two. Tapidas is clearly a Banya, he's a Banya Hindu uh, mercantile caste merchant, and Hapawara is possibly also the same, if one can believe that it's a distortion of, say, Hari Vaishya. As we proceed down the century, uh, the presence of these important Muslim merchants remains. The figures change, but they remain, right? So, for example, we have a figure like Mirza Mahmood, active for about 25, 26 years, from 1628 to 54. Some of these people specialize in particular trade lines. So some of these Muslim merchants are particularly attracted by the Persian Gulf trade of Surat and the Red Sea trade of Surat, right? You have a figure who eventually emerges, and I'm going to come back to him, um, Mirza or Haji Zahid Beg, who was at one point the Shah Bandar or the person who controlled the, the, uh, the port. Uh, sometimes the English would call this person the customer. Um, and uh, he uh, was, was uh, active in trade with Aden, Mocha, Bandar Abbas, Basra, the Maldives, and Johor. He has a son who continues in the trade called Mirza Masum. And then you have, of course, the, uh, the last listed here, the greatest, um, shall we say, Hindu Banya merchant, or actually Jain Banya merchant uh, of Surat, uh, Virji Vora, who was active for about 50 years or a little less. Uh, deals in all kinds of things, textiles, spices, and in 1660, he is 
fortune was uh, estimated at a cool 8 million rupees at uh, rupees of that time. So you can imagine that this is an enormous, enormous sum of money. Now, in all of this, of course, we have to come back to the question of uh, where are the Armenians? What role do the Armenians play? We've already seen one role they play in terms of these marriage alliances and as cultural go-betweens go with, the, with the Dutch. Now, unfortunately, when we go to a document like this, which is a very useful document, these are the so-called Dutch shipping lists, right? Because the Dutch from time to time would go into the customs house of Surat and would bribe somebody working there to give them a list of all the ships that had come and gone in the previous year. And so uh, you would get a list saying, you can look, if you look at this list, it says that the ship came from Mocha, hmm, and it says that it belonged to the merchant uh, Kopman, hmm, and that is Haji Zahid Beg, if you uh, care to uh, reinterpret what it says in the second line. Hmm, and the ship is called Soleimani. Hmm, and here you have actually the customs estimation of what it was carrying. It was carrying um, as you can see, because it's coming from the Red Sea, a lot of coined metal. It's carrying a realen, a realen for Nachten, a real is the Aocho, and it's carrying a lot of uh, ducats, but it's also carrying um, various other uh, kinds of commodities in smaller quantities. Eventually, we'll see coffee, for example, emerging in some of these uh, ships that are coming in. Now, unfortunately, when we look at these kinds of lists, of which we have some running through 1630s, 1640s. Uh, so far, um, we don't encounter any Armenian ship-owning merchants. This is going to change a little bit as we move into the second half of the 17th century. So this is a very important, useful source. So in fact, you get the feeling that the Armenians are present, but a bit subterranean at this point in time. And it kind of corresponds to the, to the graveyard problem that Sabu was pointing out, that we have the gravestones, but the gravestones don't seem to really correspond to that, to this phase of the 17th century, even if the Armenians are there. Well, perhaps this is also a question of who can afford to have a gravestone, number one. And number two, the mystery, which remains to be uh, pierced, which is at what moment did the Armenians negotiate with the Dutch East India Company to be allowed to bury their people in the extension of the Dutch graveyard, which we don't know the answer to as yet. But there must have been an agreement at some point. So um, we are seeing this, this kind of relatively modest Armenian, Armenian uh, presence over here. Okay, so schematically, this is what you're seeing. Um, the, the city, the castle, uh, the, the uh, inside wall, which has uh, most of the people who are really important living there, hmm? uh, which include uh, the great uh, uh, Sufi Silsila of the uh, Eidarusis from the Hadramaut, who have the big establishment inside the city walls, the Eidarusis there. And then you have, of course, the external city also, which was eventually walled up, which includes some fairly interesting places. You have Rustampura, uh, named for a great Parsi merchant, uh, Rustamji Manakji, uh, who, who seems to have built it up. And then, of course, you have, interestingly, Begampura, named for Shah Jahan's daughter, Jahanara Begum, who had a commercial interest in the town. And so this was named, named for her. So this is the shape of the city, more or less, as, as uh, it, it comes to uh, emerge in the course of the 17th century with the, with the castle, as I said, uh, or the fort, the kala at the, at the center. So um, this um, question of the misty, uh, missing Armenians, if you like, is a, is a problem, or the Armenians were not quite missing, but who are at the wrong time. Uh, there seem to be many more of them in the 18th century than there seem to be in the, in the um, 17th century. Though this gravestone on the right uh, actually is a late 17th century gravestone, and interestingly, if I'm not mistaken, has the bottom three lines in Portuguese, mm -hmm. uh, which also suggests uh, something which is of interest, which is the fact of their role as uh, go-betweens, language, dealing in language, and so on. Um, remember that even the Dutch and the English very often are functioning in Portuguese and Surat. They're not functioning in Dutch and in English. We don't do business in those languages. Mm -hmm. So. So the question, of course, uh, arises, why would the Armenians be somewhat in retreat? Why would they not be present? Of course, part of the reason is that Surat has also a kind of a religious function in a uh, Muslim economy, right? Because it is the great uh, port of departure for the Hajj for, for Mughal India. Hmm? And so you have a text like this from the 17th century, the Anis al-Hujjaj. Uh, which is giving some sort of instructions to travelers going on the Hajj. And we know that 
the su surat also has a kind of a annual kind of expansion contraction logic uh, the people for the hajj come in uh, they get ready the ships leave um, of course uh, you know the hajj and uh, monsoons are out of sync right because the hajj follows the lunar calendar and the monsoon follows the regular solar calendar more or less so sometimes you can do a very efficient hajj you can go there get in time get there just about in time do the hajj turn around and come back fairly quickly but sometimes you may have to spend 12 or 13 months on the hajj right so uh, this is going to be a complication uh, and of course we can imagine that um, that part of the of the affair uh, would have been out of the reach of most armenians except for those who had of course converted to islam so um, th there could have been a situation where a certain number of these great Muslim magnates were, uh, shall we say, present uh, in, a, in a particularly uh, powerful way because they were the people with the ships which were going to the Red Sea for this purpose. Um, and they were the ones who were intervening. Sometimes they were the ones who were also patronizing and giving money to the poor pilgrims so that who couldn't finance themselves and so on and so forth. But um, that's not a good enough explanation. Right? Because we know that, uh, for instance, uh, non-Muslim merchants had a very significant role in Surat. And we know this for a number of different reasons. They appear very frequently in the English and the Dutch sources. We even have some amusing letters like this one, written in the 1650s by three uh, Banya merchants of Surat. Hmm? So they are called uh, Chot Thakur, uh, Tulsidas Parekh, and uh, Venidas Vasangji. You can see their, their signatures here in Gujarati, right? Yeah, but the, this is a letter which they actually got written in Persian, which is a kind of a, an arzdash, a kind of a petition complaining about some things which the Dutch had done to them. So um, you actually have uh, very clearly this sort of presence of a very large number of uh, non-Muslim merchants in this city performing all kinds of functions. These people, are independent merchants, but they're also the brokers for the Europeans. And there are others who are performing um, other kinds of, of functions at various points in time. So uh, that clearly can't be uh, uh, the, the, the explanation. And indeed, uh, we suddenly we realize that um, uh, in the uh, middle decades of the 17th century, uh, the Armenians start floating into much greater prominence. Hmm? Now, who are these people? Well, um, many of them um, seem to uh, um, be relatively humble merchants, but there are also a few who use this title of um, Kalantar, hmm? uh, which is uh, transcribed, as we know, in various ways, including Kalandar and Calendar and so on. Uh, Kalantar, as we can see from the explanation given uh, by, by uh, Edmund Herzig, is, a, is a, something which is a kind of a no notion of a community leader. Uh, it's a title which uh, emerged, um, uh, perhaps uh, an earlier title was Melik, and then the title uh, Kalantar subsequently emerged uh, from it. And we know that there were people uh, who uh, emerged uh, in Surat with this title. So this is the people who I think correspond to our magnates, right? So at the point when you don't have magnates, you don't have people who are laying claim at that point to this, to this title, right? So you do have, of course, uh, always, I think, probably at a lower level, uh, except that we don't have enough documentation of them, these smaller merchants, the peddlers, perhaps the people who kind of correspond to the two lower categories of merchants that we are talking about. Uh, you, all of you will surely know this famous document. I'm giving you the French version of it, which is the famous, um, famous um, uh, book of uh, Hovhannes Yugaetsi, uh, which was found by, by uh, Khachekian uh, in the Biblioteca Nacional in, in Lisbon, actually, I think Fernand Brodel found it actually and gave it to him, right? So um, uh, he, uh, this is a, a, a person who's a very small scale merchant. And if we didn't have his, his own uh, papers, we would normally not see him necessarily floating up into the documentation of the other communities. But he's a small scale merchant, remember, who is an agent of other merchants. It just so happens that the, the principals are not resident in, in Surat in his in his case. So um, I'm certain that through the whole first half of the 17th century, there were a, a substantial number of these people who belong to the lower categories, but it's just that they haven't really mostly floated up uh, to, our, to our attention. And if we really sift through the Dutch records, for example, 
uh, we will certainly find more traces of them as brokers and, and things of that, of that kind. But in the second half of the 17th century, they are definitely now present. And we can start seeing this now everywhere. We can see it in all the European records in the second half of the 17th century. This is perhaps one of the most well-known of those records, which is the French um, uh, East India Company's uh, employee, Georges Roque, who wrote a text called La Manière des Négociers aux Andes. Um, in, and he has some, uh, again, uh, extremely uh, cutting things to say about, about the uh, Armenians, right? He says, uh, let's talk about the trade of the Armenians, and we'll see that they uh, have, uh, you know, uh, on ne verra pas moins de ruse. Huh? Et encore, si vous voulez, plus de fourberie. Hmm? So you will see, see that they're even more crooked hmm? than the Banias. The Banias, of course, are supposed to be already very crooked, right? So, and then he says that they are capable of doing anything, uh, that uh, at some, one point he actually uses this, uh, this uh, metaphor saying, yes, it's in the second part over here. He says they are like uh, people who uh, play billiards and by using a little trick, are able to make a ball go from here to there and from there to here. Um, you don't know what's happened, but you know you've lost the game. Hmm? So uh, uh, this, is, this is, of course, Rock writing at a point uh, when we know that there have been some very bad relations between the Armenians and the French company uh, around the affair of, uh, of uh, Markarav and Chins, about which uh, Sabu and others have written. Um, so it's written subsequent to that, so you can see that there's a grudge which has by this time built up. But um, it has to be said that um, uh, there's a recognition equally that the Armenians are, are now a really much more formidable people in the, in the trade of, of, of Surat. A helpful place to go to get a sense of the emergence of these uh, Armenians into a place of, of prominence is this text that I mentioned to you once before, which is the travels of, of uh, um, Le Gousse de la Boule, who uh, came to India for the first time in the late 1640s. And if you go to his travel text, he tells you at one point that he was um, in, um, he wanted to go from the Ottoman Empire, he wanted to go through Safavid Iran, but he was nervous about doing it uh, as, a, as a Christian. And so he says that he met um, a certain Minas, Marchand Armenia, and this Minas, this Armenian merchant, offered him that he would tell him how to go about it. And effectively, what he told him was that he should disguise himself and that he should dress up like this and that he should call himself Ibrahim Beg. And that if he did so, and if he kept his mouth shut, uh, when people began to talk to him in Persian, uh, he would be uh, perfectly capable of passing through uh, Iran and coming out uh, the other side into the, into the Persian Gulf. Right? So, um, this uh, is an interesting moment because, in fact, 20 years later, um, uh, Le Guzla Boulay will return to Surat, uh, now as, a, a, en, uh, as an envoy of the East India Company. And he says very interesting, interestingly that he knew two people in Surat at this point in time. He knew Oxenden, who was the president of the English company. And then he says that he also found J.O.C. Trouvé, Le Sieur Cojaminas, Avec lequel j'avais fait voyage autrefois de Constantinople. So it's the same person, and he's meeting him again. But by this time, Khaja Minas is a very big gun, right? He is by this time a very, very prominent merchant of Surat. He is perhaps the first of the Armenian magnates who actually emerge from the, the level of the common uh, sort of Armenian peddler, minor merchant into a situation of greater prominence. So let me just very quickly give you a sense of how and why this happened. So basically, my hypothesis is that uh, part of this was because of a crisis which took place in the mid 60s in Surat, right? So in the mid 60s in Surat, the uh, Maratha warlord Shivaji decided uh, to attack the, the city. He claimed that one of the Mughal princes who had been in a civil war had actually given him rights over Surat. This is probably a false claim. But at any rate, he showed up in Surat. The English and the Dutch were aware that he was coming. They didn't know what to do about it. The governor was aware, and the governor essentially locked himself up in the fort. So when the governor locked himself in the fort, Shivaji's forces entered, and then they went about dealing with this town. And uh, you can see the description here, the, the English description, how they began to break open some of the great merchant houses. Uh, they um, actually uh, they, they ransacked and dug up Virjivora's house. Okay, at another moment, they do the same thing to Haji Zahid Beg's 
house. So they identify the great magnets and they destroy the property and they, they take it away. Okay. Now, interestingly, the uh, Armenians are not affected by this. Now, it's a bit of a puzzle to me why they are not affected. There's one possible reason, which is that the main person through whom Shivaji was dealing with Surat was a Greek, was a Greek merchant. Right? So I don't know whether this played in any way on the matter. It's also possible that some of the Armenians had kept their, uh, their stock and their money in the English East India Company's factory, which Shivaji chose not to attack. Right? But at any rate, what is interesting is that you have this mid-60s crisis, an enormous amount of money is taken out of Surat. These two great merchants are ruined, which is to say Zahid Beg and Virjivora. And then in the aftermath of this, you see the emergence of uh, the, the, uh, this great Ar Armenian magnet. Now, this is a, a very rough map of Surat at the time of this attack. And I just want to make one point to you. So this is actually 1664. And there is obviously already an Armenian church here, which is very close to the English factory. right? But what is actually very interesting is in the English description of this, they say that the Armenians and the Turks were living together in the same Karvansarai, right? So the Armenian merchants and the Turkish merchants, the Chalabis, who were the great Turkish merchants from Mosul in Surat at this point in time, were living together, right? Um, and uh, that this area was eventually spared by, Sh by Shivaji. And in the aftermath, you then see, very interestingly, what emerges. Uh, they, what emerges is this great figure of Khoja Minas, whom we saw in uh, 1647 uh, traveling. Uh, by this time, in the late 1660s, he has a fleet of four to five ships. He's starting to trade with Persian Gulf. Uh, and in the late 1660s, he's going to begin trade with Manila. Uh, he will then subsequently have a downturn to his fortunes. He will fight with the English company in the 1670s. He will have disputes with the Mughal officials. Um, and eventually, he's obliged to leave and go to Diu and seek a reconciliation with the Portuguese. But you can see this figure emerging, and my hypothesis is that he emerges in this vacuum which is created in the middle of the 1660s by the destruction of the rival mercantile fortress. So let me now uh, come towards um, uh, a rapid conclusion to some of the things that I want to point out to you. So uh, this is to give you a, a, an idea of the Surat Manila trade, uh, very an incomplete statistics. I've used some English uh, factory records and the the uh, old book by Fier Shonu on Les Philippines, Le Pacific des Iberic. Um, but you can see that there was a period of time when, when uh, there was a more or less regular traffic, never went into very large numbers, say compared to the Madras traffic. Hmm? Some of them were Armenians, some of them were unidentified. And it runs through till about 1725 when the Surat trade to Malila seems to stop. But it's interesting that Minas is really the person who seems to get it going in the in the 1669-70-71 period, there's a previous outlier from the 1640s. Okay, so this figure of Minas is someone um, who is a, a great and important figure. Mm, I don't have the time to go uh, into him. We have plenty of documentation about him, English documentation. Uh, we have Portuguese documentation referring to his son, Khaja Nu, which would be, I guess, Noe, uh, Noah, right, in, in, in Armenian. Um, who uh, has, we have a lot of documentation about his dealings with the Portuguese, um, signed contracts between him and the Portuguese governors. And he is the first great Armenian magnet figure, if you like, of, of Surat emerging in this period. But he's certainly not the last. And we will see um, other figures if we follow this history through, which um, as my time is running out, I'm really uh, not going to do, but I'm going to give you a very quick sense of uh, some of the a slightly later history which emerges from this. So your first figure who emerges in the 1660s is Hoja Minas. And then uh, you will have these other figures who emerge, um, particularly the family who already mentioned of, uh, of Panos um, Kalantar. Mm -hmm. uh, his uh, sons, in particular, one of his sons is quite important in Surat, which is uh, who's Agapiri. Um, who is a figure who, who features in many, many uh, documents uh, dealing with uh, trade, not only between New Julfa and Surat, but also with Venice and England. Hmm. Uh, Aga Piri, who, who uh, is again one of the uh, people who uh, is uh, getting to be prominent over there, 
uh, as this kind of ship owning community of Surat is, is growing and becoming more important with its ups and downs undoubtedly, as you see over here, but nevertheless, as it's growing to its high point, which you can see there in the 16, 1690. Uh, so Agapiri, as I said, a figure, he has two brothers, uh, one of whom has the, his, his, his uh, cenotaph in the, in, in the, in the graveyard, Kalantar the Kalantar. Uh, he has another brother, uh, Avedik, who is uh, present for a time in Surat, and eventually the two brothers will move to Madras and have a subsequent, subsequent uh, career there. So let me conclude. My, uh, one of my great um, uh, teachers, um, uh, who was an important inspiration for me, uh, the, the historian Ashin Das Gupta, spent a lot of his time working on Surat. And he wrote this book, which I still consider to be one of the best books on Indian mercantile activity in the Indian Ocean on the left. And Das Gupta um, was um, you know, a really meticulous historian, but I did find uh, looking back at his work a somewhat surprising thing. I found uh, a little remark uh, about uh, the Armenians of Surat, uh, where he says that, you know, the, uh, unfortunately for the most part, the merchants of Surat are faceless men appearing and dropping out of historical asides. And he says, the Armenian merchants in particular seem to have left us little. We know that the members of the well-known Kalandar and Sarhat families were settled, but probably bickering in India as they were used to doing in Persia. But he says, uh, we don't really know very much about them. Well, what can I say, even Homer nods. And uh, he does say in a footnote that um, he had found some um, a letter from Khaja um, Avedik uh, Kalandar uh, complaining, actually, as it happens, about uh, Khaja Sarhat, who he says had uh, cheated him or was in the process of cheating him or something of this kind. Mm. Uh, but um, in fact, I think that uh, this is a pessimistic view. I think we, there is a great deal more to be said about the Armenian merchants of Surat if we uh, have the patience, if we uh, search uh, far and wide in the, in the published English East India Company documents, uh, which we now have, where you can see, for example, this reference uh, to Aga Piri and uh, his relations with uh, John Chardin, uh, which were part of his dealings. And indeed, if we even follow the matter up beyond um, these uh, Dutch documents of the late uh, 17th century, and as we go well into the 18th century, if we cast our net wide, as wide as possible. If we look through, for example, the Persian accounts of Surat in the first half of the 18th century, like this text, we will continue to find more and more material. And I will close with a document which I have just been working my way through, which is the memoir of uh, the Dutch uh, commander in Surat in uh, the middle of the 18th century, where he lists all the great merchants, all the great magnates of Surat. And amongst them, you find these great fortunes Right, of the Armenian merchants of Surat in 1750, uh, Khoja Sarkis with 60,000 rupees, Khoja Vartan with 50,000, Khoja Satur with 150,000, uh, Khoja Margar with 200,000. So uh, even uh, in the middle of the 18th century, a century after uh, the emergence of Khoja Minas, you can see that the Armenians, once they had emerged, did not disappear in the life of Surat. So let me close with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanjay. This was one of the most uh, stimulating talks I've listened to on the topic. And uh, we do have some time. We have dinner that is being prepared for us soon and musical entertainment at 6. Let me see. We have, we have 20 minutes of questions. And uh, Professor Subramaniam has been kind enough uh, to, field some uh, to uh, receive some questions, which I will be fielding myself, as usual. Now, before I receive any questions, though, I just want to say um, the Suleimani ship that you pointed out to, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know what the date was, but if it is in the 1650s range. 1640s, I, probably. 40s, yes. So it must have been recycled, that ship, or uh, sold later on, because the name of Kojaminas' ship in the 1660s, on which Hovannes uh, Juhayetzi traveled from Bandarabas to uh, Surat, 
was called the Suleimani and it was captained by an English or a, a Scottish mm -hmm. chaplain and mm -hmm. it identified as Amina. And the person who found the record, by the way, I'm sure you know this, but we had to make this brief uh, skip this, uh, was not Rodell. Rodell found the uh, guns Chapo published in Amsterdam in 1699. But the person who found that particular thing at the Bibliothèque, uh, the National Library in Portugal, was uh, none other than Roberto Gulbenkian, ah, about whom ah, once course. I gave a talk at UCLA yes, and sure. you said something and I said the late Roberto Gulbenkian and he was still alive, but unfortunately he died soon after. Yes. So, any questions? <laughs> Anyone? Questions? Daniel. Daniel, yes. We have a question uh, that's coming from online, which I'll prioritize over my own question. Uh, the question comes from Meline Medropian, perhaps Mesropian. If not, I apologize, Meline. My question is for Sanjay Subramanyam. It is not directly connected to your extremely informative and interesting paper, but my question appeared when you talked about Mariam, uh, not Gomez professor, but I don't know the Portuguese pronunciation. Do you know possibly what ethnicity and nationality was common among servants of Armenian merchants in the 19th century? Was Portuguese origin common among these servants? The reason I'm asking is because, of, is because the well-known person Diana Apkar and her merchant husband, husband Apkar M. Apkar, when they moved to Japan, they had two servants accompanying them uh, with Portuguese sounding names, uh, but they were referred to as Indian servants. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the uh, diversity of people who are used as servants is enormous. Um, and of course, um, part of, if you're talking about the 19th century, in the 19th century, officially, um, the status of slavery is, 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 has become problematic. But in fact, many of these people are um, coming from the same kinds of milieu as the slave of the previous, of the previous centuries. And if you actually look at the people who were used as domestic slaves and so on, uh, in the Indian Ocean in, let's say, the 17th or the 18th centuries, it's, it's, it's very, very variable. And um, the couple of people who have uh, done some work on this, I mean, I myself had done some work with the Portuguese Inquisition records because there are a few people who, when they were caught by the Inquisition, their whole household goods were seized, and that would include all the slaves. And then they would list the slaves and they would list them by ethnicity, right? Uh, but there is a, a scholar who did a PhD in the University of Pittsburgh recently, Titash uh, Bhattacharya, and she has actually looked at the question of servants of Europeans in Calcutta uh, in the 18th century, Calcutta, Chinsura, and the other places, and she's tried to again identify where these people came from. It's very variable, and so I don't think that there would be a single rule for let's say whom the Armenians took as slaves or servants, irrespective of where the Armenians were. If they were in Surat, they might do one thing. In, in Calcutta, they might, might, do, might do another thing. And as I said, there's a, a quite a considerable traffic. So in Calcutta, you might have a servant who came from you know, Eastern Indonesia. It's not impossible, or actually from Sri Lanka. Daniel, do you want to pose your own question now? Sure. All right. Uh, so this question might seem frivolous and irrelevant. In my mind, it's neither. And if there's a need, I can explain the connections, but here it goes. My question is about uh, gender, masculinity, and facial hair. Do you know anything, Professor, about the different attitudes that men in places like Surat, men of different ethnic backgrounds had toward their facial hair. One additional thing I can say to connect this is that there is the idea that uh, a masculine man, any adult male must have a beard. Uh, and at the same time, we see many images, including by the way, the images that you showed of adult males without beards. And I wonder if there is something uh, that you can say about cultural change, cross-cultural contact, multi-ethnicity, and so on to do with this particular aspect of cultural history. So I'm not sure that I caught one word in your first question. 
frivolous, irrelevant, no, 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 facial no. hair, beard? Oh, facial hair, I see, facial hair, okay. Yeah, right. Well, actually, the, the facial hair question is, you know, is something which, of course, a lot of people have, have uh, debated, um, uh, if I may I just address it in a little bit in a, in a tangential way. You see, because, uh, for instance, the question has often arisen in the Mughal context of who and who, who, who does and who does not have facial hair in Mughal uh, portraits and including in Mughal collective portraits. Now, of course, it's true that in the Mughal uh, collective portraits, there are many people who are not Muslims. Right. So, for example, you would have uh, Rajputs or you would have other people who are not Muslims and who therefore might not have facial hair as a consequence. But it's also true that a number of Muslims do not have facial hair. Right. And this is an interesting question, because what does it mean? What does it represent? I mean, famously, neither the Mughal Emperor Akbar nor the Mughal em Emperor Jahangir actually had a beard. Uh, the Mughal emperors, um, uh, Babur and Humayun did. And then from Shah Jahan onwards, they did again. Right. So, so what? Uh, excuse me. Side lock. Yeah, yeah. He had some kind of a side lock, but he didn't have a proper beard. Hmm? So um, now the question is also this: Is that is that some kind of a statement about your religious attitudes, or not? Or are we over interpreting it? Because they never actually say that I decided not to have a beard for this or that reason. Right? Now, similarly, the question which, which would arise, I think, is if you're sort of looking across the board, I mean, you know, famously, Shivaji, who was uh, supposedly incredibly anti Mughal, has a perfectly good uh, uh, you know, uh, beard which would have served him well in the Mughal court, right? Um, so it's, it's, for me, it's an, it's an interesting question whether there are uh, notions of, as you, as you would say, ge more general notions of masculinity and of um, sort of other, uh, which require that you look and dress in a certain way, which crosses actually your religious denomination. Mm -hmm. um, and in that context, for instance, the question which, which would arise would be also of the of the um, where the Armenians would place themselves. Hmm? Of course, there's also still another matter which we can uh, get into, which is um, uh, in the court culture, uh, the presence of eunuchs. And there too, then, you know, very often the insult to the eunuch is, you know, you're beardless one, right? So uh, there's also that kind of aspect, I suppose, which could be notionally uh, brought in the risks that one has if one doesn't have a beard. I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, troubled by that. Yes. I think we have a question. I was. I was so immersed with the, in the lecture that I had a number of questions, but I, I think they've gone. Most of them are out of my mind now. Uh -huh. But I would like to know uh, whether the, this Mariam is the same one who's married to Mrs. Tavasan. Any Mar Any uh, you know? Any mention of her in the death records? The Mariam who was married to um, oh, Gabriel Tavasan. Uh, yes, Tavasan. Before that, uh, oh my God, what's it? No, no, no. no. So, so there Hawkins. is there, there is a person. Um, wait a second. Who is married to Hawkins Robert, Robert Shirley? Pardon? There is a, there is an Armenian woman who is married famously to Robert Shirley, who is Anthony Shirley's brother. Yeah, but I want the one who is married to Hawkins and they they turn to Tavasan. Yes. Do you have anything in? about her in the Dutch records? I would have to look, I can't tell you. Okay. I, off the top of my head, I can't tell you. Okay, yeah. And um, it was lovely to know that, uh, I didn't know about Vinas that he had come disguised as a, um, under a Muslim name to Sura, that is news to me. I was very happy to know so, about Sorry, that is, that's not Minas, it was the Frenchman who was disguised. Oh, not Minas. Not Minas, it was the Frenchman who was disguised. Oh. The, the, the portrait which I showed you was of the Frenchman disguised as Ibrahim Beg. Not of Minas nothing about disguise. Minas from where he came, we do not know. Only we know when he came to Surat, we know about Minas from the time he was at Surat, right? And once he went to Diu, his son knew, did he ever come back to Surat or we just have records from him at Diu? No, I think that uh, these people subsequently more or less integrated themselves into the, into the Portuguese system and one would have to pursue this in the Portuguese records into the end of the century. Oh, I yeah. thought Minas, yeah. thanks a lot. 
I don't know if you're interested, Rukhuya, but there is an article on the many Khojaminases. There are several of them, more than one, like three of them, I think, by um, Teldesha Kunya. I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. He's in the same Teldesha volume. Kunya. About yes. the same Minas? The... Yes. On the, on the different faces of Minas. Right. Okay. It's a common name, and he's been confused with, uh, with some others. Yes, that is in the, in the Chaudhary and Kevonian volume, yes. I think the, the most confused one was uh, the Minasian, the Khoja Minas that I've been working on from the Minasian family firm, that almost everyone until Chaudhuri and um, Kevonian said this is this was the Minasian, you know, the head of the Minasian family firm, although there was like a 70 year difference between, yeah. <laughs> uh, between their death. Um, but I was wondering, um, because I do see many of at least the agents of the Minasian family firm both in 1720s um before then in 1740s from the Santa Catarina ships passing by Surat all the time and I was wondering for example one of them 1725 arrives at um I think Pano son of Hairap but arrives at Surat bringing Basra pearls and emeralds from Livorno they mentioned specifically and it seems that these two commodities are very you know, popular in you know, in India at this point. But I was wondering if you think that one of the reasons that we don't have many records um, in Surat from Armenian merchants is because they were mostly passing by and not necessarily settled in Surat. Uh, for example, just like Khoja Minas who was settled in Surat and, you know, we have, as you said, many, many records from him. Uh, what's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, no, you see, I mean, the, the problem with always is the, the excellentio argument, right? I mean, to say that we don't know about them because we don't have records about them and therefore we can speculate is the last part of it, which is the difficult part of it, right? So I would say that it seems to me that there is a, um, there are two kinds of problems. I mean, the first kind of problem is, is fundamentally this, that if you are talking about people who are not, who are not shall we say, visible um, through the European records, Right? So when do they become visible in the European records? Typically, they become visible in the European records for one of two reasons, because they are acting as agents for the Europeans. This would be one possibility or marrying them. That's, then, they be, then you have visibility. Or otherwise, they become sufficiently prominent as competitors of the Europeans that the Europeans start taking note of them, which is what happens with the Khoja Minas of the 1660s. Right? So uh, below that, there is, I mean, clearly, this, it's a sort of a structure of an iceberg. And for the 20%, which is above the water, there's the 80%, which is below the water, but which will never be visible, essentially, because they are neither the intermediaries nor the competitors. They are actually people who are not important enough to feature in these. So the only solution to those uh, people, if there is a solution, would be if one can turn up their own records. That's the only solution. Thank you. Um, okay, I didn't know if this was still on. Thank you for that talk, Dr. Subramanian, it was wonderful. I was curious, you mentioned um, examples of Armenian merchants who convert to Islam. Um, and what I was curious about, because a talk kind of brought this up yesterday about Armenian merchants becoming Catholics uh, and then sort of rejoining the Armenian Apostolic Church. Um, in your pre preparation for this talk, did you find many examples of, say, Armenian merchants who specifically will convert to Islam temporarily, then rejoin the Armenian church? And when you're looking at these issues of conversion and reconversion, whether it's to one church or another or to Islam, how common were they and how did they necessarily function? Was it just a means of survival or was it a means also of perhaps, for want of a better term, economic access when otherwise that might have been difficult? Well, so you have um, actually how common was it is difficult to say, but there's certainly multiple examples of people converting to Islam um, and some examples of people converting to Islam and then regretting it and reverting to Christianity. So both of those are available. Now, here's the difficulty. The difficulty is this, that some of this will come to you from the Inquisition records and the very nature of the Inquisition records is, I mean, as someone once said to me, the Inquisition record is worth as much as a confession extracted in Guantanamo Bay. Right? So um, 
essentially, if you are under extreme duress and you are telling a story, you're telling actually typically the story which the person who's asking you the question wants to hear, right? So under those circumstances, what they are telling you about why they converted and why they reconverted, typically they will tell you that they, they converted for convenience, that it was not a real conversion. They did so because they were getting some advantages. And then, of course, they realized it was you know, a false religion, et cetera, et cetera. But what does one to make of that? Right? So um, uh, we, have, we have the difficulty of dealing with the Inquisition record as a, as a form for all. It's the same is true of conversos. Same problem. So, um, but the, 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 there are a number of people who we know who converted and did not reconvert. Right? I mean, famously, for example, uh, when the French were going in at the same time that uh, Le Guzela Boulay arrives in, in uh, um, Surat, the French, um, actually, the Francois Bernier writes a letter to Colbert telling him who to contact in different places. And he says in Hyderabad, there is a, an Armenian whose name is Hak Nazarbeg. Uh, and he's very prominent in the, in the Golconda court. And uh, he's a go-between and you can deal with him and so on. And he knows lots of things. So you have these characters who clearly converted and never reconverted. Um, how um, important they were as a proportion of the whole is impossible to say, but certainly there's a sufficiently large number of them. Um, in fact, that it creates a certain problem because it, this is also eventually a part of the suspicion that people like the French have about them, which is they actually have um, doubts about how sincere they are as Christians. And they begin to say, if this is somebody who, who knows a bunch of languages, which I don't know, who is constantly dealing in Persian with people which I can't understand. How do I know what this guy actually stands for? Right? And this is really when, when things sour between the French and the Armenians in the 1670s and through Rock's account, this is all part of that. It's this kind of a problem of uh, uh, the unrecognizability or the non-transparency so far as they're concerned of these people as, as characters whom they can analyze you know, from this point of view. I mean, this is of course not to say that Europeans didn't convert to Islam. Uh, I mean, French and Portuguese and so on also did. And even the Dutch did sometimes. Hi, Dr. Subramian. I have a question. Uh, going through all the story of the economic development uh, in the region, so I always hear, I mean, about Muslims, Europeans, among the Muslims, I mean, Persian, non-Persian, or from, uh, on, the, in, on the Christian side, we have the, the, the British, the French, the Portuguese, the Armenians. What about the other religions in the subcontinent? Yes, I mean, I've mentioned to you the existence of uh, Hindu Banya merchants, uh, quite a number of them, Jain merchants. Hmm? Yeah, you, also, you also see them, okay? Um, uh, at this point in time, uh, there are some Jewish merchants in, in Surat, not a large number, but you know, there is a very famous text which was written in the, in the 1680s called Noticias dos Judeus de Cochin, uh, the, an account of the Jews of Cochin. And it was actually written by a Portuguese Jew called Pedro Pereira, uh, who also had called himself some, Mose Pereira, as he sometimes called himself. And he was uh, living in Surat at the time that he wrote that account of the, of the Jews of Cochin. So we actually do have, and uh, he was in the jewel trade. Uh, he was in the diamond trade, actually. So uh, you do have a, a certain number of members of, of that community, but you, you have the, the panoply of various kinds of Muslims and uh, various kinds of Christians. Uh, and you have Jains and indeed a wide variety of Hindus of different castes and different persu persuasions. So it's not as if they're absent at all. Uh, it's a uh...